by Edward Gibbon. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire Yet a reasonable doubt may be entertained whether any stain of hereditary guilt could be derived from Arcadius to his successor. Eudoxia was a young and beautiful woman who indulged her passions and despised her husband. Count John enjoyed, at least, the familiar confidence of the empress, and the public named him as the real father of Theodosius the Younger. The birth of a son was accepted, however, by the pious husband, as an event the most fortunate and honorable to himself, to his family, and to the Eastern world, and the royal infant, by an unprecedented favor, was invested with the titles of Caesar and Augustus. In less than four years afterwards, Eudoxia, in the bloom of youth, was destroyed by the consequences of a miscarriage, and this untimely death confounded the prophecy of a holy bishop, who amidst the universal joy had ventured to foretell that she should behold the long and auspicious reign of her glorious son. The Catholics applauded the justice of heaven, which avenged the persecution of St. Christosom, and perhaps the emperor was the only person who sincerely bewailed the loss of the haughty and rapacious Eudoxia. Such a domestic misfortune afflicted him more deeply than the public calamities of the East, the Ligensis excursions from Pontus to Palestine of the Usarian robbers, whose impunity accused the weakness of the government, and the earthquakes, the conflagrations, the famine, and the flights of locusts, which the popular discontent was equally disposed to attribute to the incapacity of the monarch. At length, in the thirty-first year of his age, after a reign, if we may abuse that word, of thirteen years, three months, and fifteen days, Arcadius expired in the palace of Constantinople. It is impossible to delineate his character, since, in a period very copiously furnished with historical materials, it has not been possible to remark one action that properly belongs to the son of the great Theodosius. The historian Procopius has indeed illuminated the mind of the dying emperor with a ray of human prudence, or celestial wisdom. Arcadius considered, with anxious foresight, the helpless condition of his son Theodosius, who was no more than seven years of age, the dangerous factions of a minority, and the aspiring spirit of Jezdegerd, the Persian monarch. Instead of tempting the allegiance of an ambitious subject by the participation of supreme power, he boldly appealed to the magnanimity of a king, and placed, by a solemn testament, the scepter of the East in the hands of Jezdegerd himself. The royal guardian accepted and discharged this honorable trust with unexampled fidelity, and the infancy of Theodosius was protected by the arms and counsels of Persia. Such is the singular narrative of Procopius, and his veracity is not disputed by Agathias, while he presumes to dissent from his judgment, and to arraign the wisdom of a Christian emperor who, so rashly, though so fortunately, committed his son and his dominions to the unknown faith of a stranger, a rival, and a heathen. At the distance of 150 years, this political question might be debated in the court of Justinian, but a prudent historian will refuse to examine the propriety till he has ascertained the truth of the testament of Arcadius. As it stands without a parallel in the history of the world, we may justly require that it should be attested by the positive and unanimous evidence of contemporaries. The strange novelty of the event, which excites our distrust, must have attracted their notice, and their universal silence annihilates the vain tradition of the succeeding age. The maxims of Roman jurisprudence, if they could fairly be transferred from private property to public dominion, would have adjudged to the Emperor Heronius the guardianship of his nephew, till he had attained, at least, the fourteenth year of his age. But the weakness of Honorius and the calamities of his reign disqualified him from prosecuting this natural claim, and such was the absolute separation of the two monarchies, both in interest and affection, that Constantinople would have obeyed with less reluctance the orders of the Persian than those of the Italian court. Under a prince whose weakness is disguised by the external signs of manhood and discretion, the most worthless favorites may secretly dispute the empire of the palace, and dictate to submissive provinces the commands of a master, whom they direct and despise. But the ministers of a child, who is incapable of arming them with the sanction of the royal name, must acquire and exercise an independent authority. The great officers of the state and army, who had been appointed before the death of Arcadius, formed an aristocracy, which might have inspired them with the idea of a free republic, 
and the government of the Eastern Empire was fortunately assumed by the prefect Athemius, who obtained, by his superior abilities, a lasting ascendant over the minds of his equals. The safety of the young emperor proved the merit and integrity of Athemius, and his prudent firmness sustained the force and reputation of an infant reign. Uldin, with a formidable host of barbarians, was encamped in the heart of Thrace. He proudly rejected all terms of accommodation, and pointing to the rising sun, declared to the Roman ambassadors that the course of the planet should alone terminate the conquest of the Huns. But the desertion of his confederates, who were privately convinced of the justice and liberality of the imperial ministers, obliged Uldin to repass the Danube. The tribe of the Skiri, which composed his rear guard, was almost extirpated, and many thousand captives were dispersed to cultivate, with servile labor, the fields of Asia. In the midst of the public triumph, Constantinople was protected by a strong enclosure of new and more extensive walls. The same vigilant care was applied to restore the fortifications of the Illyrian cities, and a plan was judiciously conceived which, in the space of seven years, would have secured the command of the Danube, by establishing on that river a perpetual fleet of two hundred and fifty armed vessels. But the Romans had so long been accustomed to the authority of a monarch, that the first, even among the females of the imperial family, who displayed any courage or capacity, was permitted to ascend the vacant throne of Theodosius. His sister, Pulcheria, who was only two years older than himself, received, at the age of sixteen, the title of Augusta, and though her favor might be sometimes clouded by caprice or intrigue, she continued to govern the Eastern Empire near forty years, during the long minority of her brother, and after his death, in her own name, and in the name of Marcian, her nominal husband. From a motive either of prudence or religion, she embraced a life of celibacy, and notwithstanding some aspersions on the chastity of Pulcheria, this resolution, which she communicated to her sisters Arcadia and Marina, was celebrated by the Christian world as the sublime effort of heroic piety. In the presence of the clergy and people, the three daughters of Arcadius dedicated their virginity to God, and the obligation of their solemn vow was inscribed on a tablet of gold and gems, which they publicly offered in the great church of Constantinople. Their palace was converted into a monastery, and all males, except the guides of their conscience, the saints who had forgotten the distinction of sexes, were scrupulously excluded from the holy threshold. Pulcheria, her two sisters, and a chosen train of favorite damsels, formed a religious community. They denounced the vanity of dress, interrupted by frequent fast their simple and frugal diet, allotted a portion of their time to works of embroidery, and devoted several hours of the day and night to exercises of prayer and psalmody. The piety of a Christian virgin was adorned by the zeal and liberality of an empress. Ecclesiastical history describes the splendid churches, which were built at the expense of Pulcheria, in all the provinces of the East, her charitable foundations for the benefit of strangers and the poor, the ample donations which she assigned for the perpetual maintenance of monastic societies, and the act of severity with which she labored to suppress the opposite heresies of Nestorius and Eutychus. Such virtues were supposed to deserve the peculiar favor of the deity and the relics of martyrs, as well as the knowledge of future events, were communicated in visions and revelations to the imperial saint. Yet the devotion of Pulcheria never diverted her indefatigable attention from temporal affairs, and she alone, among all the descendants of the great Theodosius, appears to have inherited any share of his manly spirit and abilities. The elegant and familiar use which she had acquired, both of the Greek and Latin languages, was readily applied to the various occasions of speaking or writing, on public business. Her deliberations were maturely weighed, her actions were prompt and decisive, and while she moved, without noise or ostentation, the wheels of government, she discreetly attributed to the genius of the emperor the long tranquility of his reign. In the last years of his peaceful life, Europe was indeed afflicted by the arms of war, but the more extensive provinces of Asia still continued to enjoy a profound and permanent repose. Theodosius the Younger was never reduced to the disgraceful necessity of encountering and punishing a rebellious subject, and since we cannot applaud the vigor, some praise may be due to the mildness and prosperity of the administration of Pulcheria. The Roman world was deeply interested in the education of its master. 
a regular course of study and exercise was judiciously instituted, of the military exercises of riding and shooting with the bow, of the liberal studies of grammar, rhetoric, and philosophy, the most skillful masters of the East ambitiously solicited the attention of their royal pupil, and several noble youths were introduced into the palace to animate his diligence by the emulation of friendship. Pulcheria alone discharged the important task of instructing her brother in the arts of government, but her precepts may countenance some suspicions of the extent of her capacity or of the purity of her intentions. She taught him to maintain a grave and majestic deportment, to walk, to hold his robes, to seat himself on his throne in a manner worthy of a great prince, to abstain from laughter, to listen with condescension, to return suitable answers, to assume by turns a serious or a placid countenance, in a word, to represent with grace and dignity the external figure of a Roman emperor. But Theodosius was never excited to support the weight and glory of an illustrious name, and, instead of aspiring to support his ancestors, he degenerated, if we may presume to measure the degrees of incapacity, below the weakness of his father and his uncle. Arcadius and Honorius had been assisted by the guardian care of a parent, whose lessons were enforced by his authority and example. But the unfortunate prince, who is born in the purple, must remain a stranger to the voice of truth, and the son of Arcadius was condemned to pass his perpetual infancy, encompassed only by a servile train of women and eunuchs. The ample leisure which he acquired by neglecting the essential duties of his high office was filled by idle amusements and unprofitable studies. Hunting was the only active pursuit that could tempt him beyond the limits of the palace, but he most assiduously labored, sometimes by the light of a midnight lamp, in the mechanic occupations of painting and carving, and the elegance with which he transcribed religious books entitled the Roman Emperor to the singular epithet of calligraphus, or a fair writer. Separated from the world by an impenetrable veil, Theodosius trusted the persons whom he loved. He loved those who were accustomed to amuse and flatter his indolence, and, as he never perused the papers that were presented for the royal signature, the acts of injustice the most repugnant to his character were frequently perpetrated in his name. The emperor himself was chaste, temperate, liberal, and merciful, but these qualities, which can only deserve the name of virtues when they are supported by courage and regulated by discretion, were seldom beneficial, and they sometimes proved mischievous to mankind. His mind, enervated by a royal education, was oppressed and degraded by abject superstition. He fasted, he sung psalms, he blindly accepted the miracles and doctrines with which his faith was continually nourished. Theodosius devoutly worshipped the dead and living saints of the Catholic Church, and he once refused to eat till an insolent monk, who had cast an excommunication on his sovereign, condescended to heal the spiritual wound which he had inflicted. The story of a fair and virtuous maiden, exalted from a private condition to the imperial throne, might be deemed an incredible romance, if such a romance had not been verified in the marriage of Theodosius. The celebrated Athenaeus was educated by her father, Leontius, in the religion and sciences of the Greeks, and so advantageous was the opinion which the Athenian philosopher entertained of his contemporaries that he divided his patrimony between his two sons, bequeathing to his daughter a small legacy of one hundred pieces of gold, in the lively confidence that her beauty and merit would be a sufficient portion. The jealousy and avarice of her brothers soon compelled Athenaeus to seek a refuge at Constantinople, and with some hopes, either of justice or favor, to throw herself at the feet of Pulcheria. That sagacious princess listened to her eloquent complaint, and secretly destined the daughter of the philosopher Leontius for the future wife of the emperor of the East, who had now attained the twentieth year of his age. She easily excited the curiosity of her brother by an interesting picture of the charms of Athenaeus, large eyes, a well-proportioned nose, a fair complexion, golden locks, a slender person, a graceful demeanor, an understanding improved by study, and a virtue tried by distress. Theodosius, concealed behind a curtain in the apartment of his sister, was permitted to behold the Athenian virgin. The modest youth immediately declared his pure and honorable love, and the royal nuptials were celebrated amidst the acclamations of the capital and the provinces. Athenaeus, who was easily persuaded to renounce the errors of paganism, 
received at her baptism the Christian name of Eudocia, but the cautious Pulcheria withheld the title of Augusta till the wife of Theodosius had approved her fruitfulness by the birth of a daughter, who espoused fifteen years afterwards the emperor of the West. The brothers of Eudocia obeyed, with some anxiety, her imperial summons, but as she could easily forgive their unfortunate unkindness, she indulged the tenderness, or perhaps the vanity, of a sister by promoting them to the rank of consuls and prefects. In the luxury of the palace, she still cultivated those ingenious arts which had contributed to her greatness, and wisely dedicated her talents to the honor of religion and of her husband. Eudocia composed a poetical paraphrase of the first eight books of the Old Testament, and of the prophecies of Daniel and Zechariah, a cento of the verses of Homer, applied to the life and miracles of Christ, the legend of St. Cyprian, and a panegyric on the Persian victories of Theodosius, and her writings, which were applauded by a servile and superstitious age, have not been disdained by the candor of impartial criticism. The fondness of the emperor was not abated by time and possession, and Eudocia, after the marriage of her daughter, was permitted to discharge her grateful vows by a solemn pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Her ostentatious progress through the East may seem inconsistent with the spirit of Christian humility. She pronounced, from a throne of gold and gems, an eloquent oration to the Senate of Antioch, declared her royal intention of enlarging the walls of the city, bestowed a denotive of two hundred pounds of gold to restore the public baths, and accepted the statues which were decreed by the gratitude of Antioch. In the Holy Land, her alms and pious foundations exceeded the munificence of the great Helena, and though the public treasure might be impoverished by this excessive liberality, she enjoyed the conscious satisfaction of returning to Constantinople with the chains of St. Peter, the right arm of St. Stephen, an undoubted picture of the Virgin, painted by St. Luke. But this pilgrimage was the fatal term of the glories of Eudocia. Satiated with empty pomp, and unmindful, perhaps, of her obligations to Pulcheria, she ambitiously aspired to the government of the Eastern Empire. The palace was distracted by female discord, but the victory was at last decided by the superior ascendant of the sister of Theodosius. The execution of Paulinus, master of the offices, and the disgrace of Cyrus, praetorian prefect of the East, convinced the public that the favor of Eudocia was insufficient to protect her most faithful friends, and the uncommon beauty of Paulinus encouraged the secret rumor that his guilt was that of a successful lover. As soon as the empress perceived that the affection of Theodosius was irretrievably lost, she requested the permission of retiring to the distant solitude of Jerusalem. She obtained her request, but the jealousy of Theodosius, or the vindictive spirit of Pulcheria, pursued her in her last retreat, and Saturninus, count of the domestics, was directed to punish with death two ecclesiastics, her most favored servants. Eudocia instantly revenged them by the assassination of the count. The furious passions which she indulged on this suspicious occasion seemed to justify the severity of Theodosius. And the empress, ignominiously stripped of the honors of her rank, was disgraced, perhaps unjustly, in the eyes of the world. The remainder of the life of Eudocia, about sixteen years, was spent in exile and devotion, and the approach of age, on the death of Theodosius, the misfortunes of her only daughter, who was led a captive from Rome to Carthage, and the society of the holy monks of Palestine, insensibly confirmed the religious temper of her mind. After a full experience of the vicissitudes of human life, the daughter of the philosopher Leontius expired at Jerusalem in the sixty-sixth year of her age, protesting with her dying breath that she had never transgressed the bonds of innocence and friendship. The gentle mind of Theodosius was never inflamed by the ambition of a conquest or military renown, and the slight alarm of a Persian war scarcely interrupted the tranquillity of the East. The motives of this war were just and honorable. In the last year of the reign of Jezdegerd, the supposed guardian of Theodosius, a bishop who aspired to the crown of martyrdom, destroyed one of the fire temples of Susa. His zeal and obstinacy were revenged on his brethren. The Magi excited a cruel persecution, and the intolerant zeal of Jezdegerd was imitated by his son Varanus, or Bahram, who soon afterwards ascended the throne. Some Christian fugitives who escaped to the Roman frontier were solemnly demanded and generously refused, and the refusal, aggravated by commercial disputes, 
soon kindled a war between the rival monarchies. The mountains of Armenia and the plains of Mesopotamia were filled with hostile armies, but the operations of two successive campaigns were not productive of any decisive or memorable events. Some engagements were fought, some towns were besieged, with various and doubtful success, and if the Romans failed in their attempt to recover the long-lost possessions of Nisibis, the Persians were repulsed from the walls of a Mesopotamian city by the valor of a martial bishop, who pointed his thundering engine in the name of St. Thomas the Apostle. Yet the splendid victories which the incredible speed of the messenger Palladius repeatedly announced to the palace of Constantinople were celebrated with festivals and panegyrics. From these panegyrics the historians of the age might borrow their extraordinary and perhaps fabulous tales of the proud challenge of a Persian hero who was entangled by the net and dispatched by the sword of Aerobindus the Goth, of the ten thousand immortals who were slain in the attack of the Roman camp, and of the hundred thousand Arabs or Saracens who were impelled by a panic terror to throw themselves headlong into the Euphrates. Such events may be disbelieved or disregarded, but the charity of a bishop, Acacius of Amida, whose name might have dignified the saintly calendar, shall not be lost in oblivion. Boldly declaring that vases of gold and silver are useless to a god who neither eats nor drinks, the generous prelate sold the plate of the church of Amida, employing the price in the redemption of seven thousand Persian captives, supplied their wants with affectionate liberality, and dismissed them to their native country to inform their king of the true spirit of the religion which he persecuted. The practice of benevolence in the midst of war must always tend to assuage the animosity of contending nations, and I wish to persuade myself that Acacius contributed to the restoration of peace. In the conference which was held on the limits of the two empires, the Roman ambassadors degraded the personal character of their sovereign by a vain attempt to magnify the extent of his power, when they seriously advised the Persians to prevent, by a timely accommodation, the wrath of a monarch who was yet ignorant of this distant war. A truce of one hundred years was solemnly ratified, and although the revolutions of Armenia might threaten the public tranquillity, the essential conditions of this treaty were respected near fourscore years by the successors of Constantine and Artaxerxes. Since the Roman and Parthian standards first encountered on the banks of the Euphrates, the kingdom of Armenia was alternately oppressed by its formidable protectors, and in the course of this history, several events which inclined the balance of peace and war have already been related. A disgraceful treaty had resigned Armenia to the ambition of Sepur, and the scale of Persia appeared to preponderate. But the royal race of Arsaces impatiently submitted to the house of Sassan, the turbulent nobles asserted or betrayed their hereditary independence, and the nation was still attached to the Christian princes of Constantinople. In the beginning of the fifth century, Armenia was divided by the progress of war and faction, and the unnatural division precipitated the downfall of that ancient monarchy. Chosros, the Persian vassal, reigned over the eastern and most extensive portion of the country, while the western province acknowledged the jurisdiction of Arsaces and the supremacy of the emperor Arcadius. After the death of Arsaces, the Romans suppressed the regal government and imposed on their allies the condition of subjects. The military command was delegated to the count of the Armenian frontier. The city of Theodosiopolis was built and fortified in a strong situation on a fertile and lofty ground near the sources of the Euphrates, and the dependent territories were ruled by five satraps, whose dignity was marked by a peculiar habit of gold and purple. The less fortunate nobles, who lamented the loss of their king and envied the honors of their equals, were provoked to negotiate their peace and pardon at Persian court, and returning with their followers to the palace of Artaxata, acknowledged Chosros for their lawful sovereign. About thirty years afterwards, Artaxeres, the nephew and successor of Chosros, fell under the displeasure of the haughty and capricious nobles of Armenia, and they unanimously desired a Persian governor in the room of an unworthy king. The answer of the Archbishop Isaac, whose sanction they earnestly solicited, is expressive of the character of a superstitious people. He deplored the manifest and inexcusable vices of Artaxeres, and declared that he should not hesitate to accuse him before the tribunal of a Christian emperor, who would punish without destroying the sinner. 
Our king, continued Isaac, is too much addicted to licentious pleasures, but he has been purified in the holy waters of baptism. He is a lover of woman, but he does not adore the fire or the elements. He may deserve the reproach of lewdness, but he is an undoubtable Catholic, and his faith is pure, though his manners are flagitious. I will never consent to abandon my sheep to the rage of devouring wolves, and you would soon repent your rash exchange of the infirmities of a believer for the specious virtues of a heathen. Exasperated by the firmness of Isaac, the factious nobles accused both the king and the archbishop as the secret adherents of the emperor, and absurdly rejoiced in the sentence of condemnation, which, after a partial hearing, was solemnly pronounced by Baram himself. The descendants of the Arsaces were degraded from their royal dignity, which they had possessed above five hundred and sixty years, and the dominions of the unfortunate Atasiris, under the new and significant appellation of Perse Armenia, were reduced to the form of a province. This usurpation excited the jealousy of the Roman government, but the rising disputes were soon terminated by an amicable, though unequal, partition of the ancient kingdom of Armenia, and a territorial acquisition, which Augustus might have despised, reflected some luster on the declining empire of the younger Theodosius. During the long and disgraceful reign of twenty-eight years, Honorius, emperor of the West, was separated from the friendship of his brother, and afterwards of his nephew, who reigned over the East. And Constantinople beheld, with apparent indifference and secret joy, the calamities of Rome. The strange adventures of Placidia gradually renewed and cemented the alliance of the two empires. The daughter of the great Theodosius had been the captive and the queen of the Goths. She lost an affectionate husband, she was dragged in chains by his insulting assassin, she tasted the pleasure of revenge, and was exchanged in the Treaty of Peace for 600,000 measures of wheat. After her return from Spain to Italy, Placidia experienced a new persecution in the bosom of her family. She was averse to a marriage, which had been stipulated without her consent, and the brave Constantius, as a noble reward for the tyrants whom he had vanquished, received from the hand of Honorius himself the struggling and reluctant hand of the widow of Adolphus. But her resistance ended with the ceremony of the nuptials. Nor did Placidia refuse to become the mother of Honoria and Valentinian III, or to assume and exercise an absolute dominion over the mind of her grateful husband. The generous soldier, whose time had hitherto been divided between social pleasure and military service, was taught new lessons of avarice and ambition. He extorted the title of Augustus, and the servant of Honorius was associated to the emperor of the West. In the seventh month of his reign, instead of diminishing, seemed to increase the power of Placidia, and the indecent familiarity of her brother, which might be no more than the symptoms of a childish affection, were universally attributed to incestuous love. On a sudden, by some base intrigues of a steward and a nurse, this excessive fondness was converted into an irreconcilable quarrel. The debates of the emperor and his sister were not long confined within the walls of the palace, and as the Gothic soldiers adhered to their queen, the city of Ravenna was agitated with bloody and dangerous tumults, which could only be appeased by the force of a voluntary retreat of Placidia and her children. The royal exiles landed at Constantinople. Soon after the marriage of Theodosius, during the festival of the Persian victories, they retreated with kindness and magnificence, but as the statutes of the emperor Constantius had been rejected by the eastern court, the title of Augusta could not decently be allowed to his widow. Within a few months after the arrival of Placidia, a swift messenger announced the death of Honorius, the consequence of a dropsy. But the important secret was not divulged till the necessary orders had been dispatched for a march of a large body of troops to the coast of Dalmatia. The shops in the gates of Constantinople remained shut during seven days, and the loss of a foreign prince, who could neither be esteemed nor regretted, was celebrated with loud and affected demonstrations of the public grief. While the ministers of Constantinople deliberated, the vacant throne of Honorius was usurped by the ambition of a stranger. The name of the rebel was John. He filled the confidential office of Primisarius, or principal secretary, 
and history has attributed his character more virtues than can be easily reconciled with the violation of the most sacred duty. Elated by the submission of Italy, in the hope of an alliance with the Huns, John presumed to insult, by an embassy, the majesty of the Eastern Emperor. But when he understood that his agents had been banished, imprisoned, and at length chased away with deserved ignominy, John prepared to assert by arms the injustice of his claims. In such a cause, the grandson of the great Theodosius should have marched in person. But the young emperor was easily diverted by his physicians from so rash and hazardous a design. And the conduct of the Italian expedition was prudently entrusted to Ardaburius and his son Asper, who had already signalized their valor against the Persians. It was resolved that Ardaburius should embark with the infantry, whilst Asper, at the head of the cavalry, conducted Placidia and her son Valentinian along the seacoast of the Adriatic. The march of the cavalry was performed with such active diligence that they surprised without resistance the important city of Aquilia. When the hopes of Asper were unexpectedly confounded by the intelligence that a storm had dispersed the imperial fleet and that his father, with only two galleys, was taken and carried a prisoner into the port of Ravenna, Yet this incident, unfortunate as it might seem, facilitated the conquest of Italy. Artaburius employed or abused the courteous freedom which he was permitted to enjoy, to revive among the troops a sense of loyalty and gratitude. And as soon as the conspiracy was ripe for execution, he invited by private messages and pressed the approach of Asper. A shepherd, whom the popular credulity transformed into an angel, guided the eastern cavalry by a secret and, it was thought, an impassable road, through the morasses of the Po. The gates of Ravenna, after a short struggle, were thrown open, and the defenseless tyrant was delivered to the mercy, or rather the cruelty, of the conquerors. His right hand was first cut off, and, after he had been exposed, mounted on an ass to the public derision, John was beheaded in the circus of Aquileia. The Emperor Theodosius, when he received the news of the victory, interrupted the horse races, and singing as he marched through the streets a suitable psalm, conducted his people from the Hippodrome to the church, where he spent the remainder of the day in grateful devotion. In a monarchy, which according to various precedents might be considered as elective or hereditary or patrimonial, it was impossible that the intricate claims of female and collateral succession should be clearly defined. And Theodosius, by the right of consanguinity or conquest, might have reigned the sole legitimate emperor of the Romans. For a moment, perhaps, his eyes were dazzled by the prospect of unbounded sway, but this indolent temper gradually acquiesced in the dictates of sound policy. He contented himself with the possession of the East and wisely relinquished the laborious task of waging a distant and doubtful war against the barbarians beyond the Alps or of securing the obedience of the Italians and Africans, whose minds were alienated by the irreconcilable differences of language and interest. Instead of listening to the voice of ambition, Theodosius resolved to imitate the moderation of his grandfather, and to seat his cousin Valentinian on the throne of the West. The royal infant was distinguished at Constantinople by the title Nobilissimus. He was promoted, before his departure from Thessalonica, to the rank and dignity of Caesar. And after the conquest of Italy, the patrician Helion, by the authority of Theodosius, and in the presence of the Senate, saluted Valentinian III by the name of Augustus, and solemnly invested him with the diadem and the imperial purple. By the agreement of the three females who governed the Roman world, the son of Placidia was betrothed to Eudoxia, the daughter of Theodosius and Athenaeus. And as soon as the lover and his bride had attained the age of puberty, this honorable alliance was faithfully accomplished. At the same time, as a compensation, perhaps, for the expenses of the war, the western Illyricum was detached from the Italian dominions and yielded to the throne of Constantinople. The emperor of the east acquired the useful dominion of the rich and maritime province of Dalmatia and the dangerous sovereignty of Pannonia and Noricum which had been filled and ravaged above twenty years by a promiscuous crowd of Huns, Ostrogoths, Vandals, and Bavarians. 
Theodosius and Valentinian continued to respect the obligations of the Republican and domestic alliance, but the unity of the Roman government was finally dissolved. By a positive declaration, the validity of all future laws was limited to the dominions of their peculiar author, unless he should think proper to communicate them, subscribed with his own hand, for the approbation of his independent colleague. Valentinian, when he received the title of Augustus, was no more than six years of age, and his long minority was entrusted to the guardian care of a mother, who might assert a female claim to the succession of the Western Empire. Placidia envied, but she could not equal the reputation and virtues of the wife and sister of Theodosius, the elegant genius of Eudoxia, the wise and successful policy of Pulcheria, the mother of Valentinian was jealous of the power, which she was incapable of exercising. She reigned twenty-five years in the name of her son, and the character of that unworthy emperor gradually countenanced the suspicion that Placidia had enervated his youth by a dissolute education, and studiously diverted his attention from every manly and honorable pursuit. Amidst the decay of military spirit, her armies were commanded by two generals, Aetius and Boniface who may be deservedly named as the last of the Romans. Their union might have supported a sinking empire. Their discord was the fatal and immediate cause of the loss of Africa. The invasion and defeat of Attila have immortalized the fame of Aetius. And though time has thrown a shade over the exploits of his rival, the defense of Marseille and the deliverance of Africa attest to the military talents of Count Boniface. In the field of battle, in partial encounters, and single combats, he was still the terror of the barbarians. The clergy, and particularly his friend Augustine, were edified by the Christian piety, which had once tempted him to retire from the world. The people applauded his spotless integrity. The army dreaded his equal and inexorable justice, which may be displayed in a very singular example. A peasant who complained of the criminal intimacy between his wife and a Gothic soldier was directed to attend his tribunal the following day. In the evening, the Count, who had diligently informed himself of the time and place of the assignation, mounted his horse, rode ten miles into the country, surprised the guilty couple, punished the soldier with instant death, and silenced the complaints of the husband by presenting him the next morning with the head of the adulterer. The abilities of Aetius and Boniface might have been usefully employed against the public enemies in separate and important commands, but the experience of their past conduct should have decided the real favor and confidence of the Empress Placidia. In the melancholy season of her exile and distress, Boniface alone had maintained her cause with unshaken fidelity, and the troops and treasure treasures of Africa had essentially contributed to extinguish the rebellion. The same rebellion had been supported by the zeal and activity of Aetius, who brought an army of 60,000 Huns from the Danube to the confines of Italy for the service of the usurper. The untimely death of John compelled him to accept an advantageous treaty, but he still continued, the subject and the soldier of Valentinian, to entertain a secret, perhaps a treasonable correspondence with his barbarian allies whose retreat had been purchased by liberal gifts and more liberal promises. But Aetius possessed an advantage of singular moment in a female reign. He was present, he besieged with artful and assiduous flattery the palace of Ravenna, disguised his dark designs with the mask of loyalty and friendship, and at length deceived both his mistress and his absent rival by a subtle conspiracy which a weak woman and a brave man could not easily suspect. He had secretly persuaded Placidia to recall Boniface from the government of Africa. He secretly advised Boniface to disobey the imperial summons. To the one, he represented the order as a sentence of death. To the other, he stated the refusal as a signal of revolt. And when the credulous and unsuspectful Count had armed the province in his defense, Aetius applauded his sagacity in foreseeing the rebellion, which his own perfidy had excited. A temperate inquiry into the real motives of Boniface would have restored a faithful servant to his duty and to the Republic. 
but the arts of Aetius still continued to betray and to inflame, and the count was urged by persecution to embrace the most desperate counsels. The success with which he eluded or repelled the first attacks could not inspire a vain confidence, that at the head of some loose, disorderly Africans he should be able to withstand the regular forces of the West, commanded by a rival, whose military character it was impossible for him to despise. After some hesitation, the last struggles of prudence and loyalty, Boniface dispatched a trusty friend to the court, or rather the camp of Gunderic, king of the Vandals, with the proposal of strict alliance, and the offer of an advantageous and perpetual settlement. After the retreat of the Goths, the authority of Honorius had obtained a precarious establishment in Spain except only in the province of Galicia, where the Suevi and the Vandals had fortified their camps in mutual discord and hostile independence. The Vandals prevailed, and their adversaries were besieged in the Nervasian hills, between Lyon and Aviedo, till the approach of Canisterius compelled, or rather provoked, the victorious barbarians to remove the scene of the war to the plains of Bitka. The rapid progress of the Vandals soon acquired a more effectual opposition, and the master-general Castinus marched against them with a numerous army of Romans and Goths. Vanquished in battle by an inferior army, Castinus fed with dishonor to Tarragona, and this memorable defeat, which has been represented as the punishment, was most probably the effect of his rash presumption. Seville and Cartagena became the reward, or rather the prey, of the ferocious conquerors, and the vessels which they found in the harbor of Cartagena might easily transport them to the isles of Majorca or Menorca, where the Spanish fugitives, as in secure recess, had vainly concealed their families and their fortunes. The experience of navigation, and perhaps the prospects of Africa, encouraged the Vandals to accept the invitation which they received from Count Boniface and the death of Gunderic served only to forward and animate the bold enterprise. In the room of a prince not conspicuous for any superior powers of the mind or body, they acquired his bastard brother, the terrible Genseric, a name which, in the destruction of the Roman Empire, has deserved an equal rank with the names of Alaric or Attila. The king of the Vandals is described to have been of a middle stature, with a lameness on one leg, which he had contracted by an accidental fall from his horse. His slow and cautious speech seldom declared the deep purposes of his soul. He disdained to imitate the luxury of the vanquished, but he indulged the sterner passions of anger and revenge. The ambition of Genseric was without bounds and without scruples, and the warrior could dexterously employ the dark engines of policy to solicit the allies who might be useful to his success, or to scatter among his enemies the seeds of hatred and contention. Almost in the moment of his departure he was informed that Hermanric, king of the Suevi, had presumed to ravage the Spanish territories, which he was resolved to abandon. Impatient of the insult, Genseric pursued the hasty retreat of the Suevi as far as Merida, precipitated the king and his army into the river Annas, and calmly returned to the seashore to embark his victorious troops. The vessels which transported the Vandals over the modern straits of Gibraltar, a channel only twelve miles in breadth, were furnished by the Spaniards, who anxiously wished their departure, and by the African general, who had implored their formidable assistance. Our fancy, so long accustomed to exaggerate and multiply the martial swarms of barbarians that seemed to issue from the north, will perhaps be surprised by the account of the army which Cassinric mustered on the coast of Mauritania. The Vandals, who in twenty years had penetrated from the Elba to Mount Atlas, were united under the command of their warlike king, and he reigned with equal authority over the Alani, who had passed, with the term of human life, from the cold of Scythia to the excessive heat of an African climate. The hopes of the bold enterprise had excited many brave adventurers of the Gothic nation, and many desperate provincials were tempted to repair their fortunes by the same means which had occasioned their ruin. But this various multitude amounted only to fifty thousand effective men, and though Gesenric artfully magnified his apparent strength, 
by appointing eighty kiliarchs, or commanders of thousands, the fallacious increase of old men, of children, and of slaves would scarcely have swelled his army to the number of fourscore thousand persons. But his own dexterity and the discontents of Africa soon fortified the Vandal powers by the accession of numerous and active allies. The parts of Mauritania which border on the great desert in the Atlantic Ocean were filled with the fierce and untraceable race of men, whose savage temper had been exasperated, rather than reclaimed, by their dread of the Roman arm. The wandering Moors, as they gradually ventured to approach the seashore, and the camp of the Vandals, must have viewed with terror and astonishment the dress, the armor, the martial pride and discipline of the unknown strangers, who had landed on their coast, and the fair complexions of the blue-eyed warriors of Germany formed a very singular contrast with the swarthy and olive hue which is derived from the neighborhood of the torrid zone. After the first difficulties had in some measure been removed, which arose from the mutual ignorance of their respective language, the Moors, regardless of any future consequence, embraced the alliance of their enemies of Rome, and a crowd of naked savages rushed from the woods and the valleys of Mount Atlas to satiate their revenge on the polished tyrants who had injuriously expelled them from the native sovereignty of the land. The persecution of the Donatists was an event not less favorable to the designs of Genseric. Seventeen years before he landed in Africa, a public conference was held at Carthage by the order of the magistrate. The Catholics were satisfied that, after the invincible reasons which they had alleged, the obstinacy of the schismatics must be inexcusable and voluntary and the Emperor Honorius was persuaded to inflict the most rigorous penalties on a faction which had so long abused his patience and clemency. Three hundred bishops, with many thousands of the inferior clergy, were torn from their churches, stripped of their ecclesiastical possessions, banished to the islands, and prescribed by the laws, if they presumed to conceal themselves in the provinces of Africa. Their numerous congregations, both in the cities and in the country, were deprived of the rights of citizens, and of the exercise of religious worship. A regular scale of fines from ten to two hundred pounds of silver was curiously ascertained, according to the distinction of rank and fortune, to punish the crime of assisting at a schismatic conventicle. And if the fine had been levied five times, without subduing the obstinacy of the offender, his future punishment was referred to the discretion of the imperial court. By these severities, which obtained the warmest approbation of St. Augustine, great numbers of Donatists were reconciled to the Catholic Church. But the fanatics, who still preserved in their opposition, were provoked to madness and despair. The distracted country was filled with tumult and bloodshed. The armed troops of circumcilians alternatively pointed their rage against themselves, or against their adversaries, and the calendar of martyrs received on both sides a considerable augmentation. Under these circumstances, Genseric, a Christian, but an enemy of the Orthodox communion, showed himself to the Donatists as a powerful deliverer, from whom they might reasonably expect the repeal of the odious and oppressive edicts of the Roman emperors. The conquest of Africa was facilitated by the act of zeal, or the secret favor of a domestic faction, the wanton outrages against the church and the clergy, of which the Vandals are accused, may be fairly imputed to the fanaticism of their allies, and the intolerant spirit which disgraced the triumph of Christianity, contributed to the loss of the most important province of the West. The court and the people were astonished by the strange intelligence that a virtuous hero, after so many favors and so many services, had renounced his allegiance, and invited the barbarians to destroy the province entrusted to his command. The friends of Boniface, who still believed that his criminal behavior might be excused by some honorable motive, solicited, during the absence of Aetius, a free conference with the Count of Africa, and Darius, an officer of high distinction, was named for the important embassy. In their first interview at Carthage, the imaginary provocations were mutually explained. The opposite letters of Aetius were produced and compared, and the fraud was easily detected. 
Placidia and Boniface lamented their fatal error, and the Count had sufficient magnanimity to confide in the forgiveness of his sovereign, or to expose his head to her future resentment. His repentance was fervent and sincere, but he soon discovered that it was no longer in his power to restore the edifice which he had shaken to its foundations. Carthage and the Roman garrisons returned with their general to the allegiance of the Valentinian, but the rest of Africa was still distracted with war and faction, and the inexorable king of the Vandals, disdaining all terms of accommodation, sternly refused to relinquish the possession of his prey. The band of veterans who marched under the standard of Boniface and his hasty levies of provincial troops were defeated with considerable loss. The victorious barbarians insulted the open country, and Carthage, Curta, and Hippo Regius were the only cities that appeared to rise above the general inundation. The long and narrow tract of the African coast was filled with frequent monuments of Roman art and magnificence and the respective degrees of improvement might be accurately measured by the distance from Carthage and the Mediterranean. A simple reflection will impress every thinking mind with the clearest idea of fertility and cultivation. The country was extremely populous. The inhabitants reserved a liberal subsistence for their own use, and the annual exportation, particularly of wheat, was so regular and plentiful that Africa deserved the name of the common granary of Rome and of mankind. On a sudden, the seven fruitful provinces, from Tangier to Tripoli, were overwhelmed by the invasion of the Vandals, whose destructive rage had perhaps been exaggerated by popular animosity, religious zeal, and extravagant declamation. War, in its fairest form, implies a perpetual violation of humanity and justice, and the hostility of the barbarians are inflamed by the fierce and lawless spirit which incessantly disturbs their peaceful and domestic society. The Vandals, where they found resistance, seldom gave quarter, and the deaths of their valiant countrymen were expiated by the ruin of cities under whose walls they had fallen. Careless of the distinctions of age or sex or rank, they employed every species of indignity and torture to force from the captives a discovery of their hidden wealth. The stern policy of Genseric justified his frequent examples of military execution. He was not always the master of his own passions, or of those of his followers. And the calamities of war were aggravated by the licentiousness of the Moors and the fanaticism of the Donatists. Yet I shall not easily be persuaded that it was the common practice of the Vandals to extirpate the olives and other fruit trees of a country where they intended to settle. Nor can I believe that it was an unusual stratagem to slaughter great numbers of their prisoners before the walls of a besieged city, for the sole purpose of infecting the air and producing a pestilence of which they themselves must have been the first victims. The generous mind of Count Boniface was tortured by the exquisite distress of beholding the ruin which he had occasioned, and whose rapid progress he was unable to check. After the loss of a battle, he retired to Hippo Regius, where he was immediately besieged by an enemy who considered him as the real bulwark of Africa. The maritime colony of Hippo, about 200 miles westward of Carthage, had formerly acquired the distinguishing epithet of Regius, from the residence of Numidian kings and some remains of trade and populousness still adhere to a modern city, which is known in Europe by the corrupted name of Bona. The military labors and anxious reflections of Count Boniface were alleviated by the edifying conversation of his friend St. Augustine. To that bishop, the light and pillar of the Catholic Church, was gently released in the third month of the siege, and in the seventy-sixth year of his age, from the actual and impending calamities of his country. The youth of Augustine had been stained by the vices and errors which he so ingeniously confesses. But from the moment of his conversion to that of his death, the manners of the Bishop of Hippo were pure and austere, and the most conspicuous of his virtues was an ardent zeal against the heretics of every denomination, the Manichaeans, the Donatists, and the Pelagians, against whom he waged a perpetual controversy. When the city, some months after his death, was burnt by the Vandals, the library was fortunately saved, which contained his voluminous writings, 
232 separate books or treatises on theological subject, besides a complete exposition of the Psalter and the Gospel, and a copious magazine of epistles and homilies. According to the judgment of the most impartial critics, the superficial learning of Augustine was confined to the Latin language, and his style, though sometimes animated by the eloquence of passion, is usually clouded by false and affected rhetoric. But he possessed a strong, capacious, argumentative mind. He boldly sounded the dark abyss of grace, predestination, free will, and original sin, and the rigid system of Christianity which he framed or restored has been entertained with public applause and secret reluctance by the Latin Church. By the skill of Boniface, and perhaps by the ignorance of the Vandals, the siege of Hippo was protracted above fourteen months. The sea was continually open, and when the adjacent country had been exhausted by a regular rapine, the besiegers themselves were compelled by famine to relinquish their enterprise. The importance and danger of Africa were deeply felt by the regent of the West. Placidia implored the assistance of her eastern ally, and the Italian fleet and army were reinforced by Asper, who sailed from Constantinople with a powerful armament. As soon as the force of the two empires were united under the command of Boniface, he boldly marched against the Vandals. In the loss of the second battle, irretrievably decided the fate of Africa. He embarked with the precipitation of despair, and the people of Hippo were permitted with their families and effects, to occupy the vacant place of the soldiers, the greatest part of whom were either slain or made prisoners by the Vandals. The Count, whose fatal credulity had wounded the vitals of the Republic, might enter the palace of Ravenna with some anxiety, which was soon removed by the smiles of Placidia. Boniface attempted with gratitude the rank of patrician and the dignity of Master General of the Roman armies, but he must have blushed at the sight of those medals in which he was represented with the name and attributes of victory. The discovery of his fraud, the displeasure of the empress, and the distinguished favor of his rival exasperated the haughty and perfidious soul of Aetius. He hastily returned from Gaul to Italy with a retinue, or rather with an army, of barbarian followers, and such was the weakness of the government that the two generals decided their private quarrel in a bloody battle. Boniface was successful, but he received in the conflict a mortal wound from the spear of his adversary, of which he expired within a few days, in such Christian and charitable sentiments that he exhorted his wife, a rich heiress of Spain, to accept Aetius for her second husband. But Aetius could not derive any immediate advantage from the generosity of his dying enemy. He was proclaimed a rebel by the justice of Placidia and though he attempted to defend some strong fortresses erected on his patrimonial estate, the imperial power soon compelled him to retire into Pannonia, to the tents of his faithful Huns. The Republic was deprived, by their mutual discord, of the service of her two most illustrious champions. It might naturally be expected, after the retreat of Boniface, that the Vandals would achieve without resistance or delay the conquest of Africa. Eight years, however, elapsed from the evacuation of Hippo to the reduction of Carthage. In the midst of that interval, the ambitious Genseric, in the full tide of apparent prosperity, negotiated a treaty of peace, by which he gave his son Huneric for hostage, and consented to leave the western emperor in the undisturbed possession of the three Mauritanias. This moderation, which cannot be imputed to the justice, might be ascribed to the policy of the conqueror, his throne was encompassed with domestic enemies who accused the baseness of his birth and asserted the legitimate claims of his nephews, the sons of Gunderic. These nephews, indeed, he sacrificed to his safety, and their mother, the widow of the deceased king, was precipitated by his order into the river Epsaga. But the public discontent burst forth in dangerous and frequent conspiracies and the warlike tyrant is supposed to have shed more vandal blood by the hand of the executioner than in the field of battle. The convulsions of Africa, which had favored his attack, opposed the firm establishment of his power, and the various seditions of the Moors and Germans, the Donatists and Catholics, continually disturbed or threatened the unsettled reign of the conqueror. As he advanced towards Carthage, 
he was forced to withdraw his troops from the western provinces. The seacoast was exposed to the naval enterprises of the Romans of Spain and Italy, and in the heart of Numidia, the strong inland city of Corda still persisted in obstinate independence. These difficulties were gradually subdued by the spirit, the perseverance, and the cruelty of Genseric who alternately applied the arts of peace and war to the establishment of his African kingdom. He subscribed a solemn treaty with the hope of deriving some advantage from the term of its continuance and the moment of its violation. The vigilance of his enemies was relaxed by the protestations of friendship, which concealed his hostile approach, and Carthage was at length surprised by the Vandals. 585 years after the destruction of the city and republic by the younger Scipio. A new city had arisen from its ruins with the title of a colony, and though Carthage might yield the royal prerogatives of Constantinople, and perhaps to the trade of Alexandria, or the splendor of Antioch, she still maintained the second rank in the West, as the Rome, if we may use the style of contemporaries, of the African world. That wealthy and opulent metropolis displayed, in a dependent condition, the image of a flourishing republic. Carthage contained the manufacturers, the arms, and the treasures of the six provinces. A regular subordination of civil honors gradually ascended from the procurators of the streets and quarters of the city to the tribunal of the supreme magistrate, who, with the title of proconsul, represented the state and dignity of a consul of ancient Rome. Schools and gymnasia were instituted for the education of the African youth and the liberal arts and manners, grammar, rhetoric, and philosophy were publicly taught in the Greek and Latin languages. The buildings of Carthage were uniform and magnificent. A shady grove was planted in the midst of the capital. The new port, a secure and capacious harbor, was subservient to the commercial industry of citizens and strangers, and the splendid games of the circus and theater were exhibited almost in the presence of the barbarians. The reputation of the Carthaginians was not equal to that of their country and the reproach of Punic faith still adhered to their subtle and faithless character. The habits of trade and the abuse of luxury had corrupted their manners, but their impious contempt of monks and the shameless practice of a natural lust are the two abominations which excite the pious vehemence of Salvian, the preacher of the age. The king of the Vandals severely reformed the vices of a voluptuous people, and the ancient, noble, ingenuous freedom of Carthage these expressions of victor are not without energy, was reduced by Genseric into a state of ignominious servitude. After he had permitted his licentious troops to satiate their rage and avarice, he instituted a more regular system of rapine and oppression. An edict was promulgated, which enjoined all persons, without fraud or delay, to deliver their gold, silver, jewels, and valuable furniture or apparel to the royal officers and the attempt to secrete any part of their patrimony was inexorably punished with death and torture, as an act of treason against the state. The lands of the proconsular province, which formed the immediate districts of Carthage, were accurately measured and divided among the barbarians. In the conqueror reserve, for its peculiar domain, the fertile territory of Byzactium, and the adjacent plains of Numidia and Getulia. It was natural enough that Ginsrek should hate those whom he had injured. The nobility and the senators of Carthage were exposed to his jealousy and resentment, and all those who refused the ignominious terms which their honor and religion forbade them to accept were compelled by the Arian tyrant to embrace the condition of perpetual banishment. Rome, Italy, and the provinces of the East were filled with a crowd of exiles, of fugitives, and of ingenuous captives who solicited the public compassion, and the benevolent epistles of Theodoret still preserve the names and misfortunes of Celestian and Maria. The Syrian bishop deplores the misfortune of Celestian, who from the state of a noble and opulent senator of Carthage was reduced, with his wife and family and servants, to beg his bread in a foreign country. But he applauds the resignation of the Christian exile, and the philosophic temper which, under the pressure of such calamity, could enjoy more real happiness than was the ordinary lot of wealth and prosperity. The story of Maria, the daughter of the magnificent Studeman, is singular and interesting. 
In the sack of Carthage she was purchased from the Vandals by some merchants of Syria, who afterwards sold her as a slave in their native country. A female attendant, transported in the same ship and sold in the same family, still continued to respect a mistress whom fortune had reduced to the common level of servitude. And the daughter of Edomon received from her grateful affection the domestic services which she had once required from her obedience. This remarkable behavior divulged the real condition of Maria, who in the absence of the bishop of Cyrus was redeemed from slavery by the generosity of some soldiers of the garrison. The liberality of Theodoret provided for her decent maintenance, and she passed ten months among the deaconesses of the church, till she was unexpectedly informed that her father, who had escaped from the ruin of Carthage, exercised an honorable office in one of the western provinces. Her filial impatience was seconded by the pious bishop Theodoret, and a letter still extant recommends Maria to the bishop of Aege, a maritime city of Cilicia, which was frequented during the annual fair by the vessels of the west, most earnestly requesting that his colleague would use the maiden with a tenderness suitable to her birth, and that he would entrust her to the care of such faithful merchants as would esteem it a sufficient gain, if they restored a daughter, lost beyond all human hope, to the arms of her afflicted parent. Among the insipid legends of ecclesiastical history, I am tempted to distinguish the memorable fate of the seven sleepers, whose imaginary date corresponds with the reign of the younger Theodosius, and the conquest of Africa by the Vandals. When the emperor Decius persecuted the Christians, Seven noble youths of Ephesus concealed themselves in a spacious cavern in the side of an adjacent mountain, where they were doomed to perish by the tyrant, who gave orders that the entrance should be firmly secured by a pile of huge stones. They immediately fell into a deep slumber, which was miraculously prolonged without injuring the powers of life, during a period of 187 years. At the end of that time, the slaves of Adelius, to whom the inheritance of the mountain had descended, removed the stones to supply materials for some rustic edifice. The light of the sun darted into the cavern, and the seven sleepers were permitted to awake. After a slumber, as they thought of a few hours, they were pressed by the calls of hunger, and resolved that Jamblicus, one of their number, should secretly return to the city to purchase bread for the use of his companions. The youth, if we may still employ that appellation, could no longer recognize the once familiar aspect of his native country, and his surprise was increased by the appearance of a large cross triumphantly erected over the principal gate of Ephesus. His singular dress and obsolete language confounded the baker, to whom he offered an ancient medal of Decius as the current coin of the empire. And Jamblicus, on the suspicion of a secret treasure, was dragged before the judge. Their mutual inquiries produced the amazing discovery that two centuries were almost elapsed since Jamblicus and his friends had escaped from the rage of a pagan tyrant. The bishop of Ephesus, the clergy, the magistrates, the people, and, it is said, the emperor Theodosius himself, hastened to visit the cavern of the seven sleepers, who bestowed their benediction, related their story, and at the same instant peaceably expired. The origin of this marvelous fable cannot be ascribed to the pious fraud and credulity of the modern Greeks, since the authentic tradition may be traced within a half a century of the supposed miracle. James of Sarug, a Syrian bishop, who was born only two years after the death of the younger Theodosius, had devoted one of his 230 homilies to the praise of the young men of Ephesus. Their legend, before the end of the 6th century, was translated from the Syriac into the Latin language by the care of Gregory of Tours. The hostile communions of the East preserve their memory with equal reverence, and their names are honorably inscribed in the Roman, the Abyssinian, and the Russian calendar. Nor has their reputation been confined to the Christian world. This popular tale, which Mahomet might learn when he drove his camels to the fairs of Syria, is introduced as a divine revelation into the Quran. The story of the seven sleepers has been adopted and adorned by the nations, from Bengal to Africa, who profess the Mahometan religion, 
and some vestiges of a similar tradition have been discovered in the remote extremities of Scandinavia. This easy and universal belief, so expressive of the sense of mankind, may be ascribed to the genuine merit of the fable itself. We imperceivably advance from youth to age, without observing the gradual but incessant change of human affairs. And even in our larger experience of history, the imagination is accustomed, by a perpetual series of causes and effects, to unite the most distant revolutions. But if the interval between two memorable areas could be instantly annihilated, if it were possible, after a momentary slumber of two hundred years, to display the new world to the eyes of the spectator, who still retained a lively and recent impression of the old, his surprise and his reflections would furnish the pleasing subject of a philosophical romance. The scene could not be more advantageously placed than in the two centuries which elapsed between the reigns of Decius and Theodosius the Younger. During this period, the seat of government had been transported from Rome to a new city on the banks of the Thracian Bosphorus, and the abuse of military spirit had been suppressed by an artificial system of tame and ceremonious servitude. The throne of the persecuting Decius was filled by a succession of Christian and Orthodox princes, who had extirpated the fabulous gods of antiquity, and the public devotion of the age was impatient to exalt the saints and martyrs of the Catholic Church on the altars of Diana and Hercules. The union of the Roman Empire was dissolved. Its genius was humbled into the dust, and armies of unknown barbarians, issuing from frozen regions of the north, had established their victorious reign over the fairest provinces of Europe and Africa. The western world was oppressed by the Goths and Vandals who fled before the Huns, but the achievements of the Huns themselves were not adequate to their power and prosperity. Their victorious hordes had spread from the Volga to the Danube, but the public force was exhausted by the discord of independent chieftains. Their valor was idly consumed in obscure and predatory excursions, and they often degraded their national dignity by condescending, for the hopes of spoil, to enlist under the banners of their fugitive enemies. In the reign of Attila, the Huns again became the terror of the world, and I shall now describe the character and actions of that formidable barbarian, who alternately insulted and invaded the East and the West, and urged the rapid downfall of the Roman Empire. In the tide of emigration which impetuously rolled from the confines of China to those of Germany, the most powerful and populous tribes may commonly be found on the verge of the Roman provinces. The accumulated weight was sustained for a while by artificial barriers, and the easy condescension of their emperors invited, without satisfying the insolent demands of the barbarians, who had acquired an eager appetite for the luxuries of civilized life. The Hungarians, who ambitiously insert the name of Attila among their native kings, may affirm with truth that the hordes, which were subject to his uncle Roas, or Rugilas, had formed their encampments within the limits of modern Hungary in a fertile country, which liberally supplied the wants of a nation of hunters and shepherds. In this advantageous situation, Rugilas and his valiant brothers, who continually added to their power and reputation, commanded the alternative of peace or war with the two empires. His alliance with the Romans of the West was cemented by his personal friendship for the great Aetius, who was always secure of finding in the barbarian camp a hospital reception and a powerful support. At his solicitation, and in the name of John the Usurper, sixty thousand Huns advanced to the confines of Italy. Their march and their retreat were alike expensive to the state, and the grateful policy of Aetius abandoned the possession of Pannonia to his faithful confederates. The Romans of the East were not less apprehensive of the arms of Rugilas, which threatened the provinces or even the capital. Some ecclesiastic historians have destroyed the barbarians with lightning and pestilence, but Theodosius was reduced to the more humble expedient of stipulating an annual payment of three hundred and fifty pounds of gold, and of disguising this dishonorable tribute by the title of general, which the king of the Huns condescended to accept. The public tranquillity was frequently interrupted by the fierce impatience of the barbarians, and the perfidious intrigues of the Byzantine court. Four dependent nations— 
among whom we may distinguish the barbarians, disclaimed the sovereignty of the Huns, and their revolt was encouraged and protected by a Roman alliance, till the just claims and formidable power of Rugilas were effectually urged by the voice of Eslav, his ambassador. Peace was the unanimous wish of the Senate. Their decree was ratified by the Emperor, and two ambassadors were named, Plintas, a general of Scythian extraction, but of consular rank, and the quaestor Epigenes, a wise and experienced statesman, who was recommended to that office by his ambitious colleague. The death of Rugilas suspended the progress of the treaty. His two nephews, Attila and Bleda, who succeeded to the throne of their uncle, consented to a personal interview with the ambassadors of Constantinople, but as they proudly refused to dismount, the business was transacted on horseback, in a spacious plain near the city of Margus, in the upper Mesia. The kings of the Huns assumed the solid benefits, as well as the main honors of the negotiation. They dictated the conditions of peace, and each condition was an insult to the majesty of the empire. Besides the freedom of a safe and plentiful market on the banks of the Danube, they required that the annual contribution should be augmented from 350 to 700 pounds of gold, that a fine or ransom of eight pieces of gold should be paid for every Roman captive who had escaped from his barbarian master, that the emperor should renounce all treaties and engagements with the enemies of the Huns, and that all the fugitives who had taken refuge in the court or provinces of Theodosius should be delivered to the justice of their offended sovereign. This justice was rigorously inflicted on some unfortunate youths of a royal race. They were crucified on the territories of the empire, by the command of Attila, and as soon as the king of the Huns had impressed the Romans with the terror of his name, he indulged them in a short and arbitrary respite, whilst he subdued the rebellious or independent nations of Scythia and Germany. Attila, the son of Mundstuk, deduced his noble, perhaps his regal descent from the ancient Huns, who had formerly contended with the monarchs of China. His features, according to the observation of a Gothic historian, were the stamp of his national origin, and the portrait of Attila exhibits the genuine deformity of a modern Kalmuk, a large head, a swarthy complexion, small, deep-seated eyes, a flat nose, a few hairs in the place of a beard, broad shoulders, and a short, square body, of nervous strength, though of a disproportioned form. The haughty step and demeanor of the king of the Huns expressed the consciousness of his superiority above the rest of mankind, and he had a custom of fiercely rolling his eyes, as if he wished to enjoy the terror which he inspired. Yet this savage hero was not inaccessible to pity. His suppliant enemies might confide in the assurance of peace or pardon, and Attila was considered by his subjects as a just and indulgent master. He delighted in war, but after he had ascended the throne in a mature age, his head, rather than his hand, achieved the conquest of the north, and the fame of an adventurous soldier was usefully exchanged for that of a prudent and successful general. The effects of personal valor are so inconsiderable, except in poetry or romance, that victory, even among barbarians, must depend on the degree of skill with which the passions of the multitude are combined and guided for the service of a single man. The Scythian conquerors, Attila and Gingis, surpassed their rude countrymen in art rather than in courage, and it may be observed that the monarchies, both of the Huns and of the Mughals, were erected by their founders on the basis of popular superstition. The miraculous conception, which fraud and credulity ascribed to the virgin mother of Gingis, raised him above the level of human nature, the naked prophet, who in the name of the deity invested him with the empire of the earth, pointed to the valor of the Mughals with irresistible enthusiasm. The religious arts of Attila were not less skillfully adapted to the character of his age and country. It was natural enough that the Scythians should adore with peculiar devotion the god of war, but as they were incapable of forming either an abstract idea or a corporal representation, they worshipped their tutelar deity under the symbol of an iron scimitar. One of the shepherds of the Huns perceived that the heifer who was grazing had wounded herself in the foot, and curiously following the track of the blood, till he discovered, among the long grass, the point of an ancient sword, which he dug out of the ground and presented to Attila. That magnanimous, or rather that artful prince accepted, with pious gratitude, this celestial favor, 
and as the right possessor of the sword of Mars, asserted his divine and indefeasible claim to the dominion of the earth. If the rites of Scythia were practiced on this solemn occasion, a lofty altar, or rather pile of faggots, three hundred yards in length and in breadth, was raised in a spacious plain, and the sword of Mars was placed erect on the summit of this rustic altar, which was annually consecrated by the blood of sheep, horses, and of the hundredth captive. Whether human sacrifices formed any part of the worship of Attila, or whether he propitiated the god of war with the victims which he continually offered in the field of battle, the favorite of Mars soon acquired a sacred character, which rendered his conquests more easy and more permanent. And the barbarian princes confessed, in the language of devotion or flattery, that they could not presume to gaze with a steady eye on the divine majesty of the king of the Huns. His brother Bleda, who reigned over a considerable part of the nation, was compelled to resign his sceptre and his life. Yet even this cruel act was attributed to a supernatural impulse, and the vigor with which Attila wielded the sword of Mars convinced the world that it had been reserved alone for his invincible arm. But the extent of his empire affords the only remaining evidence of the number and importance of his victories, and the Scythian monarch, however ignorant of the value of science and philosophy, might perhaps lament that his illiterate subjects were destitute of the art which could perpetuate the memory of his exploits. If a line of separation were drawn between the civilized and the savage climates of the globe, between the inhabitants of cities who cultivated the earth, and the hunters and shepherds who dwelt in tents, Attila might aspire to the title of supreme and sole monarch of the barbarians. He alone, among the conquerors of ancient and modern times, united the two mighty kingdoms of Germany and Scythia, and those vague appellations, when they are applied to this reign, may be understood with an ample latitude. Thuringia, which stretched beyond its actual limits as far as the Danube, was in the number of his provinces. He interposed with the weight of a powerful neighbor in the domestic affairs of the Franks, and one of his lieutenants chastised and almost exterminated the Burgundians of the Rhine, he subdued the islands of the ocean, the kingdoms of Scandinavia, encompassed and divided by the waters of the Baltic, and the Huns might derive a tribute of furs from that northern region, which has been protected from all other conquerors by the severity of the climate and the courage of the natives. Towards the east, it is difficult to circumscribe the dominion of Attila over the Scythian deserts, yet we may be assured that he reigned on the banks of the Volga, that the king of the Huns was dreaded not only as a warrior, but as a magician, that he insulted and vanquished the Khan of the formidable Geogen, and that he sent ambassadors to negotiate an equal alliance with the empire of China. In the proud review of the nations who acknowledged the sovereignty of Attila, and who never entertained during his lifetime the thought of a revolt, the Gepidae and the Ostrogoths were distinguished by their numbers, their bravery, and the personal merits of their chiefs. The renowned Ardaric king of the Gepidae was the faithful and sagacious counsellor of the monarch, who esteemed his intrepid genius, whilst he loved the mild and discreet virtues of the noble Waldamir, king of the Ostrogoths. The crowd of vulgar kings, the leaders of so many martial tribes who served under the standard of Attila, were ranged in the submissive order of guards and domestic round the person of their master. They watched his nod, they trembled at his frown, and at the first signal of his will they executed, without murmur or hesitation, his stern and absolute commands. In time of peace, the dependent princes, with their national troops, attended the royal camp in regular succession. But when Attila collected his military force, he was able to bring into the field an army of five, or according to another account, of seven hundred thousand barbarians. The ambassadors of the Huns might awaken the attention of Theodosius by reminding him that they were his neighbors both in Europe and Asia, since they touched the Danube on one hand and reached with the other as far as the Tanais. In the reign of his father Arcadius, a band of adventurous Huns had ravaged the provinces of the east, from whence they brought away rich spoils and innumerable captives. They advanced by a secret path along the shores of the Caspian Sea, traversed the snowy mountains of Armenia, passed the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Halis, recruited their weary cavalry with the generous breed of Cappadocian horses, occupied the hilly country of Cilicia, 
and disturbed the festal songs and dances of the citizens of Antioch. Egypt trembled at their approach, and the monks and pilgrims of the Holy Land prepared to escape the fury by a speedy embarkation. The memory of this invasion was still recent in the minds of the Orientals. The subjects of Attila might execute, with superior forces, the design which these adventurers had so boldly attempted, and it soon became the subject of anxious conjecture whether the tempest would fall on the dominions of Rome or of Persia. Some of the great vassals of the King of the Huns, who were themselves in the rank of powerful princes, had been sent to ratify an alliance and society of arms with the Emperor, or rather with the General of the West. They related, during their residence at Rome, the circumstances of an expedition which they had lately made into the East. After passing a desert and the morass, supported by the Romans to be the Lake Maotis, they penetrated through the mountains and arrived at the end of a fifteen days' march on the confines of Media, where they advanced as far as the unknown cities of Basic and Kursik. They encountered the Persian army in the plains of Media, and the air, according to their own expression, was darkened by a cloud of arrows. But the Huns were obliged to retire before the numbers of the enemy. Their laborious retreat was effected by a different road. They lost the greatest part of their booty, and at length returned to the royal camp with some knowledge of the country and an impatient desire of revenge. In the free conversation of the imperial ambassadors, who discussed at the court of Attila the character and designs of their formidable enemy, the ministers of Constantinople expressed their hope that his strength might be diverted and employed in long and doubtful contest with the princes of the house of Sassan. The more sagacious Italians admonished their eastern brethren of the folly and danger of such a hope, and convinced them that the Medes and Persians were incapable of resisting the arms of the Huns, and that the easy and important acquisition would exalt the pride as well as power of the conqueror. Instead of contending himself with a moderate contribution and a military title, which equaled him only to the generals of Theodosius, Attila would proceed to impose a disgraceful and intolerable yoke on the necks of the prostrate and captive Romans, who would then be encompassed on all sides by the empire of the Huns. While the powers of Europe and Asia were solicitous to avert the impending danger, the alliance of Attila maintained the Vandals in the possession of Africa. An enterprise had been concerted between the courts of Ravenna and Constantinople for the recovery of that valuable province, and the ports of Sicily were already filled with the military and naval forces of Theodosius. But the subtle Genseric, who spread his negotiations round the world, prevented their designs by exciting the king of the Huns to invade the Eastern Empire, and the trifling incident soon became the motive or pretense of a destructive war. Under the fate of the Treaty of Margus, a free market was held on the northern side of the Danube, which was protected by a Roman fortress surnamed Constantia. A troop of barbarians violated the commercial security, killed or dispersed the unsuspecting traders, and leveled the fortress with the ground. The Huns justified this outrage as an act of reprisal, alleged that the bishop of Margus had entered their territories to discover and steal a secret treasure of their king, and sternly demanded the guilty prelate, the sacrilegious spoil, and the fugitive subjects who had escaped from the justice of Attila. The refusal of the Byzantine court was the signal of war, and the Messians at first applauded the generous firmness of their sovereign. But they were soon intimidated by the destruction of Viminiacum and the adjacent towns, and the people was persuaded to adopt the convenient maxim that a private citizen, however innocent or respectable, may be justly sacrificed to the safety of his country. The bishop of Margus, who did not possess the spirit of a martyr, resolved to prevent the designs which he suspected. He boldly treated with the princes of the Huns, secured by solemn oaths his pardon and reward, posted a numerous detachment of barbarians in silent ambush on the banks of the Danube, and at the appointed hour, opened with his own hands the gates of his episcopal city. This advantage, which had been obtained by treachery, served as a prelude to more honorable and decisive victories. The Illyrian frontier was covered by a line of castles and fortresses, and though the greatest part of them consisted only of a single tower with a small garrison, they were commonly sufficient to repel or to intercept the inroads of an enemy who was ignorant of the art and impatient of the delay of a regular siege. But these slight obstacles were instantly swept away by the inundation of the Huns. 
They destroyed, with fire and sword, the populous cities of Sirmium and Singidinum, of Rataria and Marcianopolis, of Naisus and Sardica, where every circumstance of the discipline of the people and the construction of the buildings had been gradually adapted to the sole purpose of defence. The whole breadth of Europe, as it extends above five hundred miles from the Euxine to the Hadriatic, was at once invaded and occupied and desolated by the myriads of barbarians whom Attila led into the field. The public danger and distress could not, however, provoke Theodosius to interrupt his amusements and devotion, or to appear in person at the head of the Roman legions. But the troops, which had been sent against Genseric, were hastily recalled from Sicily, the garrisons on the side of Persia were exhausted, and a military force was collected in Europe, formidable by their arms and numbers, if the generals had understood the signs of command, and the soldiers the duty of obedience. The armies of the Eastern Empire were vanquished in three successive engagements, and the process of Attila may be traced by the fields of battle. The two former, on the banks of the Utus, and under the walls of Marcianopolis, were fought in the extensive plains between the Danube and Mount Hamus. As the Romans were pressed by a victorious enemy, they gradually and unskilfully retired towards the Chersoneus of Thrace, and that narrow peninsula, the last extremity of the land, was marked by their third and irreparable defeat. By the destruction of this army, Attila acquired the indisputable possession of the field. From the Hellespont to Thermopylae, and the suburbs of Constantinople, he ravaged, without resistance and without mercy, the provinces of Thrace and Macedonia. Heraclea and Hadrianople might, perhaps, escape this dreadful eruption of the Huns, but the words, the most expressive of total extirpation and erasure, are applied to the calamities which they inflicted on seventy cities of the Eastern Empire. Theodosius, his court, and the unwarlike people were protected by the walls of Constantinople, but those walls had been shaken by a recent earthquake, and the fall of fifty-eight towers had opened a large and tremendous breach. The damage indeed was speedily repaired, but this accident was aggravated by a superstitious fear that heaven itself had delivered the imperial city to the shepherds of Scythia, who were strangers to the laws, the language, and the religion of the Romans. In all their invasions of the civilized empires of the south, the Scythian shepherds have been uniformly actuated by a savage and destructive spirit. The laws of war that restrain the exercise of national rapine and murder are founded on two principles of substantial interest, the knowledge of the permanent benefits which may be obtained by a moderate use of conquest, and a just apprehension, lest the desolation which we inflict on the enemy's country may be retaliated on our own. But these considerations of hope and fear are almost unknown in the pastoral state of nations. The Huns of Attila may, without injustice, be compared to the Mughals and Tartars, before their primitive manners were changed by religion and luxury, and the evidence of Oriental history may reflect some light on the short and imperfect annals of Rome. After the Mughals had subdued the northern provinces of China, it was seriously proposed, not in the hour of victory and passion, but in calm deliberate council, to exterminate all the inhabitants of that populous country, that the vacant land might be converted to the pasture of cattle. The firmness of a Chinese Mandarin, who insinuated some principles of rational policy into the minds of Jingis, diverted him from the execution of this horrid design. But in the cities of Asia, which yielded to the Mughals, the inhuman abuse of the rights of war was exercised with a regular form of discipline, which may, with equal reason, though not with equal authority, be imputed to the victorious Huns. The inhabitants, who had submitted to their discretion, were ordered to evacuate their houses, and to assemble in some plain adjacent to the city, where a division was made of the vanquished into three parts. The first class consisted of the soldiers of the garrison, and the young men capable of bearing arms, and their fate was instantly decided. They were either enlisted among the Mughals, or they were massacred on the spot by the troops, who, with pointed spears and bended bows, had formed a circle round the captive multitude. The second class, composed of the young and beautiful women, of the artificers of every rank and profession, and of the more wealthy or honourable citizens, from whom a private ransom might be expected, was distributed in equal or proportionate lots. The remainder, whose life or death was alike useless to the conquerors, were permitted to return to the city, 
which in the meanwhile had been stripped of its valuable furniture, and a tax was imposed on those wretched inhabitants for the indulgence of breathing their native air. Such was the behavior of the Mughals, when they were not conscious of any extraordinary rigor, but the most casual provocation, the slightest motive of caprice or convenience, often provoked them to involve the whole people in an indiscriminate massacre, and the ruin of some flourishing cities was executed with such unrelenting perseverance, that, according to their own expression, horses might run, without stumbling, over the ground where they had once stood. The three great capitals of Khorasan, Maru, Nezabur, and Herat, were destroyed by the armies of Genghis, and the exact account which was taken of the slain amounted to four million three hundred and forty-seven thousand persons. Timur, or Tamerlane, was educated in a less barbarous age, and in the profession of the Mahometan religion. Yet, if Attila equalled the hostile ravages of Tamerlane, either the Tartar of the Hun might deserve the epithet of the Scourge of God. It may be affirmed with bolder assurance that the Huns depopulated the provinces of the empire by the number of Roman subjects whom they led away into captivity. In the hands of a wise legislator, such an industrious colony might have contributed to diffuse through the deserts of Scythia the rudiments of the useful and ornamental arts. But these captives, who had been taken in war, were accidentally dispersed among the hordes that obeyed the empire of Attila. The estimate of their respective value was formed by the simple judgment of uneducated and unprejudiced barbarians. Perhaps they might not understand the merit of a theologian, profoundly skilled in the controversies of the Trinity and the Incarnation. Yet they respected the ministers of every religion, and the active zeal of the Christian missionaries, without approaching the person or the palace of the monarch, successfully labored in the propagation of the gospel. The pastoral tribes, who were ignorant of the distinction of the landed property, must have disregarded the use, as well as the abuse, of civil jurisprudence, and the skill of an eloquent lawyer could excite only their contempt or their abhorrence. The perpetual intercourse of the Huns and the Goths had communicated the familiar knowledge of the two national dialects, and the barbarians were ambitious of conversing in Latin, the military idiom even of the Eastern Empire. But they disdained the language and the sciences of the Greeks, and the vain sophist or grave philosopher, who had enjoyed the flattering applause of the schools, was mortified to find that his robust servant was a captive of more value and importance than himself. The mechanic arts were encouraged and esteemed, as they tended to satisfy the wants of the Huns. An architect in the service of Onegesius, one of the favorites of Attila, was employed to construct a bath, but this work was a rare example of private luxury, and the trades of the smith, the carpenter, the armorer, were much more adapted to supply a wandering people with the useful instruments of peace and war. But the merit of the physician was received with universal favor and respect, the barbarians, who despised death, might be apprehensive of disease, and the haughty conqueror trembled in the presence of a captive, to whom he ascribed, perhaps, an imaginary power of prolonging or preserving his life. The Huns might be provoked to insult the misery of their slaves, over whom they exercised the despotic command, but their manners were not susceptible to a refined system of oppression and the efforts of courage and diligence were often recompensed by the gift of freedom. The historian Priscus, whose embassy is a source of curious instruction, was accosted in the camp of Attila by a stranger who saluted him in the Greek language, but whose dress and figure displayed the appearance of a wealthy Scythian. In the siege of Viminiacum, he had lost, according to his own account, his fortune and liberty. He became the slave of an Egesius, but his faithful services against the Romans and the Akatsires had gradually raised him to the rank of the native Huns, to whom he was attached by the domestic pledges of a new wife and several children. The spoils of war had restored and improved his private property, he was admitted to the table of his former lord, and the apostate Greek blessed the hour of his captivity, since it had been the introduction to a happy and independent state which he held by the honorable tenure of military service. This reflection naturally produced a dispute on the advantages and defects of the Roman government, which was severely arraigned by the apostate and defended by Priscus in a prolix and feeble declamation. The 
freedman of Onegesius exposed, in true and lively colors, the vices of a delining empire, of which he had so long been the victim, the cruel absurdity of the Roman princes, unable to protect their subjects against the public enemy, unwilling to trust them with arms for their own defense, the intolerable weight of taxes, rendered still more oppressive by the intricate and arbitrary modes of collection, the obscurity of numerous and contradictory laws, the tedious and expensive forms of judicial proceedings, the partial administration of justice, and the universal corruption, which increased the influence of the rich, and aggravated the misfortunes of the poor. A sentiment of patriotic sympathy was at length revived in the breast of the fortunate exile, and he lamented, with a flood of tears, the guilt or weakness of those magistrates who had perverted the wisest and most salutary institutions. The timid or selfish policy of the Western Romans had abandoned the Eastern Empire to the Huns. The loss of armies and the want of discipline or virtue were not supplied by the personal character of the monarch. Theodosius might still affect the style as well as the title of Invincible Augustus, but he was reduced to solicit the clemency of Attila, who imperiously dictated these harsh and humiliating conditions of peace. 1. The Emperor of the East resigned, by an express or tacit convention, an extensive and important territory, which stretched along the southern banks of the Danube, from Singidumnum, or Belgrade, as far as Nove, in the diocese of Trache. The breadth was defined by the vague computation of fifteen days' journey, but from the proposal of Attila to remove the situation of the national market, it soon appeared that he comprehended the ruined city of Nisus within the limits of his diminutions. 2. The king of the Huns required and obtained that his tribute or subsidy should be augmented from seven hundred pounds of gold to the annual sum of two thousand one hundred and he stipulated the immediate payment of six thousand pounds of gold to defray the expenses or to expiate the guilt of the war. One might imagine that such a demand, which scarcely equaled the measure of private wealth, would have been readily discharged by the opulent empire of the East, and the public distress affords a remarkable proof of the impoverished, or at least of the disorderly state of the finances. A large proportion of the taxes extorted from the people was detained and intercepted in their passage through the foulest channels to the treasury of Constantinople. The revenue was dissipated by Theodosius and his favorites in wasteful and profuse luxury, which was disguised by the names of imperial magnificence or Christian charity. The immediate supplies had been exhausted by the unforeseen necessity of military preparations. A personal contribution, rigorously but capriciously imposed on the members of the senatorian order, was the only expedient that could disarm, without loss of time, the impatient avarice of Attila, and the poverty of the nobles compelled them to adopt the scandalous resource of exposing to public auction the jewels of their wives, and the hereditary ornaments of their palaces. 3. The king of the Huns appears to have established, as a principle of national jurisprudence, that he could never lose the property which he had once acquired, in the persons who had yielded either a voluntary or reluctant submission to his authority. From this principle he concluded, and the conclusions of Attila were irrevocable laws, that the Huns, who had been taken prisoner in war, should be released without delay and without ransom, that every Roman captive, who had presumed to escape, should purchase his right to freedom at the price of twelve pieces of gold, and that all the barbarians, who had deserted the standard of Attila, should be restored, without any promise or stipulation of pardon. In the execution of this cruel and ignominious treaty, the imperial officers were forced to massacre several lawyer and noble deserters who refused to devote themselves to certain death, and the Romans forfeited all reasonable claims to the friendship of any Scythian people by this public confession, that they were destitute either of faith or power to protect the suppliant who had embraced the throne of Theodosius. The firmness of a single town, so obscure, that, except on this occasion, it has never been mentioned by any historian or geographer, exposed the disgrace of the emperor and the empire. Asimus, or Asimuntium, a small city of Thrace on the Illyrian border, had been distinguished by the martial spirit of its youth, the skill and reputation of the leaders whom they had chosen, and their daring exploits against the innumerable hosts of the barbarians. Instead of tamely expecting their approach, the Asimuntines attacked, in frequent and successful sallies, 
the troops of the Huns, who gradually declined the dangerous neighborhood, rescued from their hands the spoil and the captives, and recruited their domestic force by the voluntary association of fugitives and deserters. After the conclusion of the treaty, Attila still menaced the empire with the implacable war, unless the Asimuntines were persuaded or compelled to comply with the conditions which their sovereign had accepted. The ministers of Theodosius confessed with shame and with truth that they no longer possessed any authority over a society of men who so bravely asserted their natural independence, and the king of the Huns condescended to negotiate an equal exchange with the citizens of Asimus. They demanded the restitution of some shepherds who, with their cattle, had been accidentally surprised. A strict, though fruitless, inquiry was allowed, but the Huns were obliged to swear that they did not detain any prisoners belonging to the city before they could recover two surviving countrymen, whom the Asimuntines had reserved as pledges for the safety of their lost companions. Attila on his side was satisfied, and deceived by their solemn asservation that the rest of the captives had been put to the sword, and that it was their constant practice immediately to dismiss the Romans and the deserters who had obtained the security of the public faith. This prudent and officious dissimulation may be condemned or excused by the casuists, as they incline to the rigid degree of St. Augustine, or the milder sentiment of St. Jerome and St. Chrysostom. But every soldier, every statement, must acknowledge that, if the race of the Asimuntines had been encouraged and multiplied, the barbarians would have ceased to trample on the majesty of the empire. It would have been strange, indeed, if Theodosius had purchased, by the loss of honor, a secure and solid tranquillity, or if his tameness had not invited the repetition of injuries. The Byzantine court was insulted by five or six successive embassies, and the ministers of Attila were uniformly instructed to press the tardy or imperfect execution of the last treaty, to produce the names of fugitives and deserters who were still protected by the empire, and to declare, with seeming moderation, that, unless their sovereign obtained complete and immediate satisfaction, it would be impossible for him, were it even his wish, to check the resentment of his warlike tribes. Besides the motives of pride and interest, which might prompt the king of the Huns to continue this train of negotiation, he was influenced by the less honorable view of enriching his favorites at the expense of his enemies. The imperial treasury was exhausted, to procure the friendly offices of the ambassadors and their principal attendants, whose favorable report might conduce to the maintenance of peace. The barbarian monarch was flattered by the liberal reception of his ministers. He computed with pleasure the value and splendor of their gifts, rigorously exacted the performance of every promise which would contribute to their private emolument, and treated as an important business of state the marriage of his secretary Constantius. That Gallic adventurer, who was recommended by Aetius to the king of the Huns, had engaged his service to the ministers of Constantinople, for the stipulated reward of a wealthy and noble wife, and the daughter of Count Saturninus was chosen to discharge the obligations of her country. The reluctance of the victim, some domestic troubles, and the unjust confiscation of her fortune, cooled the ardor of her interested lover, but he still demanded in the name of Attila an equivalent alliance, and after many ambiguous delays and excuses, the Byzantine court was compelled to sacrifice to this insolent stranger the widow of Armatius, whose birth, opulence, and beauty placed her in the most illustrious rank of the Roman matrons. For these importunate and oppressive embassies, Attila claimed a suitable return. He weighed, with suspicious pride, the character and station of the imperial envoys, but he condescended to promise that he would advance as far as Sardica to receive any ministers who had been invested with the consular dignity. The council of Theodosius eluded this proposal by representing the desolate and ruined condition of Sardica, and even ventured to insinuate that every officer of the army or household was qualified to treat with the most powerful princes of Scythia. Maximin, a respectable courtier, whose abilities had been long exercised in civil and military employments, accepted, with reluctance, the troublesome and perhaps dangerous commission of reconciling the angry spirit of the king of the Huns. His friend, the historian Priscus, embraced the opportunity of observing the barbarian hero in the peaceful and domestic scenes of life. But the secret of the embassy, a fatal and guilty secret, was entrusted only to the interpreter Vigilius. The last two ambassadors of the Huns, Orestes, a noble subject of the Pannonian province, and Edicon, a valiant chieftain in the tribe of the Scyrri, 
returned at the same time from Constantinople to the real camp. Their obscure names were afterwards illustrated by the extraordinary fortune and the contrast of their sons. The two servants of Attila became the fathers of the last Roman Emperor of the West and of the first barbarian king of Italy. The ambassadors, who were followed by a numerous train of men and horses, made their first halt at Sardica, at the distance of 350 miles, or 13 days' journey from Constantinople. As the remains of Sardica were still included within the limits of the empire, it was incumbent on the Romans to exercise the duties of hospitality. They provided, with the assistance of the provincials, a sufficient number of sheep and oxen, and invited the Huns to a splendid, or at least a plentiful supper. But the harmony of the entertainment was soon disturbed by mutual prejudice and indiscretion. The greatness of the emperor and the empire was warmly maintained by the ministers. The Huns, with equal ardor, asserted the superiority of their victorious monarch. The dispute was inflamed by the rash and unseasonable flattery of Vigilius, who passionately rejected the comparison of a mere mortal with the divine Theodosius. And it was with extreme difficulty that Maximin and Priscus were able to divert the conversation, or to suit the angry minds of the barbarians. When they rose from the table, the imperial ambassador presented Edicon and Orestes with rich gifts of silk robes and India pearls, which they thankfully accepted. Yet Orestes could not forbear insinuating that he had not always been treated with such respect and liberality, and the offensive distinction which was implied between his civil office and the hereditary rank of his colleague seems to have made Edicon a doubtful friend, and Orestes an irreconcilable enemy. After this entertainment, they travelled about one hundred miles from Sardica to Naissus. That flourishing city, which had given birth to the great Constantine, was levelled with the ground, the inhabitants were destroyed or dispersed, and the appearance of some sick persons, who were still permitted to exist among the ruins of the churches, served only to increase the horror of the prospect. The surface of the country was covered with the bones of the slain, and the ambassadors, who directed their course to the northwest, were obliged to pass the hills of modern Serbia before they descended into the flat and marshy grounds which are terminated by the Danube. The Huns were masters of the great river. Their navigation was performed in large canoes, hollowed out of the trunk of a single tree. The ministers of Theodosius were safely landed on the opposite bank, and their barbarian associates immediately hastened to the camp of Attila, which was equally prepared for the amusements of hunting or of war. No sooner had Maximin advanced about two miles from the Danube than he began to experience the fastidious insolence of the conqueror. He was sternly forbid to pitch his tents in a pleasant valley, lest he should infringe the distant awe that was due to the royal mansion. The ministers of Attila pressed them to communicate the business and the instructions which he reserved for the ear of their sovereign. When Maximin temperately urged the contrary practice of nations, he was still more confounded to find that the resolutions of the sacred consistory, those secrets, says Priscus, which should not be revealed to the gods themselves, had been treacherously disclosed to the public enemy. On his refusal to comply with such ignominious terms, the imperial enemy was commanded instantly to depart. The order was recalled, it was again repeated, and the Huns renewed their ineffectual attempts to subdue the patient firmness of Maximin. At length, by the intercession of Scotta, the brother of Onegesius, whose friendship had been purchased by a liberal gift, he was admitted to the royal presence, but, instead of obtaining a decisive answer, he was compelled to undertake a remote journey towards the north, that Attila might enjoy the proud satisfaction of receiving, in the same camp, the ambassadors of the eastern and western empires. His journey was regulated by the guides, who obliged him to halt, to hasten his march, or to deviate from the common road, as it best suited the convenience of the king. The Romans, who traversed the plains of Hungary, supposed that they passed several navigable rivers, either in canoes or portable boats, but there is reason to suspect that the winding streams of the Teis, or Tibiscus, might present itself in different places under different names. From the contiguous villages they received a plentiful and regular supply of provisions, mead instead of wine, millet in the place of bread, and a certain liquor called camus, which according to the report of Priscus, was distilled from barley. Such fare might appear coarse and indelicate to men who had tasted the luxury of Constantinople, but, 
In their accidental distress, they were relieved by the gentleness and hospitality of the same barbarians, so terrible and so merciless in war. The ambassadors had encamped on the edge of a large morass. A violent tempest of wind and rain, of thunder and lightning, overturned their tents, immersed their baggage and furniture in the water, and scattered their retinue, who wandered in the darkness of the night, uncertain of their road, and apprehensive of some unknown danger, till they awakened by their cries the inhabitants of a neighboring village, the property of the widow of Bleda. A bright illumination, and, in a few moments, a comfortable fire of reeds was kindled by their officious benevolence. The wants and even the desires of the Romans were liberally satisfied, and they seemed to have been embarrassed by the singular politeness of Bleda's widow, who added to her other favors the gift, or at least the loan, of a sufficient number of beautiful and obsequious damsels. The sunshine of the succeeding day was dedicated to repose, to collect and dry the baggage, and to the refreshments of the men and horses. But in the evening, before they pursued the journey, the ambassadors expressed their gratitude to the bounteous lady of the village by a very acceptable present of silver cups, red fleeces, dried fruits, and Indian pepper. Soon after this adventure, they rejoined the march of Attila, from whom they had been separated about six days, and slowly proceeded to the capital of an empire, which did not contain, in the space of several thousand miles, a single city. As far as we may ascertain the vague and obscure geography of Priscus, this capital appears to have been seated between the Danube, the Thais, and the Carpathian hills, in the plains of Upper Hungary, and most probably in the neighborhood of Jesberin, Agria, or Tokai. In its origin, it could be no more than an accidental camp, which, by the long and frequent residence of Attila, had insensibly swelled into a huge village for the reception of his court, of the troops who followed his person, and of the various multitude of idle or industrious slaves and retainers. The baths, constructed by Onegesius, were the only edifice of stone. The materials had been transported from Pannonia, and since the adjacent country was destitute even of large timber, it may be presumed that the meaner inhabitations of the royal village consisted of straw, or mud, or of canvas. The wooden houses of the more illustrious Huns were built and adorned with rude magnificence, according to the rank, the fortune, or the taste of the proprietors. They seem to have been distributed with some degree of order and symmetry, and each spot became more honorable as it approached the person of the sovereign. The palace of Attila, which surpassed all other houses in his dominions, was built entirely of wood, and covered an ample space of ground. The outward enclosure was a lofty wall or palisade of smooth square timber, intersected with high towers, but intended rather for ornament than defense. This wall, which seems to have encircled the declivity of a hill, comprehended a great variety of wooden edifices adapted for the use of royalty. A separate house was assigned to each of the numerous wives of Attila, and instead of the rigid and illiberal confinement imposed by Asiatic jealousy, they politely admitted the Roman ambassadors to their presence, their tables, and even to the freedom of an innocent embrace. When Maximin offered his presence to Kirka, the principal queen, he admired the singular architecture of her mansion. The height of the round columns, the size and beauty of the wood, which was curiously shaped or turned or polished or carved, and his attentive eye was able to discover some taste in the ornaments and some regularity in the proportions. After passing through the guards, who watched before the gate, the ambassadors were introduced into the private apartment of Kirka. The wife of Attila received their visit, sitting, or rather lying on a soft couch. The floor was covered with a carpet, the domestics formed a circle round the queen, and her damsels, seated on the ground, were employed in working the variegated embroidery which adorned the dress of the barbaric warriors. The Huns were ambitious of displaying those riches which were the fruit and evidence of their victories. The trappings of their horses, their swords, and even their shoes were studded with gold and precious stones, and their tables were profusely spread with plates and goblets and vases of gold and silver, which had been fashioned by the labor of Grecian artists. The monarch alone assumed the superior pride of still adhering to the simplicity of his Scythian ancestors. The dress of Attila, his arms, and the furniture of his horse were plain, without ornament, and of a single color. The royal table was served in wooden cups and platters. Flesh was his only food, and the conqueror of the north never tasted the luxury of bread.
When Attila first gave audience to the Roman ambassadors on the banks of the Danube, his tent was encompassed with a formidable guard. The monarch himself was seated in a wooden chair. His stern countenance, angry gestures, and impatient tone astonished the firmness of Maximin, but Virgilius had more reason to tremble, since he distinctly understood the menace that if Attila did not respect the law of nations, he would nail the deceitful interpreter to the cross, and leave his body to the vultures. The barbarian condescended, by producing an accurate list, to expose the bold falsehood of Virgilius, who had affirmed that no more than seventeen deserters could be found. But he arrogantly declared that he apprehended only the disgrace of contending with his fugitive slaves, since he despised their impotent efforts to defend the provinces which Theodosius had entrusted to their arms. For what fortress, added Attila, what city, in the wide extent of the Roman Empire, can hope to exist, secure and impregnable, if it is our pleasure that it should be erased from the earth? He dismissed, however, the interpreter, who returned to Constantinople with his peremptory demand of more complete restitution and a more splendid embassy. His anger gradually subsided, and his domestic satisfaction in a marriage which he celebrated on the road with the daughter of Islam might perhaps contribute to mollify the native fierceness of his temper. The entrance of Attila into the royal village was marked by a very singular ceremony. A numerous troop of women came out to meet their hero and their king. They marched before him, distributed into long and regular files. The intervals between the files were filled by white veils of thin linen, which the women on either side bore aloft in their hands, and which formed a canopy for a chorus of young virgins, who chanted hymns and songs in the Scythian language. The wife of his favorite Onegesius, with a train of female attendants, saluted Attila at the door of her own house, on his way to the palace, and offered, according to the custom of the country, her respectful homage by entreating him to taste the wine and meat which she had prepared for his reception. As soon as the monarch had graciously accepted her hospitable gift, his domestics lifted a small silver table to a convenient height as he sat on horseback, and Attila, when he had touched the goblet with his lips, again saluted the wife of Onegesius and continued his march. During his residence at the seat of empire, his hours were not wasted in the recluse idleness of Seraglio, and the king of the Huns could maintain his superior dignity without concealing his person from the public view. He frequently assembled his council and gave audience to the ambassadors of the nations, and his people might appear to the supreme tribunal, which he held at stated times, and according to the eastern custom, before the principal gate of his wooden palace. The Romans, both of the east and the west, were twice invited to the banquets, where Attila feasted with the princes and the nobles of Scythia. Maximin and his colleagues were stopped on the threshold, till they had made a devout libation to the health and prosperity of the king of the Huns, and were conducted, after this ceremony, to their respective seats in a spacious hall. The royal table and couch, covered with carpets and fine linen, was raised by several steps in the middle of the hall, and a son, an uncle, or perhaps a favorite king, were admitted to share the simple and homely repast of Attila. Two lines of small tables, each of which contained three or four guests, were ranged in order on either hand. The right was esteemed the most honorable, but the Romans ingeniously confess that they were placed on the left, and that Beric, an unknown chieftain, most probably of the Gothic race, preceded the representatives of Theodosius and Valentinian. The barbarian monarch received from his cupbearer a goblet filled with wine, and courteously drank to the health of the most distinguished guest, who rose from his seat, and expressed, in the same manner, his loyal and respectful vows. This ceremony was successively performed for all, or at least for the illustrious persons of the assembly, and a considerable time must have been consumed, since it was thrice repeated as each course or service was placed on the table. But the wine still remained after the meat had been removed, and the Huns continued to indulge their intemperance long after the sober and decent ambassadors of the two empires had withdrawn themselves from the nocturnal banquet. Yet before they retired, they enjoyed a singular opportunity of observing the manners of the nation in their convivial amusements. Two Scythians stood before the couch of Attila, and recited the verses which they had composed to celebrate his valor and his victories. A profound silence prevailed in the hall, and the attention of the guests was captivated by the vocal harmony which revived and perpetuated the memory of their own exploits, 
A martial ardor flashed from the eyes of the warriors who were impatient for battle, and the tears of the old men expressed their generous despair that they could no longer partake the danger and glory of the field. This entertainment, which might be considered as a school of military virtue, was succeeded by a farce that debased the dignity of human nature. A Moorish and a Scythian buffoon successively excited the mirth of the rude spectators by their deformed figure, ridiculous dress, antic gestures, and the strange, unintelligible confusion of the Latin, the Gothic, and the Hunnic languages, and the whole resounded with loud and licentious peals of laughter. In the midst of this intemperate riot, Attila alone, without a change of countenance, maintained his steadfast and inflexible gravity, which was never relaxed except on the entrance of Irnak, the youngest of his sons. He embraced the boy with a smile of paternal tenderness, gently pinched him by the cheek, and betrayed a partial affection, which was justified by the assurance of his prophets that Irnak would be the future support of his family and empire. Two days afterwards, the ambassadors received a second invitation, and they had reason to praise the politeness as well as the hospitality of Attila. The king of the Huns held a long and familiar conversation with Maximin, but his civility was interrupted by rude expressions and haughty reproaches, and he was provoked by a motive of interest to support with unbecoming zeal the private claims of his secretary Constantius. The emperor, said Attila, has promised him a rich wife. Constantius must not be disappointed, nor should the Roman Empire deserve the name of a liar. On the third day, the ambassadors were dismissed, the freedom of several captives was granted for a moderate ransom to their pressing entreaties, and besides the royal presence, they were permitted to accept from each of the Scythian nobles the honorable and useful gift of a horse. Maximin returned by the same road to Constantinople, and though he was involved in an accidental dispute with Beric, the new ambassador of Attila, he flattered himself that he had contributed, by the laborious journey, to confirm the peace and alliance of the two nations. But the Roman ambassador was ignorant of the treacherous design which had been concealed under the mask of the public faith. The surprise and satisfaction of Edecon, when he contemplated the splendor of Constantinople, had encouraged the interpreter Vigilius to procure for him a secret interview with the eunuch Chrysaphius, who governed the emperor and the empire. After some previous conversation, and a mutual oath of secrecy, the eunuch, who had not, from his own feelings or experience, imbibed any exalted notions of ministerial virtue, ventured to propose the death of Attila as an important service by which Edicon might deserve a liberal share of the wealth and luxury which he admired. The ambassador of the Huns listened to the tempting offer, and professed, with apparent zeal, his ability, as well as readiness, to execute the bloody deed. The design was communicated to the master of the offices, and the devout Theodosius consented to the assassination of his invincible enemy. But this perfidious conspiracy was defeated by the dissimulation or the repentance of Edicon, and though he might exaggerate his inward abhorrence for the treason, which he seemed to approve, he dexterously assumed the merit of an early and voluntary confession. If we now review the embassy of Maximin and the behavior of Attila, we must applaud the barbarian, who respected the laws of hospitality, and generously entertained and dismissed the minister of a prince who had conspired against his life. But the rashness of Vigilius will appear still more extraordinary, since he returned, conscious of his guilt and danger, to the royal camp, accompanied by his son, and carrying with him a weighty purse of gold, which the favorite eunuch had furnished to satisfy the demands of Edicon, and to corrupt the fidelity of the guards. The interpreter was instantly seized, and dragged before the tribunal of Attila, where he asserted his innocence with specious firmness, till the threat of inflicting instant death on his son extorted from him a sincere discovery of the criminal transaction. Under the name of ransom, or confiscation, the rapacious king of the Huns accepted two hundred pounds of gold for the life of a traitor, whom he disdained to punish. He pointed his just indignation against a noble object. His ambassadors, as slow and Orestes, were immediately dispatched to Constantinople, with a peremptory instruction, which it was much safer for them to execute than to disobey. They boldly entered the imperial presence, with the fatal purse hanging down from the neck of Orestes, who interrogated the eunuch Chrysaphius, as he stood beside the throne, whether he recognized the evidence of his guilt. 
but the office of reproof was reserved for the superior dignity of his colleague Eslo, who gravely addressed the emperor of the East in the following words. Theodosius is the son of an illustrious and respectable parent. Attila likewise is descended from a noble race, and he has supported, by his actions, the dignity which he inherited from his father Mundstuk. But Theodosius had forfeited his paternal honors, and, by consenting to pay tribute, has degraded himself to the condition of a slave. It is therefore just that he should reverence the man whom fortune and merit have placed above him, instead of attempting, like a wicked slave, clandestinely to conspire against his master. The son of Arcadius, who was accustomed only to the voice of flattery, heard with astonishment the severe language of truth. He blushed and trembled, nor did he presume directly to refuse the head of Chrysaphius, which Eslo and Orestes were instructed to demand. A solemn embassy, armed with full powers and magnificent gifts, was hastily sent to deprecate the wrath of Attila, and his pride was gratified by the choice of Nomius and Anatolius, two ministers of consul or patrician rank, of whom the one was great treasurer, and the other was master-general of the armies of the East. He condescended to meet these ambassadors on the banks of the river Drinko, and though he at first affected a stern and haughty demeanour, his anger was insensibly mollified by their eloquence and liberality. He condescended to pardon the emperor, the eunuch, and the interpreter, bound himself by an oath to observe the conditions of peace, released a great number of captives, abandoned the fugitives and deserters to their fate, and resigned a large territory to the south of the Danube, which he had already exhausted with its wealth and inhabitants. But this treaty was purchased at an expense which might have supported a vigorous and successful war, and the subjects of Theodosius were compelled to redeem the safety of worthless favorite by oppressive taxes, which they would more cheerfully have paid for his destruction. The Emperor Theodosius did not long survive the most humiliating circumstance of an inglorious life. As he was riding or hunting in the neighborhood of Constantinople, he was thrown from his horse into the river Lycus, the spine of the back was injured by the fall, and he expired some days afterwards, in the fiftieth year of his age, and the forty-third of his reign. His sister Pulcheria, whose authority had been controlled, both in civil and ecclesiastic affairs by the pernicious influence of the eunuchs, was unanimously proclaimed empress of the East, and the Romans, for the first time, submitted to a female reign. No sooner had Pulcheria ascended to the throne than she indulged her own and the public resentment by an act of popular justice. Without any legal trial, the eunuch Chrysaphius was executed before the gates of the city, and the immense riches which had been accumulated by the rapacious favorite served only to hasten and to justify his punishment. Amidst the general acclamations of the clergy and people, the empress did not forget the prejudice and disadvantage to which her sex was exposed, and she wisely resolved to prevent their murmurs by the choice of a colleague, who would always respect the superior rank and virgin chastity of his wife. She gave her hand to Marcian, about sixty years of age, and the nominal husband of Pulcheria was solemnly invested with the imperial purple. The zeal which he displayed for the orthodox creed, as it was established by the council of Chalcedon, would alone have inspired the grateful eloquence of the Catholics. But the behavior of Marcian in private life, and afterwards on the throne, may support the more rational belief that he was qualified to restore and invigorate an empire which had been almost dissolved by the successive weakness of two hereditary monarchs. He was born in Thrace and educated to the profession of arms, but Marcian's youth had been severely exercised by poverty and misfortune, since his only resource when he first arrived at Constantinople, consisted in two hundred pieces of gold, which he had borrowed of a friend. He passed nineteen years in the domestic and military service of Aspar, and his son Ardaburius followed those powerful generals to the Persian and African wars, and obtained by their influence the honorable rank of tribune and senator. His mild disposition and useful talents, without alarming the jealousy, recommended Marcian to the esteem and favor of his patrons. He had seen, perhaps he had felt, the abuses of a venal and oppressive administration, and his own example gave weight and energy to the laws which he promulgated for the reformation of manners. 
It was the opinion of Marcion that war should be avoided as long as it is possible to preserve a secure and honorable peace. But it was likewise his opinion that peace cannot be honorable or secure if the sovereign betrays a pusillanimous aversion to war. This temperate courage dictated his reply to the demands of Attila, who insolently pressed the payment of the annual tribute. The emperor signified to the barbarians that they must no longer insult the majesty of Rome by the mention of a tribute, that he was disposed to reward, with becoming liberality, the faithful friendship of his allies, but that if they presumed to violate the public peace, they should feel that he possessed troops and arms and resolution to repel their attacks. The same language, even in the camp of the Huns, was used by his ambassador Apollonius, whose bold refusal to deliver the presents till he had been admitted to a personal interview displayed a sense of dignity and a contempt of danger which Attila was not prepared to expect from the degenerate Romans. He threatened to chastise the rash successor of Theodosius, but he hesitated whether he should first direct his invincible arms against the eastern or the western empire. While mankind awaited his decision with awful suspense, he sent an equal defiance to the courts of Ravenna and Constantinople, and his ministers saluted the two emperors with the same haughty declaration. Attila, my lord, and thy lord, commands thee to provide a palace for his immediate reception. But as the barbarian despised, or affected to despise, the Romans of the East, whom he had so often vanquished, he soon declared his resolution of suspending the easy conquest till he had achieved a more glorious and important enterprise. In the memorable invasions of Gaul and Italy, the Huns were naturally attracted by the wealth and fertility of those provinces, but the particular motives and provocations of Attila can only be explained by the state of the Western Empire under the reign of Valentinian. Or, to speak more correctly, under the administration of Aetius. After the death of his rival, Boniface, Aetius had prudently retired to the tents of the Huns, and he was indebted to their alliance for his safety and his restoration. Instead of the suppliant language of a guilty exile, he solicited his pardon at the head of sixty thousand barbarians, and the Empress Placidia confessed, by a feeble resistance, That the condescension which might have been ascribed to clemency was the effect of weakness or fear. She delivered herself, her son Valentinian, and the Western Empire into the hands of an insolent subject. Nor could Placidia protect the son in law of Boniface, the virtuous and faithful Sebastian, from the implacable persecution which urged him from one kingdom to another, till he miserably perished in the service of the Vandals. The fortunate Aetius, who was immediately promoted to the rank of patrician, And thrice invested with the honors of the consulship, assumed, with the title of master of the cavalry and infantry, the whole military power of the state, and he is sometimes styled, by contemporary writers, the duke or general of the Romans of the West. His prudence, rather than his virtue, engaged him to leave the grandson of Theodosius in the possession of the purple, and Valentinian was permitted to enjoy the peace and luxury of Italy, while the patrician appeared in the glorious light of a hero and a patriot. Who supported near twenty years the ruin of the Western Empire. The Gothic historian ingeniously confesses that Aetius was born for the salvation of the Roman Republic, and the following portrait, though it is drawn in the fairest colors, must be allowed to contain a much larger proportion of truth than of flattery. His mother was a wealthy and noble Italian, and his father, Gaudentius, who held a distinguished rank in the province of Scythia, Gradually rose from the station of a military domestic to the dignity of master of the cavalry. Their son, who was enrolled almost in his infancy in the guards, was given as a hostage, first to Alaric and afterwards to the Huns, and he successively obtained the civil and military honors of the palace, for which he was equally qualified by superior merit. The graceful figure of Aetius was not above the middle stature. But his manly limbs were admirably formed for strength, beauty, and agility, and he excelled in the martial exercises of managing a horse, drawing the bow, and darting the javelin. He could patiently endure the want of food or of sleep, and his mind and body were alike capable of the most laborious efforts. He possessed the genuine courage that can despise not only dangers, but injuries, and it was impossible either to corrupt or deceive or intimidate the firm integrity of his soul. The barbarians, who had seated themselves in the western provinces, were insensibly taught to respect the faith and valor of the patrician Aetius. He soothed their passions, consulted their prejudices, 
balanced their interests, and checked their ambition. A seasonable treaty, which he concluded with Genseric, protected Italy from the depredations of the Vandals. The independent Britons implored and acknowledged his salutary aid. The imperial authority was restored and maintained in Gaul and Spain, and he compelled the Franks and the Suevi, whom he had vanquished in the field, to become the useful confederates of the Republic. From a principle of interest, as well as gratitude, Etius assiduously cultivated the alliance of the Huns. While he resided in their tents as a hostage, or an exile, he had familiarly conversed with Attila himself, the nephew of his benefactor, and the two famous antagonists appeared to have been connected by a personal and military friendship, which they afterwards confirmed by mutual gifts, frequent embassies, and the education of Carpilio, the son of Etius, in the camp of Attila. By the specious profession of gratitude and voluntary attachment, the patrician might disguise his apprehensions of the Scythian conqueror, who pressed the two empires with his innumerable armies. His demands were obeyed or eluded. When he claimed the spoils of a vanquished city, some vases of gold, which had been fraudulently embezzled, the civil and military governors of Noricum were immediately dispatched to satisfy his complaints, and it is evident from their conversation with Maximin and Prissus in the royal village that the valor and prudence of Aetius had not saved the western Romans from the common ignominy of tribute. Yet his dexterous policy prolonged the advantages of a salutary peace, and a numerous army of Huns and Alani, whom he had attached to his person, was employed in the defense of Gaul. Two colonies of these barbarians were judiciously fixed in the territories of Valens and Orleans, and their active cavalry secured the important passages of the Rhone and the, the Loire. These savage allies were not indeed less formidable to the subjects than to the enemies of Rome. Their original settlement was enforced with the licentious violence of conquest, and the province through which they marched was exposed to all the calamities of a hostile invasion. Strangers to the emperor or to the republic, the Alani of Gaul was devoted to the ambition of Aetius, and, though he might suspect that in a contest with Attila himself they would revolt to the standard of their national king, the patrician labored to restrain, rather than to excite, their zeal and resentment against the Goths, the Burgundians, and the Franks. The kingdom established by the Visigoths in the southern provinces of Gaul had gradually acquired strength and maturity, and the conduct of those ambitious barbarians, either in peace or war, engaged the perpetual vigilance of Aetius. After the death of Wallia, the Gothic scepter devolved to Theodoric, the son of the great Alaric, and his prosperous reign of more than thirty years over a turbulent people, may be allowed to prove that his prudence was supported by uncommon vigor, both of mind and body. Impatient of his narrow limits, Theodoric aspired to the possessions of Arles, the wealthy seat of government and commerce, but the city was saved by the timely approach of Aetius, and the Gothic king, who had raised the siege with some loss and disgrace, was persuaded, for an adequate subsidy, to divert the martial valor of his subjects in a Spanish war. Yet Theodoric still watched, and eagerly seized, the favorable moment of renewing his hostile attempts. The Goths besieged Narbonne, while the Belgic provinces were invaded by the Burgundians, and the public safety was threatened on every side by the apparent union of the enemies of Rome. On every side the activity of Aetius and his Scythian cavalry opposed a firm and successful resistance. Twenty thousand Burgundians were slain in battle, and the remains of the nation humbly accepted a dependent seat in the mountains of Savoy. The walls of Narbonne had been shaken by the battering engines, and the inhabitants had endured the last extremities of famine, when Count Latorius, approaching in silence and directing each horseman to carry behind him two sacks of flour, cut his way through the entrenchments of the besiegers. The siege was immediately raised, and the more decisive victory— which is ascribed to the personal conduct of Aetius himself, was marked with the blood of eight thousand Goths. But in the absence of the patrician, who was hastily summoned to Italy by some public or private interest, Count Latorius succeeded to the command, and his presumption soon discovered that far different talents are required to lead a wing of cavalry or to direct the operations of an important war. At the head of an army of Huns, he rashly advanced to the gates of Toulouse, full of careless contempt for an enemy whom his misfortunes had rendered prudent, and his situation made desperate. The predictions of the augurs had inspired Latorius with the profane confidence that he should enter the Gothic capital in triumph, and the trust, which he reposed in his pagan allies, 
encouraged him to reject the fair conditions of peace, which were repeatedly proposed by the bishops in the name of Theodoric. The king of the Goths exhibited in his distress the edifying contrast of Christian piety and moderation, nor did he lay aside his sackcloth and ashes till he was prepared to arm for the combat. His soldiers, animated with martial and religious enthusiasm, assaulted the camp of Litorius. The conflict was obstinate, the slaughter was mutual. The Roman general, after a total defeat, which could be imputed only to his unskillful rashness, was actually led through the streets of Toulouse, not in his own, but in a hostile triumph, and the misery which he experienced in a long and ignominious captivity excited the compassion of the barbarians themselves. Such a loss, in a country whose spirit and finances were long since exhausted, could not be easily repaired, and the Goths, assuming in their turn the sentiments of ambition and revenge, would have planted their victorious standards on the banks of the Rhone, if the presence of Aetius had not restored strength and discipline to the Romans. The two armies expected the signal of a decisive action, but the generals, who were conscious of each other's force, and doubtful of their own superiority, prudently sheathed their swords in the field of battle, and their reconciliation was permanent and sincere. Theodoric, king of the Visigoths, appears to have deserved the love of his subjects, the confidence of his allies, and the esteem of mankind. His throne was surrounded by six valiant sons, who were educated with equal care in the exercises of the barbarian camp, and in those of the Gallic schools. From the study of the Roman jurisprudence, they acquired the theory, at least, of law and justice, and the harmonious sense of Virgil contributed to soften the asperity of their native manners. The two daughters of the Gothic king were given in marriage to the eldest sons of the kings of the Suevi and of the Vandals, who reigned in Spain and Africa. But these illustrious alliances were pregnant with guilt and discord. The queen of the Suevi bewailed the death of a husband inhumanely massacred by her brother. The princess of the Vandals was the victim of a jealous tyrant, whom she called her father. The cruel Genseric suspected that his son's wife had conspired to poison him. The supposed crime was punished by the amputation of her nose and ears, and the unhappy daughter of Theodoric was ignominiously returned to the court of Toulouse in that deformed and mutilated condition. This horrid act, which must seem incredible to a civilized age, drew tears from every spectator. But Theodoric was urged, by the feelings of a parent and a king, to revenge such irreparable injuries. The imperial ministers, who always cherished the discord of the barbarians, would have supplied the Goths with arms and ships and treasures for the African war, and the cruelty of Genseric might have been fatal to himself, if the artful vandal had not armed, in his cause, the formidable power of the Huns. His rich gifts and pressing solicitations inflamed the ambition of Attila, and the designs of Aetius and Theodoric were prevented by the invasion of Gaul. The Franks, whose monarchy was still confined to the neighborhood of the Lower Rhine, had wisely established the right of hereditary succession in the noble family of the Merovingians. These princes were elevated on a buckler, the symbol of military command, and the royal fashion of long hair was the ensign of their birth and dignity. Their flaxen locks, which they combed and dressed with singular care, hung down in flowing ringlets on their back and shoulders, while the rest of the nation were obliged, either by law or custom, to shave the hinder part of their head, to comb their hair over their forehead, and to content themselves with the ornament of two small whiskers. The lofty stature of the Franks and their blue eyes denoted a Germanic origin. Their close apparel accurately expressed the figure of their limbs. A weighty sword was suspended from a broad belt. Their bodies were protected by a large shield. And these warlike barbarians were trained from their earliest youth to run, to leap, to swim, to dart the javelin or battle axe with unerring aim, to advance without hesitation against a superior enemy, and to maintain, either in life or death, the invincible reputation of their ancestors. Clodion, the first of their long haired kings, whose name and actions are mentioned in authentic history, held his residence at Dispargum, a village or fortress. Whose place may be assigned between Louvain and Brussels. From the report of his spies, the king of the Franks was informed that the defenceless state of the second Belgic must yield, on the slightest attack, to the valor of his subjects. He boldly penetrated through the thickets and morasses of the Carbonarian forest, occupied Tournay and Cambrai, the only cities which existed in the fifth century, and extended his conquests as far as the river Somme, over a desolate country. 
whose cultivation and populousness are the effects of more recent industry. While Clodion lay encamped on the plains of Artois, and celebrated with vain and ostentatious security, the marriage, perhaps, of his son, the nuptial feast was interrupted by the unexpected and unwelcome presence of Etius, who had passed the psalm at the head of his light cavalry. The tables, which had been spread under the shelter of a hill, along the banks of a pleasant stream, were rudely overturned. The Franks were oppressed before they could recover their arms, or their ranks, and their unavailing valor was fatal only to themselves. The loaded wagons, which had followed their march, afforded a rich booty, and the virgin bride, with her female attendants, submitted to the new lovers, who were imposed on them by the chance of war. This advance, which had been obtained by the skill and activity of Etius, might reflect some disgrace on the military prudence of Clodion, but the king of the Franks soon regained his strength and reputation, and still maintained the possession of his Gallic kingdom from the Rhine to the Somme. Under his reign, and most probably from the enterprising spirit of his subjects, his three capitals, Mentz, Treves, and Cologne, experienced the effects of hostile cruelty and avarice. The distress of Cologne was prolonged by the perpetual domination of the same barbarians, who evacuated the ruins of Treves, and Treves, which in the space of forty years had been four times besieged and pillaged, was disposed to lose the memory of her afflictions in the vain amusements of the circus. The death of Clodion, after a reign of twenty years, exposed his kingdom to the discord and ambition of his two sons. Merovaeus the younger was persuaded to implore the protection of Rome. He was received at the imperial court as the ally of Valentinian and the adopted son of the patrician Aetius, and dismissed to his native country with splendid gifts and the strongest assurance of friendship and support. During his absence, his elder brother had solicited, with equal ardor, the formidable aid of Attila, and the king of the Huns embraced an alliance which facilitated the passage of the Rhine and justified, by a specious and honorable pretense, the invasion of Gaul. When Attila declared his resolution of supporting the cause of his allies, the Vandals and the Franks, at the same time, and almost in the spirit of romantic chivalry, the savage monarch professed himself the lover and the champion of the princess Honoria. The sister of Valentinian was educated in the palace of Ravenna, and as her marriage might be productive of some danger to the state, she was raised by the title of Augusta above the hopes of the most presumptuous subject. But the fair Honoria had no sooner attained the sixteenth year of her age than she detested the importunate greatness which must forever exclude her from the comforts of honorable love. In the midst of vain and unsatisfactory pomp, Honoria sighed, yielded to the impulse of nature, and threw herself into the arms of her chamberlain Eugenius. Her guilt and shame, such is the absurd language of imperious man, were soon betrayed by the appearances of pregnancy, but the disgrace of the royal family was published to the world by the imprudence of the empress Placidia, who dismissed her daughter, after a strict and shameful confinement, to a remote exile at Constantinople. The unhappy princess passed twelve or fourteen years in the irksome society of the sisters of Theodosius, and their chosen virgins, to whose crown Honoria could no longer aspire, and whose monastic assiduity of prayer, fasting, and vigils she reluctantly imitated. Her impatience of long and hopeless celibacy urged her to embrace a strange and desperate resolution. The name of Attila was familiar and formidable at Constantinople, and his frequent embassies entertained a perpetual intercourse between his camp and the imperial palace. In the pursuit of love, or rather of revenge, the daughter of Placidia sacrificed every duty and every prejudice, and offered to deliver her person into the arms of a barbarian, of whose language she was ignorant, whose figure was scarcely human, and whose religion and manners she abhorred. By the ministry of a faithful eunuch, she transmitted to Attila a ring, the pledge of her affection, and earnestly conjured him to claim her as a lawful spouse, to whom he had been secretly betrothed. These indecent advances were received, however, with coldness and disdain, and the king of the Huns continued to multiply the number of his wives, till his love was awakened by the more forcible passions of an ambition and avarice. The invasion of Gaul was preceded and justified by a formal demand of the princess Honoria, with a just and equal share of the imperial patrimony. His predecessors, the ancient Tanjus, had often addressed, in the same hostile and peremptory manner, the daughters of China, and the pretensions of Attila were not less offensive to the majesty of Rome. 
a firm but temperate refusal, was communicated to his ambassadors. The right of female succession, though it might derive a specious argument from the recent examples of Placidia and Pulcheria, was strenuously denied, and the indissoluble engagements of Honoria were opposed to the claims of her Scythian lover. On the discovery of her connection with the king of the Huns, the guilty princess had been sent away, as an object of horror, from Constantinople to Italy. Her life was spared, but the ceremony of her marriage was performed with some obscure and nominal husband, before she was immured in a perpetual prison, to bewail those crimes and misfortunes which Honoria might have escaped, had she not been born the daughter of an emperor. A native of Gaul, and a contemporary, the learned and eloquent Sidonius, who was afterwards bishop of Clermont, had made a promise to one of his friends, that he would compose a regular history of the war of Attila. If the modesty of Sidonius had not discouraged him from the prosecution of this interesting work, the historian would have related, with the simplicity of truth, those memorable events, to which the poet, in vague and doubtful metaphors, has concisely alluded. The kings and nations of Germany and Scythia, from the Volga, perhaps to the Danube, obeyed the warlike summons of Attila. From the royal village, in the plains of Hungary, his standard moved towards the west, and after a march of seven or eight hundred miles, he reached the conflux of the Rhine and the Neckar, where he was joined by the Franks, who adhered to his ally, the elder of the sons of Clodion. A troop of light barbarians, who roamed in quest of plunder, might choose the winter for the convenience of passing the river on the ice. But the innumerable cavalry of the Huns required such plenty of forage and provisions as could be procured only in a milder season. The Hercynian forest supplied materials for a bridge of boats, and the hostile myriads were poured, with resistless violence, into the Belgic provinces. The consternation of Gaul was universal, and the various fortunes of its cities have been adorned by tradition with martyrdoms and miracles. Troy was saved by the merits of St. Lupus, St. Servatius was removed from the world, that he might not behold the ruin of Tongres, and the prayers of St. Genevieve diverted the march of Attila from the neighborhood of Paris. But as the greatest part of the Gallic cities were alike destitute of saints and soldiers, they were besieged and stormed by the Huns, who practiced, in the example of Metz, their customary maxims of war. They involved, in a promiscuous massacre, the priests who had served at the altar, and the infants who, in the hour of danger, had been providently baptized by the bishop. The flourishing city was delivered to the flames, and a solitary chapel of St. Stephen marked the place where it formerly stood. From the Rhine and the Moselle, Attila advanced into the heart of Gaul, crossed the Seine at Auxerre, and after a long and laborious march, fixed his camp under the walls of Orléans. He was desirous of securing his conquest by the possession of an advantageous post, which commanded the passage of the Loire, and he depended on the secret invitation of Sangaban, king of the Alani, who had promised to betray the city, and to revolt from the service of the empire. But this treacherous conspiracy was detected and disappointed. Orléans had been strengthened with recent fortifications, and the assaults of the Huns were vigorously repelled by the faithful valor of the soldiers, or citizens, who defended the place. The pastoral diligence of Anianus, a bishop of primitive sanctity and consummate prudence, exhausted every art of religious policy to support their courage, till the arrival of the expected succors. After an obstinate siege, the walls were shaken by the battering rams, the Huns had already occupied the suburbs, and the people, who were incapable of bearing arms, lay prostrate in prayer. Anianus, who anxiously counted the days and hours, dispatched a trusty messenger to observe, from the rampart, the face of the distant country. He returned twice without any intelligence that could inspire hope or comfort, but in his third report he mentioned a small cloud, which he had faintly descried at the extremity of the horizon. "'It is the aid of God!' exclaimed the bishop, in a tone of pious confidence, and the whole multitude repeated after him, "'It is the aid of God!' The remote object on which every eye was fixed became each moment larger and more distinct. The Roman and Gothic banners were gradually perceived, and a favorable wind blowing aside the dust discovered, in deep array, the impatient squadrons of Etius and Theodoric, who pressed forwards to the relief of Orléans. The facility with which Attila had penetrated into the heart of Gaul, 
may be ascribed to his insidious policy as well as to the terror of arms. His public declarations were skillfully mitigated by his private assurances. He alternately soothed and threatened the Romans and the Goths, and the courts of Ravenna and Toulouse, mutually suspicious of each other's intentions, beheld with supine indifference the approach of their common enemy. Etius was the sole guardian of the public safety, but his wisest measures were embarrassed by a faction which, since the death of Placidia, infested the imperial palace. The youth of Italy trembled at the sound of the trumpet, and the barbarians, who from fear or affection were inclined to the cause of Attila, awaited with doubtful and venal faith the event of the war. The patrician passed the Alps at the head of some troops, whose strength and numbers scarcely deserved the name of an army. But on his arrival at Arles, or Lyon, he was confounded by the intelligence that the Visigoths, refusing to embrace the defense of Gaul, had determined to expect, within their own territories, the formidable invader whom they professed to despise. The senator Avitus, who after the honorable exercise of the Praetorian prefecture, had retired to his estate in Auvergne, was persuaded to accept the important embassy, which he executed with ability and success. He represented to Theodoric that an ambitious conqueror, who aspired to the dominion of the earth, could be resisted only by the firm and unanimous alliance of the powers whom he labored to oppress. The lively eloquence of Avitus inflamed the Gothic warriors, by the description of the injuries which their ancestors had suffered from the Huns, whose implacable fury still pursued them from the Danube to the foot of the Pyrenees. He strenuously urged that it was the duty of every Christian to save, from sacrilegious violation, the churches of God and the relics of the saints, that it was the interest of every barbarian who had acquired a settlement in Gaul to defend the fields and vineyards which were cultivated for his use against the desolation of the Scythian shepherds. Theodoric yielded to the evidence of truth, adopted the measure at once, the most prudent and the most honorable, and declared that, as the faithful ally of Etius and the Romans, he was ready to expose his life and kingdom for the common safety of Gaul. The Visigoths, who at that time were in the mature vigor of their fame and power, obeyed with alacrity the signal of war, prepared their arms and horses, and assembled under the standard of their aged king, who was resolved, with his two eldest sons, Torismond and Theodoric, to command in person his numerous and valiant people. The example of the Goths determined several tribes or nations that seemed to fluctuate between the Huns and the Romans. The indefatigable diligence of the patrician gradually collected the troops of Gaul and Germany, who had formerly acknowledged themselves the subjects or soldiers of the Republic, but who now claimed the rewards of voluntary service, and the rank of independent allies. The Leti, the Amoricans, the Braons, the Saxons, the Burgundians, the Sarmatians or Alani, the Ripuarians, and the Franks, who followed Merovus as their lawful prince. Such was the various army which, under the conduct of Etius and Theodoric, advanced by rapid marches to relieve Orleans and to give battle to the innumerable host of Attila. On their approach, the king of the Huns immediately raised the siege and sounded a retreat to recall the foremost of his troops from the pillage of a city which they had already entered. The valor of Attila was always guided by his prudence, and as he foresaw the fatal consequences of a defeat in the heart of Gaul, he repassed the Seine and expected the enemy in the plains of Chalon, whose smooth and level surface was adapted to the operations of his Scythian cavalry. But in this tumultuary retreat, the vanguard of the Romans and their allies continually pressed, and sometimes engaged, the troops, whom Attila had posted in the rear. The hostile columns, in the darkness of the night and the perplexity of the roads, might encounter each other without design, and the bloody conflict of the Franks and Gepide, in which fifteen thousand barbarians were slain, was a prelude to a more general and decisive action. The Catalonian fields spread themselves round Chalon, and extend, according to the vague measurement of Jordanus, to the length of one hundred and fifty and the breadth of one hundred miles, over the whole province, which is entitled to the appellation of a Champagne country. This spacious plain was distinguished, however, by some inequalities of ground, and the importance of a height, which commanded the camp of Attila, was understood and disputed by the two generals. The young and valiant Torismond first occupied the summit. The Goths rushed with irresistible weight on the Huns, who labored to ascend from the opposite side, 
and the possession of this advantageous post inspired both the troops and their leaders with a fair assurance of victory. The anxiety of Attila prompted him to consult his priests and haruspices. It was reported that after scrutinizing the entrails of victims and scraping their bones, they revealed in mysterious language his own defeat with the death of his principal adversary, and that the barbarians, by accepting the equivalent, expressed his involuntary esteem for the superior merit of Etius. But the unusual despondency, which seemed to prevail among the Huns, engaged Attila to use the expedient, so familiar to the generals of antiquity, of animating his troops by a military oration, and his language was that of a king, who had often fought and conquered at their head. He pressed them to consider their past glory, their actual danger, and their future hopes. The same fortune which opened the deserts and morasses of Scythia to their unarmed valor, which had laid so many warlike nations prostrate at their feet, had reserved the joys of this memorable field for the consummation of their victories. The cautious steps of their enemies, their strict alliance, their advantageous posts, he artfully represented as the effects, not of prudence, but of fear. The Visigoths alone were the strength and nerves of the opposite army, and the Huns might securely trample on the degenerate Romans, whose close and compact order betrayed their own apprehensions, and who were equally incapable of supporting the dangers or the fatigues of a day of battle. The doctrine of predestination, so favorable to martial virtue, was carefully inculcated by the king of the Huns, who assured his subjects that the warriors, protected by heaven, were safe and invulnerable amidst the darts of the enemy, but that the unerring fates would strike their victims in the bosom of inglorious peace. I myself, continued Attila, will throw the first javelin, and the wretch who refuses to imitate the example of his sovereign is devoted to inevitable death. The spirit of the barbarians was rekindled by the presence, the voice, and the example of their intrepid leader, and Attila, yielding to their impatience, immediately formed his order of battle. At the head of his brave and faithful Huns, he occupied in person the center of the line. The nations subject to his empire, the Rugians, the Heruli, the Thuringians, the Franks, the Burgundians, were extended on either hand, over the ample space of the Catalonian fields. The right wing was commanded by Alderic, king of the Gepidae, and the three valiant brothers, who reigned over the Ostrogoths, were posted on the left to oppose the kindred tribes of the Visigoths. The disposition of the allies was regulated by a different principle. Sangiban, the faithless king of the Alani, was placed in the center, where his motions might be strictly watched, and that the treachery might be instantly punished. Etius assumed the command of the left, and Theodoric of the right wing, while Torismund still continued to occupy the heights which appear to have stretched on the flank, and perhaps the rear, of the Scythian army. The nations from the Volga to the Atlantic were assembled on the plain of Shalom, but many of these nations had been divided by faction, or conquest, or emigration, and the appearance of similar arms and ensigns, which threatened each other, presented the image of a civil war. The discipline and tactics of the Greeks and Romans form an interesting part of their national manners. The attentive study of the military operations of Xenophon, or Caesar, or Frederick, when they are described by the same genius which conceived and executed them, may tend to improve, if such improvement can be wished, the art of destroying the human species. But the battle of Chalon can only excite our curiosity by the magnitude of the object, since it was decided by the blind impetuosity of barbarians, and has been related by partial writers, whose civil or ecclesiastical professions secluded them from the knowledge of military affairs. Cassiodorus, however, had familiarly conversed with many Gothic warriors, who served in that memorable engagement, a conflict, as they informed him, fierce, various, obstinate, and bloody, such as could not be paralleled either in the present or in past ages. The number of the slain amounted to one hundred and sixty-two thousand, or, according to another account, three hundred thousand persons, and these incredible exaggerations suppose a real and effective loss sufficient to justify the historian's remark, that whole generations may be swept away by the madness of kings in the space of a single hour. After the mutual and repeated discharge of missile weapons, in which the archers of Scythia might signalize their superior dexterity, the cavalry and infantry of the two armies were furiously mingled in closer combat. 
The Huns, who fought under the eyes of their king, pierced through the feeble and doubtful center of the Allies, separated their wings from each other, and wheeling with a rapid effort to the left, directed their whole force against the Visigoths. As Theodoric rode along the ranks to animate his troops, he received a mortal stroke from the javelin of Andagus, a noble Ostrogoth, and immediately fell from his horse. The wounded king was oppressed in the general disorder, and trampled under the feet of his own cavalry, and this important death served to explain the ambiguous prophecy of the Harris pieces. Attila already exulted in the confidence of victory, when the valiant Torismund descended from the hills, and verified the remainder of the prediction. The Visigoths, who had been thrown into confusion by the flight or defection of the Alani, gradually restored their order of battle, and the Huns were undoubtedly vanquished, since Attila was compelled to retreat. He had exposed his person with the rashness of a private soldier, but the intrepid troops of the center had pushed forwards beyond the rest of the line, their attack was faintly supported, their flanks were unguarded, and the conquerors of Scythia and Germany were saved by the approach of the night from a total defeat. They retired within the circle of wagons that fortified their camp, and the dismounted squadrons prepared themselves for a defense to which neither their arms nor their temper were adapted. The event was doubtful, but Attila had secured a last and honorable resource. The saddles and rich furniture of the cavalry were collected by his order into a funeral pile, and the magnanimous barbarian had resolved, if his entrenchments should be forced, to rush headlong into the flames, and to deprive his enemies of the glory which they might have acquired by the death or captivity of Attila. But his enemies had passed the night in equal disorder and anxiety. The inconsiderate courage of Torismond was tempted to urge the pursuit, till he unexpectedly found himself with a few followers in the midst of the Scythian wagons. In the confusion of a nocturnal combat, he was thrown from his horse, and the Gothic prince must have perished like his father, if his youthful strength and the intrepid zeal of his companions had not rescued him from this dangerous situation. In the same manner, but on the left of the line, Aetius himself, separated from his allies, ignorant of their victory, and anxious for their fate, encountered and escaped the hostile troops that were scattered over the plains of Chalon, and at length reached the camp of the Goths, which he could only fortify with a slight rampart of shields till the dawn of day. The imperial general was soon satisfied of the defeat of Attila, who still remained inactive within his entrenchments, and when he contemplated the bloody scene, he observed with secret satisfaction that the loss had principally fallen on the barbarians. The body of Theodoric, pierced with honorable wounds, was discovered under a heap of the slain. His subjects bewailed the death of their king and father, but their tears were mingled with songs and acclamations, and his funeral rites were performed in the face of a vanquished enemy. The Goths, clashing their arms, elevated on a buckler his eldest son, Torismond, to whom they justly ascribed the glory of their success, and the new king accepted the obligation of revenge as a sacred portion of his paternal inheritance. Yet the Goths themselves were astonished by the fierce and undaunted aspect of their formidable antagonist, and their historian has compared Attila to a lion encompassed in his den, and threatening his hunters with redoubled fury. The kings and nations who might have deserted his standard in the hour of distress were made sensible that the displeasure of their monarch was the most eminent and inevitable danger. All his instruments of martial music incessantly sounded a loud and animating strain of defiance, and the foremost troops who advanced to the assault were checked or destroyed by showers of arrows from every side of the entrenchments. It was determined in a general council of war to besiege the king of the Huns in his camp, to intercept his provisions, and to reduce him to the alternative of a disgraceful treaty or an unequal combat. But the impatience of the barbarians soon disdained these cautious and dilatory measures, and the mature policy of Aetius was apprehensive that, after the extirpation of the Huns, the Republic would be oppressed by the pride and power of the Gothic nation. The patrician exerted the superior ascendant of authority and reason to calm the passions, which the son of Theodoric considered as a duty, represented with seeming affection and real truth the dangers of absence and delay, and persuaded Torismond to disappoint, by his speedy return, the ambiguous designs of his brothers, who might occupy the throne and treasures of Toulouse. After the departure of the Goths and the separation of the allied army, Attila was surprised at the vast silence that reigned over the plains of Chalon, 
the suspicion of some hostile stratagem detained him several days within the circle of his wagons, and his retreat beyond the Rhine confessed the last victory which was achieved in the name of the Western Empire. Morovius and his Franks, observing a prudent distance, and magnifying the opinion of their strength by the numerous fires which they kindled every night, continued to follow the rear of the Huns till they reached the confines of Thuringia. The Thuringians served in the army of Attila, they traversed, both in their march and in their return, the territories of the Franks, and it was perhaps in this war that they exercised the cruelties which, about fourscore years afterwards, were revenged by the son of Clovis. They massacred their hostages, as well as their captives. Two hundred young maidens were tortured with exquisite and unrelenting rage. Their bodies were torn asunder by wild horses, or their bones were crushed under the weight of rolling wagons, and their unburied limbs were abandoned on the public roads as a prey to dogs and vultures. Such were those savage ancestors whose imaginary virtues have sometimes excited the praise and envy of civilized ages. Neither the spirit, nor the forces, nor the reputation of Attila were impaired by the failure of the Gallic expedition. In the ensuing spring he repeated his demand of the princess Honoria and her patrimonial treasures. The demand was again rejected or eluded, and the indignant lover immediately took the field, passed the Alps, invaded Italy, and besieged Aquileia with an innumerable host of barbarians. Those barbarians were unskilled in the methods of conducting a regular siege, which, even among the ancients, required some knowledge, or at least some practice, of the mechanical arts. But the labor of many thousand provincials and captives, whose lives were sacrificed without pity, might execute the most painful and dangerous work. The skill of the Roman artists might be corrupted to the destruction of their country. The walls of Aquileia were assaulted by a formidable train of battering rams, movable turrets, and engines, that threw stones, darts, and fire, and the monarch of the Huns employed the forcible impulse of hope, fear, emulation, and interest to subvert the only barrier which delayed the conquest of Italy. Aquileia was at that period one of the richest, the most populous, and the strongest of the maritime cities of the Adriatic coast. The Gothic auxiliaries, who appeared to have served under their native princes, Alaric and Antala, communicated their intrepid spirit, and the citizens still remembered the glorious and successful resistance which their ancestors had opposed to a fierce, inexorable barbarian who disgraced the majesty of the Roman purple. Three months were consumed without effect in the siege of the Aquileia, till the want of provisions and the clamors of his army compelled Attila to relinquish the enterprise and reluctantly to issue his orders that the troops should strike their tents the next morning and begin their retreat. But as he rode round the walls, pensive, angry, and disappointed, he observed a stork preparing to leave her nest in one of the towers and to fly with her infant family towards the country. He seized, with the ready penetration of a statesman, this trifling incident, which chance had offered to superstition, and exclaimed in a loud and cheerful tone that such a domestic bird, so constantly attached to human society, would never have abandoned her ancient seats, unless those towers had been devoted to impending ruin and solitude. The favorable omen inspired an assurance of victory, the siege was renewed and prosecuted with fresh vigor, a large breach was made in the part of the wall from whence the stork had taken her flight, the Huns mounted to the assault with irresistible fury, and the succeeding generation could scarcely discover the ruins of Aquileia. After this dreadful chastisement, Attila pursued his march, and as he passed, the cities of Altinum, Concordia, and Padua were reduced into heaps of stones and ashes. The inland towns, Vincenza, Verona, and Bergamo, were exposed to the rapacious cruelty of the Huns. Milan and Pavia submitted, without resistance, to the loss of their wealth, and applauded the unusual clemency which preserved from the flames the public, as well as private buildings, and spared the lives of the captive multitude. The popular traditions of Comum, Turin, or Medina may justly be suspected, yet they concur with more authentic evidence to prove that Attila spread his ravages over the rich plains of modern Lombardy, which are divided by the Po and bounded by the Alps and the Apennine. When he took possession of the royal palace of Milan, he was surprised and offended at the sight of a picture which represented the Caesars seated on their throne and the princes of Scythia prostrate at their feet. The revenge which Attila inflicted on this monument of Roman vanity was harmless and ingenious. 
he commanded a painter to reverse the figures and the attitudes, and the emperors were delineated on the same canvas, approaching in a suppliant posture to empty their bags of tributary gold before the throne of the Scythian monarch. The spectators must have confessed the truth and propriety of the alteration, and were perhaps tempted to apply, on this singular occasion, the well-known fable of the dispute between the lion and the man. It is a saying worthy of the ferocious pride of Attila that the grass never grew on the spot where his horse had trod. Yet the savage destroyer undesignedly laid the foundation of a republic, which revived, in the feudal state of Europe, the art and spirit of commercial industry. The celebrated name of Venice, or Venetia, was formerly diffused over a large and fertile province of Italy, from the confines of Pannonia to the river Adua, and from the Po to the Raetian and the Julian Alps. Before the interruption of the barbarians, fifty Venetian cities flourished in peace and prosperity. Aquileia was placed in the most conspicuous station, but the ancient dignity of Padua was supported by agriculture and manufactures, and the property of five hundred citizens, who were entitled to the equestrian rank, must have amounted, at the strictest computation, to one million seven hundred thousand pounds. Many families of Aquileia, Padua, and the adjacent towns, who had fled from the sword of the Huns, found a safe, though obscure, refuge in the neighboring islands. At the extremity of the gulf, where the Adriatic feebly imitates the tides of the ocean, near a hundred small islands are separated by shallow water from the continent, and protected from the waves by several long slips of land, which admit the entrance of vessels through some secret and narrow channels. Till the middle of the fifth century, these remote and sequestered spots remained without cultivation, with few inhabitants, and almost without a name. But the manners of the Venetian fugitives, their arts, and their government were gradually formed by their new situation, and one of the epistles of Cassiodorus, which describes their condition about seventy years afterwards, may be considered as the primitive monument of the Republic. The minister of Theodoric compares them, in his quaint declamatory style, to waterfowl, who had fixed their nests on the bosom of the waves, and though he allows that the Venetian provinces had formerly contained many noble families, he insinuates that they were now reduced by misfortune to the same level of humble poverty. Fish was the common and almost the universal food of every rank. Their only treasure consisted in the plenty of salt, which they extracted from the sea, and the exchange of that commodity, so essential to human life, was substituted in the neighboring markets to the currency of gold and silver. A people whose habitations might doubtfully assigned to the earth or water soon became alike familiar with the two elements, and the demands of avarice succeeded to those of necessity. The islanders, who, from Grado to Chiozza, were intimately connected with each other, penetrated into the heart of Italy by the secure, though laborious navigation of the rivers and inland canals. Their vessels, which were continually increasing in size and number, visited all the harbors of the Gulf, and the marriage which Venice annually celebrates with the Adriatic was contracted in her early infancy. The epistle of Cassiodorus, the praetorian prefect, is addressed to the maritime tribunes, and he exhorts them, in a mild tone of authority, to animate the zeal of their countrymen for the public service, which required their assistance to transport the magazines of wine and oil from the province of Istria to the royal city of Ravenna. The ambiguous office of these magistrates is explained by the tradition that in the twelve principal islands twelve tribunes, or judges, were created by annual and popular election. The existence of the Venetian Republic under the Gothic kingdom of Italy is attested by the same authentic record which annihilates their lofty claim of original and perpetual independence. The Italians, who had long since renounced the exercise of arms, were surprised, after forty years' peace, by the approach of a formidable barbarian, whom they abhorred as the enemy of their religion, as well as of their republic. Amidst the general consternation, Aetius alone was incapable of fear, but it was impossible that he should achieve, alone and unassisted, any military exploits worthy of his former renown. The barbarians who had defended Gaul refused to march to the relief of Italy, and the succors promised by the eastern emperor were distant and doubtful. Since Aetius, at the head of his domestic troops, still maintained the field, and harassed or retarded the march of Attila, 
he never showed himself more truly great than at the time when his conduct was blamed by an ignorant and ungrateful people. If the mind of Valentinian had been susceptible of any generous sentiments, he would have chosen such a general for his example and his guide. But the timid grandson of Theodosius, instead of sharing the dangers, escaped from the sound of war, and his hasty retreat from Ravenna to Rome, from an impregnable fortress to an open capital, betrayed his secret intention of abandoning Italy as soon as the danger should approach his imperial person. This shameful abdication was suspended, however, by the spirit of doubt and delay, which commonly adheres to pusillanimous counsels, and sometimes corrects their pernicious tendency. The Western Emperor, with the Senate and people of Rome, embraced the more salutary resolution of deprecating, by a solemn and suppliant embassy, the wrath of Attila. This important commission was accepted by Avinius, who from his birth and riches, his consular dignity, the numerous train of his clients, and his personal abilities, held the first rank in the Roman Senate. The specious and artful character of Viennus was admirably qualified to conduct a negotiation, either of public or private interest. His colleague, Trigisius, had exercised the Praetorian Prefecture of Italy, and Leo, Bishop of Rome, consented to expose his life for the safety of his flock. The genius of Leo was exercised and displayed in the public misfortunes, and he has deserved the appellation of great, by the successful zeal with which he labored to establish his opinions and his authority, under the venerable names of orthodox fate and ecclesiastical discipline. The Roman ambassadors were introduced to the tent of Attila, as he lay encamped at the place where the slow-winding Mincius is lost in the foaming waves of Lake Benacus, and trampled with his Scythian cavalry the farms of Catullus and Virgil. The barbarian monarch listened with favorable and even respectful attention, and the deliverance of Italy was purchased by the immense ransom or dowry of the princess Honoria. The state of his army might facilitate the treaty and hasten his retreat. Their martial spirit was relaxed by the wealth and indolence of a warm climate. The shepherds of the north, whose ordinary food consisted of milk and raw flesh, indulged themselves too freely in the use of bread, of wine, and of meat, prepared and seasoned by the arts of cookery, and the progress of disease revenged in some measure the injuries of the Italians. When Attila declared his resolution of carrying his victorious arms to the gates of Rome, he was admonished by his friends, as well as by his enemies, that Alaric had not long survived the conquest of the Eternal City. His mind, superior to real danger, was assaulted by imaginary terrors, nor could he escape the influence of superstition, which had so often been subservient to his designs. The pressing eloquence of Leo, his majestic aspect, and sacerdotal robes, excited the veneration of Attila for the spiritual father of the Christians. The apparition of the two apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul, who menaced the barbarian with instant death, if he rejected the prayer of their successor, is one of the noblest legends of ecclesiastical tradition. The safety of Rome might deserve the interposition of celestial beings, and some indulgence is due to a fable which has been represented by the pencil of Raphael and the chisel of Algardi. Before the king of the Huns evacuated Italy, he threatened to return more dreadful and more implacable if his bride, the princess Honoria, were not delivered to his ambassadors within the terms stipulated by the treaty. Yet in the meanwhile Attila relieved his tender anxiety by adding a beautiful maid, whose name was Idicchio, to the list of his innumerable wives. Their marriage was celebrated with barbaric pomp and festivity at his wooden palace beyond the Danube, and the monarch, oppressed with wine and sleep, retired at a late hour from the banquet to the nuptial bed. His attendants continued to respect his pleasures, or his repose, the greatest part of the ensuing day, till the unusual silence alarmed their fears and suspicions, and, after attempting to awaken Attila by loud and repeated cries, they at length broke into the royal apartment. They found the trembling bride sitting by the bedside, hiding her face with her veil, and lamenting her own danger, as well as the death of the king, who had expired during the night. An artery had suddenly burst, and as Attila lay in a supine posture, he was suffocated by a torrent of blood, which instead of finding a passage through the nostrils, regurgitated into the lungs and stomach. His body was solemnly exposed in the midst of the plain, under a silken pavilion, and the chosen squadrons of the Huns, wheeling round in measured evolutions, chanted a funeral song to the memory of a hero, 
glorious in life, invincible in his death, the father of his people, the scourge of his enemies, and the terror of the world. According to their national customs, the barbarians cut off a part of their hair, gashed their faces with unseemly wounds, and bewailed their valiant leader as he deserved, not with the tears of women, but with the blood of warriors. The remains of Attila were enclosed within three coffins, of gold, of silver, and of iron, and privately buried in the night. The spoils of nations were thrown into his grave, the captives who had opened the ground were inhumanely massacred, and the same Huns, who had indulged such excessive grief, feasted, with dissolute and intemperate mirth, about the recent sepulchre of their king. It was reported at Constantinople that on the fortunate night on which he expired, Marcian beheld in a dream the bow of Attila broken asunder, and the report may be allowed to prove how seldom the image of that formidable barbarian was absent from the mind of a Roman emperor. The revolution which subverted the empire of the Huns established the fame of Attila, whose genius alone had sustained the huge and disjointed fabric. After his death the boldest chieftains aspired to the rank of kings, the most powerful kings refused to acknowledge a superior, and the numerous sons, whom so many various mothers bore to the deceased monarch, divided and disputed, like a private inheritance, the sovereign command of the nations of Germany and Scythia. The bold Ardaric felt and represented the disgrace of this servile partition, and his subjects, the warlike Gepidae, with the Ostrogoths, under the conduct of three valiant brothers, encouraged their allies to vindicate the rights of freedom and royalty. In a bloody and decisive conflict on the banks of the river Natad, in Pannonia, the lance of the Gepidae, the sword of the Goths, the arrows of the Huns, the Suevic infantry, the light arms of the Heruli, and the heavy weapons of the Alani, encountered or supported each other, and the victory of the Aldaric was accompanied with the slaughter of thirty thousand of his enemies. Elec, the eldest son of Attila, lost his life and crown in the memorable battle of Natad, his early valor had raised him to the throne of the Akatziris, a Scythian people, whom he subdued, and his father, who loved the superior merit, would have envied the death of Elec. His brother, Dangasish, with an army of Huns, still formidable in their flight and ruin, maintained his ground above fifteen years on the banks of the Danube. The palace of Attila, with the old country of Dacia, from the Carpathian hills to the Euxine, became the seat of a new power, which was erected by Aldaric, king of the Gepidae. The Pannonian conquests from Vienna to Sirmium were occupied by the Ostrogoths, and the settlement of the tribes who had so bravely asserted their native freedom were irregularly distributed according to the measure of their respective strength. Surrounded and oppressed by the multitude of his father's slaves, the kingdom of Dengisish was confined to the circle of his wagons. His desperate courage urged him to invade the Eastern Empire, he fell in battle, and his head, ignominiously exposed in the Hippodrome, exhibited a grateful spectacle to the people of Constantinople. Attila had fondly or superstitiously believed that Irnak, the youngest of his sons, was destined to perpetuate the glories of his race. The character of that prince, who attempted to moderate the rashness of his brother Dengasish, was more suitable to the declining condition of the Huns, and Irnak, with his subject hordes, retired into the heart of the lesser Scythia. They were soon overwhelmed by a torrent of new barbarians, who followed the same road which their own ancestors had formerly discovered. The Gaugen, or Avars, whose residence is assigned by the Greek riders to the shores of the ocean, impelled the adjacent tribes, till at length the Igors of the north, issuing from the cold Siberian regions, which produced the most valuable furs, spread themselves over the desert, as far as the Borysthenes and the Caspian gates, and finally extinguishing the empire of the Huns. Such an event might contribute to the safety of the Eastern Empire, under the reign of a prince who conciliated the friendship, without forfeiting the esteem of the barbarians. But the emperor of the West, the feeble and dissolute Valentinian, who had reached his thirty-fifth year without attaining the age of reason or courage, abused this apparent security to undermine the foundations of his own throne by the murder of the patrician Aetius. From the instinct of a base and jealous mind, he hated the man who was universally celebrated as the terror of the barbarians and the support of the Republic, and his new favorite, the eunuch Heracleus, awakened the emperor from the supine lethargy, which might be disguised, during the life of Placidia, by the excuse of filial piety. The fame of Aetius, his wealth and dignity, 
the numerous and martial train of barbarian followers, his powerful dependents, who filled the civil offices of the state, and the hopes of his son Gaudentius, who was already contracted to Eudoxia, the emperor's daughter, had raised him above the rank of a subject. The ambitious designs, of which he was secretly accused, excited the fears, as well as the resentment, of Valentinian. Etius himself, supported by the consciousness of his merit, his services, and perhaps his innocence, seems to have maintained a haughty and indiscreet behavior. The patrician offended his sovereign by a hostile declaration. He aggravated the offense by compelling him to ratify, with a solemn oath, a treaty of reconciliation and alliance. He proclaimed his suspicions, he neglected his safety, and from a vain confidence that the enemy, whom he despised, was incapable even of a manly crime, he rashly ventured his person in the palace of Rome. Whilst he urged, perhaps with intemperate vehemence, the marriage of his son, Valentinian, drawing his sword, the first sword he had ever drawn, plunged it in the breast of a general who had saved his empire, his courtiers, and eunuchs ambitiously struggled to imitate their master, and Etius, pierced with a hundred wounds, fell dead in the royal presence. Bothius, the praetorian prefect, was killed at the same moment, and before the event could be divulged, the principal friends of the patrician were summoned to the palace and separately murdered. The horrid deed, palliated by the specious names of justice and necessity, was immediately communicated by the emperor to his soldiers, his subjects, and his allies. The nations, who were strangers or enemies to Etius, generously deplored the unworthy fate of a hero. The barbarians, who had been attached to his service, dissembled their grief and resentment, and the public contempt, which had been so long entertained for Valentinian, was at once converted into deep and universal abhorrence. Such sentiments seldom pervade the walls of a palace, yet the emperor was confounded by the honest reply of a Roman, whose approbation he had not disdained to solicit. I am ignorant, sir, of your motives or provocations. I only know that you have acted like a man who cuts off his right hand with his left. The luxury of Rome seems to have attracted the long and frequent visits of Valentinian, who was consequently more despised at Rome than in any other part of his dominions. A republican spirit was insensibly revived in the Senate, as their authority and even their supplies became necessary for the support of his feeble government. The stately demeanor of an hereditary monarch offended their pride, and the pleasures of Valentinian were injurious to the peace and honor of noble families. The birth of the Empress Eudoxia was equal to his own, and her charms and tender affection deserved those testimonies of love which her inconstant husband dissipated in vague and unlawful amours. Petronius Maximus, a wealthy senator of the Anician family, who had been twice consul, was possessed of a chaste and beautiful wife. Her obstinate resistance served only to irritate the desires of Valentinian, and he resolved to accomplish them, either by stratagem or force. Deep gaming was one of the vices of the court. The emperor, who by chance or contrivance had gained from Maximus a considerable sum, uncourteously exacted his ring as a security for the debt, and sent it by a trusty messenger to his wife, with an order in her husband's name that she should immediately attend the Empress Eudoxia. The unsuspecting wife of Maximus was conveyed in her litter to the imperial palace, the emissaries of her impatient lover conducted her to a remote and silent bedchamber, and Valentinian violated, without remorse, the laws of hospitality. Her tears when she returned home, her deep affliction, and her bitter reproaches against a husband whom she considered as the accomplice of his own shame, excited Maximus to a just revenge. The desire of revenge was stimulated by ambition, and he might reasonably aspire, by the free suffrage of the Roman Senate, to the throne of a detested and despicable rival. Valentinian, who supposed that every human breast was devoid, like his own, of friendship and gratitude, had imprudently admitted among his guards several domestics and followers of Etius. Two of these, of barbarian race, were persuaded to execute a sacred and honorable duty by punishing with death the assassin of their patron, and their intrepid courage did not long expect a favorable moment. Whilst Valentinian amused himself in the field of Mars with the spectacle of some military sports, they suddenly rushed upon him with drawn weapons, dispatched the guilty Heracleus, and stabbed the emperor to the heart, without the least opposition from his numerous train, who seemed to rejoice in the tyrant's death. Such was the fate of Valentinian the Third, 
the last Roman emperor of the family of Theodosius. He faithfully imitated the hereditary weakness of his cousin and his two uncles, without inheriting the gentleness, the purity, the innocence, which alleviate in their characters the want of spirit and ability. Valentinian was less excusable, since he had passions without virtues. Even his religion was questionable, and though he never deviated into the paths of heresy, he scandalized the pious Christians by his attachment to the profane arts of magic and divination. As early as the time of Cicero and Varro, it was the opinion of the Roman augurs that the twelve vultures which Romulus had seen represented the twelve centuries, assigned for the fateful period of his city. This prophecy, disregarded perhaps in the season of health and prosperity, inspired the people with gloomy apprehensions, when the twelfth century, clouded with disgrace and misfortune, was almost elapsed, and even posterity must acknowledge with some surprise that the arbitrary interpretation of an accidental or fabulous circumstance has been seriously verified in the downfall of the Western Empire. But its fall was announced by a clearer omen than the flight of vultures. The Roman government appeared every day less formidable to its enemies, more odious and oppressive to its subjects. The taxes were multiplied with the public distress, economy was neglected in proportion as it became necessary, and the injustice of the rich shifted the unequal burden from themselves to the people, whom they defrauded of the indulgences that might sometimes have alleviated their misery. The severe inquisitions which confiscated their goods and tortured their persons compelled the subjects of Valentinian to prefer the more simple tyranny of the barbarians, or to embrace the vile and abject condition of mercenary servants. They abjured and abhorred the name of Roman citizens, which had formerly excited the ambition of mankind. The Amorican provinces of Gaul, and the greatest part of Spain, were thrown into a state of disorderly independence by the confederations of the Bagade, and the imperial ministers pursued with prescriptive laws and ineffectual arms the rebels whom they had made. If all the barbarian conquerors had been annihilated in the same hour, their total destruction would not have restored the empire of the West. And if Rome still survived, she survived the loss of freedom, of virtue, and of honor. The loss, or desolation, of the provinces, from the ocean to the Alps, impaired the glory and greatness of Rome. Her internal prosperity was irretrievably destroyed by the separation of Africa. The rapacious vandals confiscated the patrimonial estates of the senators, and intercepted the regular subsidies which relieved the poverty and encouraged the idleness of the plebeians. The distress of the Romans was soon aggravated by an unexpected attack, and the province, so long cultivated for their use by industrious and obedient subjects, was armed against them by an ambitious barbarian. The vandals and the Alani, who followed the successful standard of Genseric, had acquired a rich and fertile territory, which stretched along the coast above ninety days' journey from Tangier to Tripoli. But their narrow limits were oppressed and confined, on either side, by the sandy desert and the Mediterranean. The discovery and the conquest of the black nations that might dwell beyond the torrid zone could not tempt the rational ambition of Genseric, but he cast his eyes towards the sea, and he resolved to create a naval power and his bold resolution was executed with steady and active perseverance. The woods of Mount Atlas afforded an inexhaustible nursery of timber, and his new subjects were skilled in the arts of navigation and shipbuilding. He animated his daring vandals to embrace a mode of warfare which could render every maritime country accessible to their arms. The Moors and Africans were allured by the hope of plunder, and after an interval of six centuries, the fleets that issued from the port of Carthage again claimed the empire of the Mediterranean. The success of the Vandals, the conquest of Sicily, the sack of Palermo, and their frequent descents on the coast of Lucania, awakened and alarmed the mother of Valentinian and the sister of Theodosius. Alliances were formed, and armaments, expensive and ineffectual, were prepared for the destruction of the common enemy, who reserved his courage to encounter those dangers which his policy could not prevent or elude. The designs of the Roman government were repeatedly baffled by his artful delays, ambiguous promises, and apparent concessions, and the interposition of his formidable confederate, the King of the Huns, recalled the emperors from the conquest of Africa to the care of their domestic safety. The revolutions of the palace, which left the Western Empire without a defender and without a lawful prince, 
dispelled the apprehensions and stimulated the avarice of Genseric. He immediately equipped a numerous fleet of Vandals and Moors, and cast anchor at the mouth of the Tiber, about three months after the death of Valentinian and the elevation of Maximus to the imperial throne. The private life of the senator Petronius Maximus was often alleged as the rare example of human felicity. His birth was noble and illustrious, since he descended from the Anician family. His dignity was supported by an adequate patrimony in land and money, and these advantages of fortune were accompanied with liberal arts and decent manners, which adorn or imitate the inestimable gifts of genius and virtue. The luxury of his palace and table was hospitable and elegant. Whenever Maximus appeared in public, he was surrounded by a train of grateful and obsequious clients, and it is possible that among these clients he might deserve and possess some real friends. His merit was rewarded by the favor of the prince and senate. He thrice exercised the office of Praetorian Prefect of Italy. He was twice invested with the consulship, and he obtained the rank of patrician. These civil honors were not incompatible with the enjoyment of leisure and tranquility. His hours, according to the demands of pleasure or reason, were accurately distributed by a water clock, and this avarice of time may be allowed to prove the sense which Maximus entertained of his own happiness. The injury which he received from the Emperor Valentinian appears to excuse the most bloody revenge. Yet, a philosopher might have reflected that, if the resistance of his wife had been sincere, her chastity was still inviolate, and that it could never be restored if she had consented to the will of the adulterer. A patriot would have hesitated before he plunged himself and his country into those inevitable calamities which must follow the extinction of the royal house of Theodosius. The imprudent Maximus disregarded these salutary considerations. He gratified his resentment and ambition. He saw the bleeding corpse of Valentinian at his feet. He heard himself saluted emperor by the unanimous voice of the senate and people. But the day of his inauguration was the last day of his happiness. He was imprisoned, such is the lively expression of Sidonius, in the palace. And after passing a sleepless night, he sighed that he had obtained the summit of his wishes, and aspired only to descend from the dangerous elevation. Oppressed by the weight of the diadem, he communicated his anxious thoughts to his friend and quaestor, Fulgentius, and when he looked back with unavailing regret on the secure pleasures of his former life, the emperor exclaimed, O fortunate Damocles, thy reign began and ended with the same dinner, a well-known allusion, which Fulgentius afterwards repeated, as an instructive lesson for princes and subjects. The reign of Maximus continued about three months. His hours, of which he had lost the command, were disturbed by remorse or guilt or terror, and his throne was shaken by the seditions of the people of the soldiers and the confederate barbarians. The marriage of his son Palladius with the eldest daughter of the late emperor might tend to establish the hereditary secession of his family, but the violence which he offered to the empress Eudocia could proceed only from the blind impulse of lust or revenge. His own wife, the cause of these tragic events, had been seasonably removed by death, and the widow of Valentinian was compelled to violate her decent mourning, perhaps her real grief and to submit to the embraces of a presumptuous usurper, whom she suspected as the assassin of her deceased husband. These suspicions were soon justified by the indiscreet confession of Maximus himself, and he wantonly provoked the hatred of his reluctant bride, who was still conscious that she descended from a line of emperors. From the east, however, Eudocia could not hope to obtain any effectual assistance. Her father and her aunt, Polcuria, were dead, her mother languished at Jerusalem in disgrace and exile, and the scepter of Constantinople was in the hands of a stranger. She directed her eyes towards Carthage, secretly implored the aid of the king of the Vandals, and persuaded Genseric to improve the fair opportunity of disguising his rapacious designs by the specious names of honor, justice, and compassion. Whatever abilities Maximus might have shown in a subordinate station, he was found incapable of administering an empire and though he might easily have been informed of the naval preparations which were made on the opposite shores of Africa, he expected with supine indifference the approach of the enemy, without adopting any measures of defense, of negotiation, or of a timely retreat. When the Vandals disembarked at the mouth of the Tiber, 
the emperor was suddenly roused from his lethargy by the clamors of a trembling and exasperated multitude. The only hope which presented itself to his astonished mind was that of a precipitate flight, and he exhorted the senators to imitate the examples of their prince. But no sooner did Maximus appear in the streets than he was assaulted by a shower of stones. A Roman or a Burgundian soldier claimed the honor of the first wound. His mangled body was ignominiously cast into the Tiber. The Roman people rejoiced in the punishment which they had inflicted on the author of the public calamities, and the domestics of Eudocia signalized their zeal in the service of their mistress. On the third day after the tumult, Genseric boldly advanced from the port of Ostia to the gates of the defenseless city. Instead of a sally of the Roman youth, there issued from the gates an unarmed and venerable procession of the bishop at the head of his clergy. The fearless spirit of Leo, his authority and eloquence, again mitigated the fierceness of a barbarian conqueror. The king of the Vandals promised to spare the unresisting multitude, to protect the buildings from fire, and to exempt the captives from torture. And although such orders were neither seriously given nor strictly obeyed, the mediation of Leo was glorious to himself, and in some degree beneficial to his country. But Rome and its inhabitants were delivered to the licentiousness of the Vandals and Moors, whose blind passions revenged the injuries of Carthage. The pillage lasted fourteen days and nights, and all that yet remained of public or private wealth, of sacred or profane treasure, was diligently transported to the vessels of Genseric. Among the spoils, the splendid relics of two temples, or rather of two religions, exhibited a memorable example of the vicissitudes of human and divine things. Since the abolition of paganism, the capital had been violated and abandoned. Yet the statues of the gods and heroes were still respected, and the curious roof of gilt bronze was reserved for the rapacious hands of Genseric. The holy instruments of the Jewish worship, the gold table and the gold candlestick with seven branches, originally framed according to the particular instructions of God himself, and which were placed in the sanctuary of his temple, had been ostentatiously displayed to the Roman people in the triumph of Titus. They were afterwards deposited in the Temple of Peace, and at the end of four hundred years the spoils of Jerusalem were transferred from Rome to Carthage by a barbarian who derived his origin from the shores of the Baltic. These ancient monuments might attract the notice of curiosity as well as of avarice, but the Christian churches, enriched and adorned by the prevailing superstition of the times, afforded more plentiful materials for sacrilege, and the pious liberality of Pope Leo, who melted six silver vases, the gift of Constantine, each of a hundred pounds weight, is an evidence of the damage which he attempted to repair. In the forty-five years that had elapsed since the Gothic invasion, the pomp and luxury of Rome were in some measure restored, and it was difficult either to escape or to satisfy the avarice of a conqueror, who possessed leisure to collect, and the ships to transport the wealth of the capital. The imperial ornaments of the palace, the magnificent furniture and wardrobe, the sideboards of massy plate, were accumulated with disorderly rapine. The gold and silver amounted to several thousand talents, yet even the brass and copper were laboriously removed. Eudocia herself, who advanced to meet her friend and deliverer, soon bewailed the imprudence of her own conduct. She was rudely stripped of her jewels, and the unfortunate empress with her two daughters, the only surviving remains of the great Theodosius, was compelled, as a captive, to follow the haughty vandal, who immediately hoisted sail and returned with a prosperous navigation to the port of Carthage. Many thousand Romans of both sexes, chosen for some useful or agreeable qualifications, reluctantly embarked on board the fleet of Genseric, and their distress was aggravated by the unfeeling barbarians, who, in the division of the booty, separated the wives from their husbands, the children from their parents. The charity of Deogratius, bishop of Carthage, was their only consolation and support. He generously sold the gold and silver plate of the church to purchase the freedom of some, to alleviate the slavery of others, and to insist the wants and infirmities of a captive multitude, whose health was impaired by the hardships which they had suffered in the passage from Italy to Africa. By his order, two spacious churches were converted into hospitals. The sick were distributed in convenient beds and liberally supplied with food and medicines, and the aged prelate repeated his visits, both in the day and night, with an assiduity that surpassed his strength and a tender sympathy which enhanced the value of his services. 
Compare this scene with the field of Cannae, and judge between Hannibal and the successor of St. Cyprian. The deaths of Aetius and Valentinian had relaxed the ties which held the barbarians of Gaul in peace and subordination. The seacoast was infested by the Saxons, the Alemanni and the Franks advanced from the Rhine to the Seine, and the ambition of the Goths seemed to meditate more extensive and permanent conquests. The Emperor Maximus relieved himself by a judicious choice from the weight of these distant cares. He silenced the solicitations of his friends, listened to the voice of fame, and promoted a stranger to the general command of the forces in Gaul. Avitus, the stranger whose merit was so nobly rewarded, descended from a wealthy and honorable family in the diocese of Auvergne. The convulsions of the times urged him to embrace, with the same ardor, the civil and military professions, and the indefatigable youth blended the studies of literature and jurisprudence with the exercise of arms and hunting. Thirty years of his life were laudably spent in the public service. He alternately displayed his talents in war and negotiation, and the soldier of Aetius, after executing the most important embassies, was raised to the station of Praetorian Prefect of Gaul. Either the merit of Avitus excited envy, or his moderation was desirous of repose, since he calmly retired to an estate which he possessed in the neighborhood of Clermont. A copious stream, issuing from the mountain, and falling headlong into many a loud and foaming cascade, discharged its waters into a lake about two miles in length, and the villa was pleasantly seated on the margin of the lake. The baths, the porticos, the summer and winter apartments, were adapted to the purposes of luxury and use, and the adjacent country afforded the various prospects of woods, pastures, and meadows. In this retreat, where Avitus amused his leisure with books, rural sports, and the practice of husbandry and the society of his friends, he received the imperial diploma, which constituted him Master General of the Cavalry and Infantry of Gaul. He assumed the military command. The barbarians suspended their fury, and whatever means he might employ, whatever concessions he might be forced to make, the people enjoyed the benefits of actual tranquility. But the fate of Gaul depended on the Visigoths, and the Roman general, less attentive to his dignity than to the public interest, did not disdain to visit Toulouse in the character of an ambassador. He was received with courteous hospitality by Theodoric, the king of the Goths, but while Avitus laid the foundations of a solid alliance with that powerful nation, he was astonished by the intelligence that the emperor Maximus was slain, and that Rome had been pillaged by the Vandals. A vacant throne which he might ascend without guilt or danger tempted his ambition, and the Visigoths were easily persuaded to support his claim by their irresistible suffrage. They loved the person of Avitus, they respected his virtues, and they were not insensible of the advantage, as well as of honor, of giving an emperor to the West. The season was now approaching in which the annual assembly of the seven provinces was held at Arles. Their deliberations might perhaps be influenced by the presence of Theodoric and his martial brothers, but their choice would naturally incline to the most illustrious of their countrymen. Avitus, after a decent resistance, accepted the imperial diadem from the representatives of Gaul, and his election was ratified by the acclamations of the barbarians and provincials. The formal consent of Marcion, emperor of the East, was solicited and obtained, but the Senate, Rome, and Italy, though humbled by their recent calamities, submitted, with a secret murmur, to the presumption of the Gallic usurper. Theodoric, to whom Avitus was indebted to, for the purple, had acquired the Gothic scepter by the murder of his elder brother Torismond, and he has justified this atrocious deed by the design which his predecessor had formed of violating his alliance with the empire. Such a crime might not be incompatible with the virtues of a barbarian, but the manners of Theodoric were gentle and humane, and posterity may contemplate, without terror, the original picture of a Gothic king, whom Sidonius had intimately observed in the hours of peace and of social intercourse. In an epistle, dated from the court of Toulouse, the orator satisfies the curiosity of one of his friends, in the following description. By the majesty of his appearance, Theodoric would command the respect of those who are ignorant of his merit, and although he was born a prince, his merit would dignify a private station. He is of middle stature, his body appears rather plump than fat, and in his well-proportioned limbs agility is united with muscular strength. If you examine his countenance, you will distinguish a high forehead, large shaggy eyebrows, an equiline nose, 
thin lips, a regular set of white teeth, and a fair complexion, that blushes more frequently from modesty than from anger. The ordinary distribution of his time, as far as it is exposed to the public view, may be concisely represented. Before daybreak he repairs, with a small train, to his domestic chapel, where the service is performed by the Arian clergy, but those who presume to interpret his secret sentiments consider this assiduous devotion as the effect of habit and policy. The rest of the morning is employed in the administration of his kingdom. His chair is surrounded by some military officers of decent aspect and behavior. The noisy crowd of his barbarian guards occupies the hall of audience, but they are not permitted to stand within the veils or curtains that conceal the council chamber from vulgar eyes. The ambassadors of the nations are successively introduced. Theodoric listens with attention, answers them with discreet brevity, and either announces or delays, according to the nature of their business, his final resolution. About eight, the second hour, he rises from his throne, and visits either his treasury or his stables. If he chooses to hunt, or at least to exercise himself on horseback, his bow is carried by a favorite youth, but when a game is marked, he bends it with his own hand, and seldom misses the object of his aim. As a king he disdains to bear arms in such ignoble warfare, but as a soldier he would blush to accept any military service that he could perform himself. On common days his dinner is not different from the repast of a private citizen, but every Saturday many honorable guests are invited to the royal table, which on these occasions is served with the elegance of Greece, the plenty of Gaul, and the order and diligence of Italy. The gold or silver plate is less remarkable for its weight than for the brightness and curious workmanship. The taste is gratified without the help of foreign and costly luxury. The size and number of, of the cups of wine are regulated with a strict regard to the laws of temperance, and the respectful silence that prevails is interrupted only by grave and instructive conversation. After dinner, Theodoric sometimes indulges himself in a short slumber, and as soon as he wakes he calls for the dice and tables, encourages his friends to forget the royal majesty, and is delighted when they freely express the passions which are excited by the incidents at play. At this game, which he loves as the image of war, he alternately displays his eagerness, his skill, his patience, and his cheerful temper. If he loses, he laughs. He is modest and silent if he wins. Yet notwithstanding this seeming indifference, his courtiers choose to solicit any favor in the moments of victory, and I myself, in my applications to the king, have derived some benefit from my losses. About the ninth hour, three o'clock, the tide of business again returns and flows incessantly till after sunset, when the signal of the royal supper dismisses the weary crowd of suppliants and pleaders. At the supper, a more familiar repast, buffoons and pantomimes are sometimes introduced, to divert, not to offend, the company by their ridiculous wit. But female singers, and the soft effeminate modes of music, are severely banished, and such martial tunes as animate the soul to deeds of valor, are alone grateful to the ear of Theodoric. He retires from table, and the nocturnal guards are immediately posted at the entrance of the treasury, the palace, and the private apartments. When the king of the Visigoths encouraged Avitus to assume the purple, he offered his person and his forces as a faithful soldier of the Republic. The exploits of Theodoric soon convinced the world that he had not degenerated from the warlike virtues of his ancestors. After the establishment of the Goths in Aquitaine, and the passage of the Vandals into Africa, the Suevi, who had fixed their kingdom in Galicia, aspired to the conquest of Spain, and threatened to extinguish the feeble remains of the Roman dominion. The provincials of Carthagena and Tarragona, afflicted by an hostile invasion, represented their injuries and their apprehensions. Count Fronto was dispatched, in the name of the Emperor Avitus, with advantageous offers of peace and alliance, and Theodoric interposed his weighty mediation to declare that, unless his brother-in-law, the King of the Suevi, immediately retired, he would be obliged to arm in the cause of justice and of Rome. Tell him, replied the haughty Reciarius, that I despise his friendship and his arms, but that I will soon try whether he will dare to expect my arrival under the walls of Toulouse. Such a challenge urged Theodoric to prevent the bold designs of his enemy. He passed the Pyrenees at the head of the Visigoths. The Franks and Burgundians served under his standards, and though he professed himself the dutiful servant of Avitus, he privately stipulated 
for himself and his successors, the absolute possession of his Spanish conquests. The two armies, or rather the two nations, encountered each other on the banks of the river Urbicus, about twelve miles from Astorga, and the decisive victory of the Goths appeared for a while to have extirpated the name and kingdom of the Suevi. From the field of battle Theodoric advanced to Braga, their metropolis, which still retained the splendid vestiges of his ancient commerce and dignity. His entrance was not polluted with blood, and the Goths respected the chastity of their female captives, more especially of the consecrated virgins. But the greatest part of the clergy and people were made slaves, and even the churches and altars were confounded in the universal pillage. The unfortunate king of the Sueve had escaped to one of the ports of the ocean, but the obstinacy of the winds opposed his flight, and he was delivered to his implacable rival. And Ricarius, who neither desired nor expected mercy, received, with manly constancy, the death which he would probably have inflicted. After this bloody sacrifice to policy or resentment, Theodoric carried his victorious arms as far as Marita, the principal town of Lusitania, without meeting any resistance except from the miraculous powers of St. Eualia, but he was stopped in the full career of success and recalled from Spain before he could provide for the security of his conquests. In his retreat towards the Pyrenees, he revenged his disappointment on the country through which he passed, and in the sack of Palentia and Astorga, he showed himself a faithless ally as well as a cruel enemy. Whilst the king of the Visigoths fought and vanquished in the name of Avitus, the reign of Avitus had expired, and both the honor and interest of Theodoric were deeply wounded by the disgrace of a friend whom he had seated on the throne of the Western Empire. The pressing solicitations of the Senate and people persuaded the emperor Avitus to fix his residence at Rome and to accept the consulship for the ensuing year. On the first day of January, his son-in-law, Sidonius Apollinaris celebrated his praises in a panegyric of six hundred verses. But this composition, though it was rewarded with a brass statue, seems to contain a very moderate proportion either of genius or of truth. The poet, if we may degrade that sacred name, exaggerates the merit of a sovereign and a father, and his prophecy of a long and glorious reign was soon contradicted by the event. Avitus, at a time when the imperial dignity was reduced to a preeminence of toil and danger, indulged himself in the pleasures of Italian luxury. Age had not extinguished his amorous inclinations, and he is accused of insulting, with indiscreet and ungenerous raillery, the husbands whose wives he had seduced or violated. But the Romans were not inclined either to excuse his faults or to acknowledge his virtues. The several parts of the empire became, every day, more alienated from each other, and the stranger of Gaul was the object of popular hatred and contempt. The Senate asserted their legitimate claim in the election of an emperor, and their authority, which had been originally derived from the old constitution, was again fortified by the actual weakness of a declining monarchy. Yet even such a monarchy might have resisted the votes of an unarmed Senate, if their discontent had not been supported, or perhaps inflamed, by Count Ricimer, one of the principal commanders of the barbarian troops who formed the military defense of Italy. The daughter of Walia, king of the Visigoths, was the mother of Ricimer, but he was descended on his father's side from the nation of the Suevi. His pride or patriotism might be exasperated by the misfortunes of his countrymen, and he obeyed with reluctance an emperor in whose elevation he had not been consulted. His faithful and important services against the common enemy rendered him still more formidable, and after destroying on the coast of Corsica a fleet of vandals which consisted of sixty galleys, Ricimer returned in triumph with the appellation of the Deliverer of Italy. He chose that moment to signify to Avitus that his reign was at an end, and the feeble emperor, at a distance from his Gothic allies, was compelled, after a short and unavailing struggle, to abdicate the purple. By the clemency, however, or the contempt of Ricimer, he was permitted to descend from the throne to the more desirable station of Bishop of Placentia. But the resentment of the Senate was still unsatisfied, and their inflexible severity pronounced the sentence of his death. He fled towards the Alps, with the humble hope, not of arming the Visigoths in his cause, but of securing his person and treasures in the sanctuary of Julian, one of the tutelar saints of Auvergne. Disease, 
or the hand of the executioner, arrested him on the road. Yet his remains were decently transported to Brivas, or Briod, in his native province, and he reposed at the feet of his holy patron. Avitus left only one daughter, the wife of Sidonis Apollinaris, who inherited the patrimony of his father-in-law, lamenting at the same time the disappointment of his public and private expectations. His resentment prompted him to join, or at least to countenance, the measures of a rebellious faction in Gaul, and the poet had contracted some guilt, which it was incumbent on him to expiate by a new tribute of flattery to the succeeding emperor. The successor of Avitus presents the welcome discovery of a great and heroic character, such as sometimes arise in a degenerate age to vindicate the honor of the human species. The emperor Majorian has deserved the praises of his contemporaries and of posterity, and these praises may be strongly expressed in the words of a judicious and disinterested historian. That he was gentle to his subjects, that he was terrible to his enemies, that he excelled in every virtue all of his predecessors who had reigned over the Romans. Such a testimony may justify at least the panegyric of Sidonius, and we may acquiesce in the assurance that, although the obsequious orator would have flattered with equal zeal the most worthless of princes, the extraordinary merit of his object confined him on this occasion within the bounds of truth. Majorian derived his name from his maternal grandfather, who, in the reign of the great Theodosius, had commanded the troops of the Illyrian frontier. He gave his daughter in marriage to the father of Majorian, a respectable officer who administered the revenues of Gaul with skill and integrity, and generously preferred the friendship of Aetius to the tempting offers of an insidious court. His son, the future emperor, who was educated in the profession of arms, displayed from his early youth intrepid courage, premature wisdom, and unbounded liberality in a scanty fortune. He followed the standard of Aetius, contributed to his success, shared and sometimes eclipsed his glory, and at last excited the jealousy of the patrician, or rather of his wife, who forced him to retire from the service. Majorian, after the death of Aetius, was recalled and promoted, and his intimate connection with Count Ricimer was the immediate step by which he ascended the throne of the Western Empire. During the vacancy that succeeded the abdication of Avitus, the ambitious barbarian, whose birth excluded him from the imperial dignity, governed Italy with the title of patrician, resigned to his friend the conspicuous station of master general of the cavalry and infantry, and, after an interval of some months, consented to the unanimous wish of the Romans, whose favor Majorian had solicited by a recent victory over the Alemanni. He was invested with the purple at Ravenna, and the epistle which he addressed to the Senate will best describe his situation and his sentiments. Your election, conscript fathers, and the ordinance of the most valiant army, have made me your emperor. May the propitious deity direct and prosper the counsels and offense of my administration to your advantage and to the public welfare. For my own part, I did not aspire, I have submitted to reign, nor should I have discharged the obligations of a citizen if I had refused, with base and selfish ingratitude, to support the weight of those labors which were imposed by the Republic. Assist, therefore, the prince whom you have made, partake the duties which you have enjoined, and may our common endeavors promote the happiness of an empire which I have accepted from your hands. Be assured that, in our times, justice shall resume her ancient vigor, and that virtue shall become not only innocent, but meritorious. Let none, except the authors themselves, be apprehensive of delations, which, as a subject, I have always condemned, and as a prince, will severely punish. Our own vigilance and that of our father, the patrician Ricimer, shall regulate all military affairs and provide for the safety of the Roman world, which we have saved from foreign and domestic enemies. You now understand the maxims of my government. You may confide in the faithful love and sincere assurances of a prince who has formerly been the companion of your life and dangers, who still glories in the name of senator, and who is anxious that you should never repent of the judgment which you have pronounced in his favor. The emperor, who, amidst the ruins of the Roman world, revived the ancient language of law and liberty, which Trajan would not have disclaimed, 
must have derived those generous sentiments from his own heart, since they were not suggested to his imitation by the customs of his age, or the example of his predecessors. The private and public actions of Majorian are very imperfectly known, but his laws, remarkable for an original cast of thought and expression, faithfully represent the character of a sovereign who loved his people, who sympathized in their distress, who studied the causes of the decline of the empire, and who was capable of applying, as far as such reformation was practicable, judicious and effectual remedies to the public disorders. His regulations concerning the finances manifestly tended to remove, or at least to mitigate, the most intolerable grievances. 1. From the first hour of his reign he was solicitous, I translate his own words, to relieve the weary fortunes of the provincials, oppressed by the accumulated weight of indictions and superindictions. With this view he granted an universal amnesty, a final and absolute discharge of all arrears of tribute, of all debts which, under any pretense, the fiscal officers might demand from the people. The wise dereliction of obsolete, vexatious, and unprofitable claims improved and purified the sources of the public revenue, and the subject who can now look back without despair might labor with hope and gratitude for himself and for his country. 2. In the assessment and collection of taxes, Majorian restored the ordinary jurisdiction of the provincial magistrates, and suppressed the extraordinary commissions which had been introduced in the name of the emperor himself, or of the praetorian prefects. The favorite servants who obtained such irregular powers were insolent in their behavior and arbitrary in their demands. They affected to despise the subordinate tribunals, and they were discontented if their fees and profits did not twice exceed the sum which they condescended to pay into the treasury. One instance of their extortion would appear incredible, were it not authenticated by the legislator himself. They exacted the whole payment in gold, but they refused the current coin of the empire, and would accept only such ancient pieces as were stamped with the names of Faustina or of the Antonines. The subject, who was unprovided with these curious metals, had recourse to the expedient of compounding with their rapacious demands, or, if he succeeded in the research, his imposition was doubled according to the weight and value of the money of former times. 3. The municipal corporations, says the emperor, the lesser senates, so antiquity has justly styled them, deserve to be considered as the heart of the cities and the sinews of the republic. And yet so low are they now reduced by the injustice of magistrates and the venality of collectors that many of their members, renouncing their dignity and their country, have taken refuge in distant and obscure exile. He urges, and even compels, their return to their respective cities. But he removes the grievance which had forced them to desert the exercise of their municipal functions. They are directed, under the authority of the provincial magistrates, to resume their office of levying the tribute. But, instead of being made responsible for the whole sum assessed on their district, they were only required to produce a regular account of the payments which they had actually received and of the defaulters who are still indebted to the public. 4. But Majorian was not ignorant that these corporate bodies were too much inclined to retaliate the injustice and oppression which they had suffered, and he therefore revives the useful office of the defenders of cities. He exhorts the people to elect, in a full and free assembly, some man of discretion and integrity who would dare to assert their privileges, to represent their grievances, and to protect the poor from the tyranny of the rich, and to inform the emperor of the abuses that were committed under the sanction of his name and authority. The spectator, who casts a mournful view over the ruins of ancient Rome, is tempted to accuse the memory of the Goths and Vandals for the mischief which they had neither leisure, nor power, nor perhaps inclination to perpetrate. The tempest of war might strike some lofty turrets to the ground, but the destruction which undermined the foundations of those massy fabrics was prosecuted, slowly and silently, during a period of ten centuries, and the motives of interest that afterwards operated without shame or control were severely checked by the taste and spirit of the Emperor Majorian. The decay of the city had gradually impaired the value of the public works. The circus and theaters might still excite, but they seldom gratified, the desires of the people. The temples which had escaped the zeal of the Christians were no longer inhabited either by gods or men. 
the diminished crowds of the Romans were lost in the immense space of their baths and porticos, and the stately libraries and halls of justice became useless to an indolent generation whose repose was seldom disturbed either by study or business. The monuments of consular or imperial greatness were no longer revered as the immortal glory of the capital. They were only esteemed as an inexhaustible mine of materials cheaper and more convenient than the distant quarry. Specious petitions were continually addressed to the easy magistrates of Rome, which stated the want of stones or bricks for some necessary service. The fairest forms of architecture were rudely defaced for the sake of some paltry or pretended repairs, and the degenerate Romans, who converted the spoil of their own emolument, demolished with sacrilegious hands the labors of their ancestors. Majorian, who had often sighed over the desolation of the city, applied a severe remedy to the growing evil. He reserved to the prince and senate the sole cognizance of the extreme cases which might justify the destruction of an ancient edifice, imposed a fine of fifty pounds of gold, two thousand pounds sterling, on every magistrate who should presume to grant such illegal and scandalous license, and threatened to chastise the criminal obedience of their subordinate officers by a severe whipping and amputation of both their hands. In the last instance, the legislator might seem to forget the proportion of guilt and punishment. But his zeal arose from a generous principle, and Majorian was anxious to protect the monuments of those ages in which he would have desired and deserved to live. The emperor conceived that it was his interest to increase the number of his subjects, that it was his duty to guard the purity of the marriage bed. But the means which he employed to accomplish these salutary purposes are of an ambiguous and perhaps exceptional kind. The pious maids who had consecrated their virginity to Christ were restrained from taking the veil till they had reached their fortieth year. Widows under that age were compelled to form a second alliance within a term of five years, by the forfeiture of half their wealth to their nearest relations or to the state. Unequal marriages were condemned or annulled. The punishment of confiscation and exile was deemed so inadequate to the guilt of adultery, that if the criminal returned to Italy he might, by the express declaration of Majorian, be slain with impunity. While the emperor Majorian assiduously labored to restore the happiness and virtue of the Romans, he encountered the arms of Genseric, from his character and situation their most formidable enemy. A fleet of vandals and moors landed at the mouth of the Liris, or Garagliano, but the imperial troops surprised and attacked the disorderly barbarians, who were encumbered with the spoils of Campania. They were chased with slaughter to their ships, and their leader, the king's brother-in-law, was found in the number of the slain. Such vigilance might announce the character of the new reign, but the strictest vigilance and the most numerous forces were insufficient to protect the long-extended coast of Italy from the depredations of a naval war. The public opinion had imposed a nobler and more arduous task on the genius of Majorian. Rome expected from him alone the restitution of Africa and the design which he formed of attacking the Vandals in their new settlements was the result of a bold and judicious policy. If the intrepid emperor could have infused his own spirit into the youth of Italy, if he could have revived in the field of Mars the manly exercises in which he had always surpassed his equals, he might have marched against Genseric at the head of a Roman army. Such a reformation of the national manners might be embraced by the rising generation but it is the misfortune of those princes who laboriously sustain a declining monarchy that, to obtain some immediate advantage or to avert some impending danger, they are forced to countenance and even to multiply the most pernicious abuses. Majorian, like the weakest of his predecessors, was reduced to the disgraceful expedient of substituting barbarian auxiliaries in the place of his unwarlike subjects, and his superior abilities could only be displayed in the vigor and dexterity with which he yielded a dangerous instrument, so apt to recoil on the hand that used it. Besides the confederates who were already engaged in the service of the empire, the fame of his liberality and valor attracted the nations of the Danube, the Borysthenes, and perhaps of the Tanais. Many thousands of the bravest subjects of Attila, the Gepidae, Ostrogoths, the Rugians, the Burgundians, the Suevi, the Alani, assembled on the plains of Liguria, and their formidable strength was balanced in their mutual animosities. They passed the Alps in a severe winter. 
The emperor led the way on foot and in complete armor, sounding with his long staff the depth of the ice or snow, and encouraging the Scythians, who complained of the extreme cold, by the cheerful assurance that they should be satisfied with the heat of Africa. The citizens of Lyon had presumed to shut their gates. They soon implored and experienced the clemency of Majorian. He vanquished Theodoric in the field, and admitted to his friendship and alliance a king which he had found not unworthy of his arms. The beneficial, though precarious reunion of the greatest part of Gaul and Spain was the effect of persuasion as well as of force, and the independent Begaldi, who had escaped or resisted the oppression of former reigns, were disposed to confide in the virtues of Majorian. His camp was filled with barbarian allies. His throne was supported by the zeal of an affectionate people. But the emperor had foreseen that it was impossible without a maritime power to achieve the conquest of Africa. In the first Punic War, the Republic had exerted such incredible diligence that, within sixty days, after the first stroke of the axe had been given in the forest, a fleet of one hundred and sixty galleys proudly rode at anchor in the sea. Under circumstances much less favorable, Majorian equaled the spirit and perseverance of the ancient Romans. The woods of the Apennine were felled, the arsenals and manufacturers of Ravenna and Mycenaeum were restored. Italy and Gaul vied with each other in liberal contributions to the public service, and the imperial navy of three hundred large galleys, with an adequate proportion of transports and smaller vessels, was collected in the secure and capacious harbor of Carthagena in Spain. The intrepid countenance of Majorian animated his troops with the confidence of victory, and if you might credit the historian Procopius, his courage sometimes hurried him beyond the bounds of prudence. Anxious to explore with his own eyes the state of the Vandals, he ventured, after disguising the color of his hair, to visit Carthage in the character of his own ambassador, and Genseric was afterwards mortified by the discovery that he had entertained and dismissed the emperor of the Romans. Such an anecdote might be rejected as an improbable fiction, but it is a fiction which would not have been imagined unless in the life of a hero. Without the help of a personal interview, Genseric was sufficiently acquainted with the genius and designs of his adversary. He practiced his customary arts of fraud and delay, but he practiced them without success. His applications for peace became each hour more submissive and perhaps more sincere. But the inflexible Majorian had adopted the ancient maxim that Rome could not be safe as long as Carthage existed in a hostile state. The king of the Vandals distrusted the valor of his native subjects, who were enervated by the luxury of the south. He suspected the fidelity of the vanquished people, who abhorred him as an Aryan tyrant, and the desperate measures which he executed by reducing Mauritania into a desert could not defeat the operations of the Roman emperor, who was at liberty to land his troops on any part of the African coast. But Genseric was saved from impending and inevitable ruin by the treachery of some powerful subjects, envious or apprehensive of their master's success. Guided by their secret intelligence, he surprised the unguarded fleet in the bay of Carthagena. Many of the ships were sunk or taken, or burnt, and the preparations of three years were destroyed in a single day. After this event, the behavior of the two antagonists showed them superior to their fortune. The Vandal, instead of being elated by this accidental victory, immediately renewed his solicitations for peace. The Emperor of the West, who was capable of forming great designs and supporting heavy disappointments, consented to a treaty, or rather to a suspension of arms, in the full assurance that before he could restore his navy, he should be supplied with provocations to justify a second war. Majorian returned to Italy to prosecute his labors for the public happiness, and as he was conscious of his own integrity, he might long remain ignorant of the dark conspiracy which threatened his throne and his life. The recent misfortune of Carthagena sullied the glory which had dazzled the eyes of the multitude. Almost every description of civil and military officers were exasperated against the reformer, since they had all derived some advantage from the abuses which he endeavored to suppress. And the patrician Ricimer impelled the inconstant passions of the barbarians against a prince whom he esteemed and hated. The virtues of Majorian could not protect him from the impetuous sedition which broke out in the camp near Tortona, at the foot of the Alps. He was compelled to abdicate the imperial purple. Five days after his abdication, it was reported that he died of a dysentery, 
and the humble tomb which covered his remains was consecrated by the respect and gratitude of succeeding generations. The private character of Majorian inspired love and respect. Malicious calumny and satire excited his indignation, or, if he himself were the object, his contempt. But he protected the freedom of wit, and in the hours which the emperor gave to the familiar society of his friends, he could indulge his taste for pleasantry without degrading the majesty of his rank. It was not, perhaps, with some regret that Ricimer sacrificed his friend to the interest of his ambition, but he resolved in a second choice to avoid the imprudent preference of superior virtue and merit. At his command, the obsequious senate of Rome bestowed the imperial title on Libius Severus, who ascended the throne of the West without emerging from the obscurity of a private condition. History has scarcely deigned to notice his birth, his elevation, his character, or his death. Severus expired as soon as his life became inconvenient to his patron, and it would be useless to discriminate his nominal reign in the vacant interval of six years between the death of Majorian and the elevation of Anthemius. During that period, the government was in the hands of Ricimer alone, and although the modest barbarian disclaimed the name of a king, he accumulated treasures, formed a separate army, negotiated private alliances, and ruled Italy with the same independent and despotic authority which was afterwards exercised by Odoacer and Theodoric. But his dominions were bounded by the Alps, and two Roman generals, Marcellinus and Aegidius, maintained their alliance to the Republic by rejecting with disdain the phantom which he styled an emperor. Marcellinus still adhered to the old religion, and the devout pagans, who secretly disobeyed the laws of the church and state, applauded his profound skill in the science of divination. But he possessed the more valuable qualifications of learning, virtue, and courage. The study of the Latin literature had improved his taste, and his military talents had recommended him to the esteem and confidence of the great Aetius, in whose ruin he was involved. By a timely flight, Marcellinus escaped the rage of Valentinian, and boldly asserted his liberty amidst the convulsions of the Western Empire. His voluntary or reluctant submission to the authority of Majorian was rewarded by the government of Sicily and the command of an army stationed in that island to oppose or attack the Vandals. But his barbarian mercenaries, after the emperor's death, were tempted to revolt by the artful liberality of Ricimer. At the head of a band of faithful followers, the intrepid Marcellinus occupied the province of Dalmatia, assumed the title of Patrician of the West, secured the love of his subjects by a mild and equitable reign, built a fleet which claimed the domination of the Hadriatic, and alternately alarmed the coasts of Italy and Africa. Aegidius, the master general of Gaul, who equaled, or at least who imitated, the heroes of ancient Rome, proclaimed his immortal resentment against the assassins of his beloved master. A brave and numerous army was attached to his standard, and though he was prevented by the arts of Ricimer and the arms of the Visigoths from marching to the gates of Rome, he maintained his independent sovereignty beyond the Alps and rendered the name of Aegidius respectable both in peace and war. The Franks, who had punished with exile the youthful follies of Childeric, elected the Roman general for their king, his vanity rather than his ambition was gratified by that singular honor, and when the nation, at the end of four years, repented of the injury which they had offered to the Merovingian family, he patiently acquiesced in the restoration of the lawful prince. The authority of Aegidius ended only with his life, and the suspicions of poison and secret violence, which derived some countenance from the character of Ricimer, were eagerly entertained by the passionate credulity of the Gauls. The kingdom of Italy, a name to which the Western Empire was gradually reduced, was afflicted under the reign of Ricimer by the incessant depredations of Vandal pirates. In the spring of each year they equipped a formidable navy in the port of Carthage, and Genseric himself, though in a very advanced age, still commanded in person the most important expeditions. His designs were concealed with impenetrable secrecy till the moment that he hoisted sail, when he was asked by the pilot what course he should steer. Leave the determination to the winds, replied the barbarian with pious arrogance. They will transport us to the guilty coast on whose inhabitants have provoked the divine justice. But if Genseric himself deigned to issue more precise orders, he judged the most wealthy to be the most criminal. 
The Vandals repeatedly visited the coasts of Spain, Liguria, Tuscany, Campania, Lucania, Brutium, Apulia, Calabria, Venetia, Dalmatia, Epirus, Greece, and Sicily. They were tempted to subdue the island of Sardinia, so advantageously placed in the center of the Mediterranean, and their arms spread desolation or terror from the columns of Hercules to the mouth of the Nile. As they were more ambitious of spoil than of glory, they seldom attacked any fortified cities, or engaged any regular troops in an open field. But the celerity of their motions enabled them almost at the same time to threaten and to attack the most distant objects which attracted their desires, and as soon as they had embarked a sufficient number of horses, they no sooner landed than they swept the dismayed country with a body of light cavalry. Yet, notwithstanding the example of their king, the native Vandals and Alani insensibly declined this toilsome and perilous warfare. The hardy generation of the first conquerors was almost extinguished, and their sons, who were born in Africa, enjoyed the delicious baths and gardens which had been acquired by the valor of their fathers. Their place was readily supplied by a various multitude of Moors and Romans, of captives and outlaws, and those desperate wretches, who had already violated the laws of their country, were the most eager to promote the atrocious acts which disgraced the victories of Genseric. In the treatment of his unhappy prisoners, he sometimes consulted his avarice, and sometimes indulged his cruelty, and the massacre of five hundred noble citizens of Zante, or Zaxinthus, whose mangled bodies he cast into the Ionian Sea, was imputed by the public indignation to his latest posterity. Such crimes would not be excused by any provocations, but the war which the king of the Vandals prosecuted against the Roman Empire was justified by a specious and reasonable motive. The widow of Valentinian, Eudoxia, whom he had led captive from Rome to Carthage, was the sole heiress of the Theodosian house. Her eldest daughter, Eudoxia, became the reluctant wife of Huneric, his eldest son, and the stern father asserted a legal claim which could not be easily refuted or satisfied, demanded a just proportion of the imperial patrimony. An adequate, or at least a valuable, compensation was offered by the eastern emperor to purchase a necessary peace. Eudoxia and her younger daughter, Placidia, were honorably restored, and the fury of the Vandals was confined to the limits of the western empire. The Italians, destitute of a naval force, which alone was capable of protecting their coasts, implored the aid of the more fortunate nations of the East, who had formerly acknowledged in peace and war the supremacy of Rome. But the perpetual division of two empires had alienated their interest and their inclinations. The faith of a recent treaty was alleged, and the Western Romans, instead of arms and ships, could only obtain the assistance of a cold and ineffectual mediation. The haughty Ricimer, who had long struggled with the difficulties of his situation, was at length reduced to address the throne of Constantinople in a humble language of a subject, and Italy submitted, as the price and security of the alliance, to accept a master from the choice of the emperor of the East. It is not the purpose of the present chapter, or even of the present volume, to continue the distinct series of the Byzantine history, but a concise view of the reign and character of the emperor Leo may explain the last efforts that were attempted to save the falling empire of the West. Since the death of the younger Theodosius, the domestic repose of Constantinople had never been interrupted by war or faction. Pulcheria had bestowed her hand and the scepter of the East on the modest virtue of Marcion. He gratefully reverenced her august rank and virgin chastity, and after her death he gave his people the example of the religious worship that was due to the memory of the imperial saint. Attentive to the prosperity of his own dominions, Marcion seemed to behold with indifference the misfortunes of Rome, and the obstinate refusal of a brave and active prince to draw his sword against the Vandals was ascribed to a secret promise which had formerly been exacted from him when he was a captive in the power of Genseric. The death of Marcion, after a reign of seven years, would have exposed the East to the danger of a popular election if the superior weight of a single family had not been able to incline the balance in favor of a candidate whose interests they supported. The patrician Aspar might have placed the diadem on his own head if he would have submitted to the Nicene Creed. During three generations the armies of the East were successfully commanded by his father, himself, and by his son, Artaborius. 
his barbarian guards formed a military force that overawed the palace and the capital, and the liberal distribution of his immense treasures rendered Aspar as popular as he was powerful. He recommended the obscure name of Leo of Thrace, a military tribune, and the principal steward of his household. His nomination was unanimously ratified by the Senate, and the servant of Aspar received the imperial crown from the hands of the patriarch, or bishop, who was permitted to express, by this unusual ceremony, the suffrage of the deity. This emperor, the first of the name of Leo, has been distinguished by the title of the Great, from a succession of princes who gradually fixed, in the opinion of the Greeks, a very humble standard of heroic, or at least of royal perfection. Yet the temperate firmness with which Leo resisted the oppression of his benefactor showed that he was conscious of his duty and of his prerogative. Aspar was astounded to find that his influence could no longer appoint a prefect of Constantinople. He presumed to reproach his sovereign with a breach of promise, and, insolently shaking his purple, It is not proper, said he, that the man who is invested with this garment should be guilty of lying. Nor is it proper, replied Leo, that a prince should be compelled to resign his own judgment and the public interest to the will of a subject. After this extraordinary scene, it was impossible that the reconciliation of the emperor and the patrician could be sincere, or at least that it could be solid and permanent. An army of Isaurians was secretly levied and introduced into Constantinople, and while Leo undermined the authority and prepared the disgrace of the family of Aspar, his mild and cautious behavior restrained them from any rash and desperate attempts, which might have been fatal to themselves or to their enemies, and the measures of peace and war were affected by this internal revolution. As long as Aspar degraded the majesty of the throne, the secret correspondence of religion and interest engaged him to favor the cause of Genseric. When Leo had delivered himself from that ignominious servitude, he listened to the complaints of the Italians, resolved to extirpate the tyranny of the Vandals, and declared his alliance with his colleague Anthemius, whom he solemnly invested with the diadem and purple of the West. The virtues of Anthemius have perhaps been magnified, since the imperial descent, which he could only deduce from the usurper Procopius, has been swelled into a line of emperors. But the merit of his immediate parents, their honors, and their riches, rendered Athemius as one of the most illustrious subjects of the East. His father, Procopius, obtained, after his Persian embassy, the rank of general and patrician, and the name of Anthemius was derived from his maternal grandfather, the celebrated prefect who protected, with so much ability and success, the infant reign of Theodosius. The grandson of the prefect was raised above the condition of a private subject by his marriage with Euphemia, the daughter of the emperor Marcion. This splendid alliance, which might supersede the necessity of merit, hastened the promotion of Anthemius to the successive dignities of count, of master general, of consul, and of patrician. And his merit, or his fortune, claimed the honors of a victory which was obtained on the banks of the Danube over the Huns. Without indulging in extravagant ambition, the son-in-law of Marcion might hope to be a successor. But Anthemius supported the disappointment with courage and patience, and his subsequent elevation was universally approved by the public who esteemed him worthy to reign till he ascended the throne. The Emperor of the West marched from Constantinople, attended by several counts of high distinction, and a body of guards almost equal to the strength and numbers of a regular army. He entered Rome in triumph, and the choice of Leo was confirmed by the Senate, the people, and the barbarian confederates of Italy. The solemn inauguration of Anthemius was followed by the nuptials of his daughter and the patrician Ricimer, a fortunate event which was considered as the firmest security of the union and happiness of the state. The wealth of two empires was ostentatiously displayed, and many senators completed their ruin by an expensive effort to disguise their poverty. All serious business was suspended during this festival. The courts of justice were shut. The streets of Rome, the theaters, the places of public and private resort resounded with hymeneal songs and dances, and the royal bride, clothed in silken robes, with a crown on her head, was conducted to the palace of Ricimer who had changed his military dress for the habit of a consul and a senator. On this memorable occasion, Sidonius, whose early ambition had been so fatally blasted, appeared as the orator of Auvergne, amidst the provincial deputies who addressed the throne with congratulations or complaints. 
The calends of January were now approaching, and the venal poet, who had loved Avitus and esteemed Majorian, was persuaded by his friends to celebrate, in heroic verse, the merit, the felicity, the second consulship, and the future triumphs of the emperor Anthemius. Sidonius pronounced, with assurance and success, a panegyric which is still extant, and whatever might be the imperfections, either of the subject or of the composition, the welcome flatterer was immediately rewarded with the prefecture of Rome, a dignity which placed him among the illustrious personages of the empire, till he wisely preferred the more respectable character of a bishop and a saint. The Greeks ambitiously commend the piety and Catholic faith of the emperor whom they gave to the West, nor do they forget to observe that, when he left Constantinople, he converted his palace into a pious foundation of a public bath, a church, and a hospital for old men. Yet some suspicious appearances are found to sully the theological fame of Anthemius. From the conversation of Philotheus, a Macedonian sectary, he had imbibed the spirit of religious toleration, and the heretics of Rome would have assembled with impunity if the bold and vehement censure which Pope Hilary pronounced in the Church of St. Peter had not obliged him to abjure the unpopular indulgence. Even the pagans, a feeble and obscure remnant, conceived some vain hopes from the indifference or partiality of Anthemius, and his singular friendship for the philosopher Severus, whom he promoted to the consulship, was ascribed to a secret project of reviving the ancient worship of the gods. These idols were crumbled in the dust, and the mythology which had once been the creed of nations was so universally disbelieved that it might be employed without scandal, or at least without suspicion, by Christian poets. Yet the vestiges of superstition were not absolutely obliterated, and the festival of the Lupercalia, whose origin had preceded the foundation of Rome, was still celebrated under the reign of Anthemius. The savage and simple rites were expressive of an early state of society, before the invention of arts and agriculture. The rustic deities who presided over the toils and pleasures of the pastoral life, Pan, Faunus, and their train of satyrs, were such as the fancy of shepherds might create, sportive, petulant, and lascivious, whose power was limited and whose malice was inoffensive. A goat was the offering best adapted to their character and attributes. The flesh of the victim was roasted on willow spits, and the riotous youths who crowded to the feast ran naked about the fields, with leather thongs in their hands, communicating, as it was supposed, the blessing of fecundity to the women whom they touched. The altar of Pan was erected, perhaps by Evander the Arcadian, in the dark recess in the side of the Palatine Hill, watered by a perpetual fountain and shaded by a hanging grove. A tradition that, in the same place, Romulus and Remus were suckled by the wolf, rendered it still more sacred and venerable in the eyes of the Romans, and this sylvan spot was gradually surrounded by the stately edifices of the Forum. After the conversion of the imperial city, the Christians still continued, in the month of February, the annual celebration of the Lupercalia, to which they ascribed a secret and mysterious influence on the genial powers of the animal and vegetable world. The bishops of Rome were solicitous to abolish a profane custom so repugnant to the spirit of Christianity. But their zeal was not supported by the authority of the civil magistrate. The inveterate abuse subsisted till the end of the 5th century, and the Pope Galasius, who purified the capital from the last stain of idolatry, appeased, by a formal apology, the murmurs of the Senate and people. In all his public declarations, the Emperor Leo assumes the authority and professes the affection of a father for his son, Anthemius, with whom he had divided the administration of the universe. The situation, and perhaps the character of Leo, dissuaded him from exposing his person to the toils and dangers of an African war. But the powers of the Eastern Empire were strenuously exerted to deliver Italy and the Mediterranean from the Vandals, and Genseric, who had so long oppressed both the land and sea, was threatened from every side with a formidable invasion. The campaign was opened by a bold and successful enterprise by the prefect Heraclius. The troops of Egypt, Thebius, and Libya were embarked under his command, and the Arabs, with a train of horses and camels, opened the roads of the desert. Heraclius landed on the coast of Tripoli, surprised and subdued the cities of that province, and prepared, by a laborious march, which Cato had formerly executed, 
to join the imperial army under the walls of Carthage. The intelligence of this loss extorted from Genseric some insidious and ineffectual propositions of peace, but he was still more seriously alarmed by the reconciliation of Marcellinus with the two empires. The independent patrician had been persuaded to acknowledge the legitimate title of Anthemius, whom he accompanied in his journey to Rome. The Dalmatian fleet was received into the harbors of Italy. The active valor of Marcellinus expelled the Vandals from the island of Sardinia, and the languid efforts of the West added some weight to the immense preparations of the Eastern Romans. The expense of the naval armament which Leo sent against the Vandals has been distinctly ascertained, and the curious and instructive account displays the wealth of the declining empire. The royal demesnes, or private patrimony of the prince, supplied 17,000 pounds of gold. 47,000 pounds of gold and 700,000 of silver were levied and paid into the treasury by the praetorian prefects, but the cities were reduced to extreme poverty, and the diligent calculation of fines and forfeitures, as a valuable object of the revenue, does not suggest the idea of a just or a merciful administration. The whole expense, by whatsoever means it was defrayed, of the African campaign amounted to the sum of 130,000 pounds of gold, about five millions two hundred thousand pounds sterling, at a time when the value of money appears from the comparative price of corn to have been somewhat higher than in the present age. The fleet that sailed from Constantinople to Carthage consisted of eleven 1 hundred and thirteen ships, and the number of soldiers and marines exceeded one hundred thousand men. Basiliscus, the brother of the Empress Verina, was entrusted with this important command. His sister, the wife of Leo, had exaggerated the merit of his former exploits against the Scythians, but the discovery of his guilt or incapacity was reserved for the African war, and his friends could only save his military reputation by asserting that he had conspired with Aspar to spare Genseric and to betray the last hope of the Western Empire. Experience has shown that success of an invader most commonly depends on the vigor and celerity of his operations. The strength and sharpness of the first impressions are blunted by delay. The health and spirit of the troops are insensibly languished on a, in a distant climate. The naval and military force, a mighty effort which perhaps can never be repeated, is silently consumed, and every hour which is wasted in negotiation accustoms the enemy to contemplate and examine those hostile terrors which, on their first appearance, he deemed irresistible. The formidable navy of Basiliscus pursued its prosperous navigation from the Thracian Bosphorus to the coasts of Africa. He landed his troops at Cape Bona, or the Promontory of Mercury, about forty miles from Carthage. The army of Heraclius and the fleet of Marcellinus either joined or seconded the imperial lieutenant, and the Vandals who opposed his progress by sea or by land were successively vanquished. If Basiliscus had seized the moment of consternation and boldly advanced to the capital, Carthage must have surrendered and the kingdom of the Vandals was extinguished. Genseric beheld the danger with firmness, and eluded it with his veteran dexterity. He protested, in the most respectful language, that he was ready to submit his person and his dominions to the will of the emperor. But he requested a truce of five days to regulate the terms of his submission, and it was universally believed that his secret liberality contributed to the success of this public negotiation. Instead of obstinately refusing whatever indulgence his enemy so earnestly solicited, the guilty or the credulous Basiliscus consented to the fatal truce, and his imprudent security seemed to proclaim that he already considered himself as the conqueror of Africa. During this short interval the wind became favorable to the designs of Genseric. He manned his largest ships of war with the bravest of Moors and Vandals, and they towed after many of them many barks filled with combustible materials. In the obscurity of the night, these destructive vessels were impelled against the unguarded and unsuspecting fleet of the Romans, who were awakened by the sense of their instant danger. Their close and crowded order assisted the progress of the fire, which was communicated with rapid and irresistible violence, and the noise of the wind, the crackling of the flames, and the dissonant cries of the soldiers and mariners, who could neither command nor obey, increased the horror of the nocturnal tumult. Whilst they labored to extricate themselves from the fire ships and to save at least a part of the navy, the galleys of Genseric assaulted them with temperate and disciplined valor, and many of the Romans, who had escaped the fury of the flames, 
were destroyed or taken by the victorious Vandals. Among the events of that disastrous night, the heroic, or rather desperate, courage of John, one of the principal officers of Basiliscus, has rescued his name from oblivion. When the ship which he had bravely defended was almost consumed, he threw himself in his armor into the sea, disdainfully rejected the esteem and pity of Genso, the son of Genseric, who pressed him to accept honorable quarter, and sunk under the waves, exclaiming, with his last breath, that he would never fall alive into the hands of those impious dogs. Actuated by a far different spirit, Basiliscus, whose station was the most remote from danger, disgracefully fled in the beginning of the engagement, returned to Constantinople with the loss of more than half of his fleet and army, and sheltered his guilty head in the sanctuary of St. Sophia, till his sister, by her tears and entreaties, could obtain his pardon from the indignant emperor. Heraclius effected his retreat through the desert. Marcellinus returned to Sicily, where he was assassinated, perhaps at the instigation of Ricimer, by one of his own captains, and the king of the Vandals expressed his surprise and satisfaction that the Romans themselves should remove from the world his most formidable antagonists. After the failure of this great expedition, Genseric again became the tyrant of the sea. The coasts of Italy, Greece, and Asia were again exposed to his revenge and avarice. Tripoli and Sardinia returned to his obedience, and he added Sicily to the number of his provinces, and before he died, in the fullness of years and of glory, he beheld the final extinction of the empire of the West. During his long and active reign, the African monarch had studiously cultivated the friendship of the barbarians of Europe, whose arms he might employ in a seasonable and effectual diversion against the two empires. After the death of Attila, he renewed his alliance with the Visigoths of Gaul, and the sons of the elder Theodoric, who successfully reigned over that warlike nation, were easily persuaded by the sense of interest to forget the cruel affront which Genseric had inflicted on their sister. The death of the emperor Majorian delivered Theodoric II from the restraint of fear, and perhaps of honor. He violated his recent treaty with the Romans, and the ample territory of Norbonne, which he firmly united to his dominions, became the immediate reward of his perfidy. The selfish policy of Ricimer encouraged him to invade the provinces, which were in the possession of Aegidius, his rival. But the active count, by the defense of Arles and the victory of Orléans, saved Gaul and checked during his lifetime the progress of the Visigoths. Their ambition was soon rekindled, and the design of extinguishing the Roman Empire in Spain and Gaul was conceived and almost completed in the reign of Euric, who assassinated his brother Theodoric and displayed in a more savage temper, superior abilities both in peace and war. He passed the Pyrenees at the head of a numerous army, subdued the cities of Saragossa and Pampeluna, vanquished in battle the martial nobles of the Tarragonese province, carried his victorious arms into the heart of Lusitania, and permitted the Suevi to hold the kingdom of Galicia under the Gothic monarchy of Spain. The efforts of Euric were not less vigorous or successful in Gaul, and throughout the country, that extends from the Pyrenees to the Rhone and the Loire, Berry and Avignon were the only cities or dioceses which refused to acknowledge him as their master. In the defense of Clermont, their principal town, the inhabitants of Auvergne sustained with inflexible resolution the miseries of war, pestilence, and famine, and the Visigoths, relinquishing the fruitless siege, suspended the hopes of that important conquest. The youth of the province were animated by the heroic and almost incredible youth of Aedictius, the son of the emperor Avitus, who made a desperate sally with only eighteen horsemen, boldly attacked the Gothic army, and after maintaining a flying skirmish, retired safe and victorious within the walls of Clermont. His charity was equal to his courage. In a time of extreme scarcity, four thousand poor were fed at his expense, and his private influence levied an army of Burgundians for the deliverance of Auvergne. From his victories alone, the faithful citizens of Gaul derived any hope of safety or freedom, and even such virtues were insufficient to avert the impending ruin of their country, since they were anxious to learn, from his authority and example, whether they should prefer the alternative of exile or servitude. The public confidence was lost, and the resources of the state were exhausted, and the Gauls had too much reason to believe that Anthemius, who resigned in Italy, was incapable of protecting his distressed subjects beyond the Alps. 
the feeble emperor could only procure for their defense the service of 12,000 British auxiliaries. Rio Thamus, one of the independent kings or chieftains of the island, was persuaded to transport his troops to the continent of Gaul. He sailed up the Loire and established his quarters in Berry, where the people complained of these oppressive allies till they were destroyed or dispersed by the arms of the Visigoths. One of the last acts of jurisdiction which the Roman Senate exercised over their subjects of Gaul was the trial and condemnation of Avandus, the praetorian prefect. Sidonius, who rejoices that he lived under a reign in which he might pity and assist a state criminal, has expressed with tenderness and freedom the faults of his indiscreet and unfortunate friend. From the perils which he had escaped, Arvandus imbibed confidence rather than wisdom, and such was the various though uniform imprudence of his behavior, that his prosperity must appear much more surprising than his downfall. The second prefecture which he obtained within the term of five years abolished the merit and popularity of his preceding administration. His easy temper was corrupted by flattery and exasperated by opposition. He was forced to satisfy his importunate creditors with the spoils of the province. His capricious insolence offended the nobles of Gaul, and he sunk under the weight of the public hatred. The mandate of his disgrace summoned him to justify his conduct before the Senate, and he passed the Sea of Tuscany with a favorable wind, the presage, as he vainly imagined, of his future fortunes. A decent respect was still observed for the praetorian rank, and on his arrival at Rome, Arvandus was committed to the hospitality rather than to the custody of Flavius Acellus, the count of the sacred largesse who resided in the capital. He was eagerly pursued by his accusers, the four deputies of Gaul, who were all distinguished by their birth, their dignities, or their eloquence. In the name of a great province, and according to the forms of Roman jurisprudence, they instituted a civil and criminal action requiring such restitution as might compensate the losses of individuals, and such punishments as might satisfy the justice of the state. Their charges of corrupt oppression were numerous and weighty, but they placed their secret dependence on a letter which they had intercepted, and which they could prove, by the evidence of a secretary, to have been dictated by Arvandus himself. The author of this letter seemed to dissuade the king of the Goths from a peace with the Greek emperor, he suggested the attack of the Britons on the Loire, and he recommended a division of Gaul according to the law of nations between the Visigoths and the Burgundians. These pernicious schemes, which a friend could only palliate by the reproaches of vanity and indiscretion, were susceptible of a treasonable interpretation, and the deputies had artly resolved not to produce their most formidable weapons till the decisive moment of the conquest. But their intentions were discovered by the zeal of Sidonius, he immediately apprised the unsuspecting criminal of his danger, and sincerely lamented, without any mixture of anger, the haughty presumption of Arvandus, who rejected and even resented the salutary advice of his friends. Ignorant of his real situation, Arvandus showed himself in the capital in the white robe of a candidate, accepted indiscriminate salutations and offers of service, examined the shops of the merchants, the silks and gems, sometimes with the indifference of a spectator, and sometimes with the intention of a purchaser, and complained of the times, of the senate, and of the prince, and of the delays of justice. His complaints were soon removed. An early day was fixed for his trial, and Arvandus appeared with his accusers before a numerous assembly of the Roman senate. The mournful garb which they affected excited the compassion of the judges, and they were scandalized by the gay and splendid dress of their adversary, and when the prefect Arvandus, with the first of the Gallic deputies, was directed to take their places on the senatorial benches, the same contrast of pride and modesty was observed in their behavior. In this memorable judgment, which presented a lively image of the old republic, the Gauls exposed with force and freedom the grievances of the province, and as soon as the minds of the audience were sufficiently inflamed, they recited the fatal epistle. The obstinacy of Arvandus was founded on the strange supposition that a subject could not be convicted of treason unless he had actually conspired to assume the purple. As the paper was read, he repeatedly and with a loud voice acknowledged it for his genuine composition, and his astonishment was equal to his dismay when the unanimous voice of the Senate declared him guilty of a capital offense. By their decree, 
he was degraded from the rank of a prefect to the obscure condition of a plebeian, and ignominiously dragged by servile hands to the public prison. After a fortnight's adjournment, the Senate was again convened to pronounce the sentence of his death. But while he expected, in the island of Aesculapius, the expiration of the thirty days allowed by an ancient law to the vilest malefactors, his friends interposed, the emperor Anthemius relented, and the prefect of Gaul obtained the milder punishment of exile and confiscation. The faults of Arvandus might deserve compassion, but the impunity of Serenitus accused the justice of the Republic, till he was condemned and executed on the complaint of the people of Auvergne. That flagitious minister, the Catiline of his age and country, held a secret correspondence with the Visigoths to betray the province which he oppressed. His industry was continually exercised by the discovery of new taxes and obsolete offenses, and his extravagant vices would have inspired contempt if they had not excited fear and abhorrence. Such criminals were not beyond the reach of justice, but whatever might be the fault of Ricimer, that powerful barbarian was able to contend or to negotiate with the prince whose alliance he had condescended to accept. The peaceful and prosperous reign which Anthemius had promised to the West was soon clouded by misfortune and discord. Ricimer, apprehensive or impatient of a superior, retired from Rome and fixed his residence at Milan, an advantageous situation either to invite or to repel the warlike tribes which were seated beyond the Alps and the Danube. Italy was gradually divided between two independent and hostile kingdoms, and the nobles of Liguria, who trembled at the near approach of a civil war, fell prostrate to the feet of the patrician, and conjured him to spare their unhappy country. For my own part, replied Ricimer, in a tone of insolent moderation, I am still inclined to embrace the friendship of the Galatian. But who will undertake to appease his anger or to mitigate the pride which always rises in proportion to our submission? They informed him that Epiphanius, bishop of Pavia, united the wisdom of the serpent with the innocence of the dove, and appeared confident that the eloquence of such an ambassador might prevail against the strongest opposition either of interest or passion. The recommendation was improved, and Epiphanius, assuming the benevolent office of mediation, proceeded without delay to Rome, where he was received with the honors due to his merit and reputation. The oration of a bishop in favor of peace might be easily supposed. He argued that, in all possible circumstances, the forgiveness of injuries must be an act of mercy, or magnanimity, or prudence, and he seriously admonished the emperor to avoid a contest with a fierce barbarian, which might be fatal to himself, and must be ruinous to his dominions. Anthemius acknowledged the truth of his maxims, but he deeply felt, with grief and indignation, the behavior of Ricimer, and his passion gave eloquence and energy to his discourse. What favors, he warmly exclaimed, have we refused to this ungrateful man? What provocations have we not endured? Regardless of the majesty of the purple, I gave my daughter to a goth. I sacrificed my own blood to the safety of the republic. The liberality which ought to have secured the internal attachment of Ricimer has exasperated him against his benefactor. What wars has he not excited against the empire? How often has he instigated and assisted the fury of it hostile nations? Shall I now accept his perfidious friendship? Can I hope that he will respect the engagements of a treaty, who has already violated the duties of a son? But the anger of Anthemius evaporated in these passionate exclamations. He insensibly yielded to the proposals of Epiphanius, and the bishop returned to his diocese, with the satisfaction of restoring the peace of Italy by a reconciliation, of which the sincerity and continuance might be reasonably suspected. The clemency of the emperor was extorted from his weakness, and Ricimer suspended his ambitious designs till he had secretly prepared the engines, with which he resolved to subvert the throne of Anthemius. The mask of peace and moderation was then thrown aside. The army of Ricimer was fortified by a numerous reinforcement of Burgundians and Oriental Suevi. He disclaimed all allegiance to the Greek emperor, marched from Milan to the gates of Rome, and, fixing his camp on the banks of the Anio, impatiently expected the arrival of Olibrius, his imperial candidate. The senator Olibrius, of the Ancian family, might esteem himself the lawful heir of the Western Empire. He had married Placidia, the younger daughter of Valentinian, 
after she was restored by Genseric, who still detained her sister Eudocia as the wife, or rather as the captive of his son. The king of the Vandals supported, by threats and solicitations, the fair pretensions of his Roman ally, and assigned, as one of the motives of the war, the refusal of the senate and people to acknowledge their lawful prince, and the unworthy preference what they had given to a stranger. The friendship of the public enemy might render Olibrius still more unpopular to the Italians, but when Ricimer mediated the ruin of the emperor Anthemius, he tempted, with the offer of a diadem, the candidate who could justify his rebellion by an illustrious name and a royal alliance. The husband of Placidia, who, like most of his ancestors, had been invested with the consular dignity, might have continued to enjoy a secure and splendid fortune in the peaceful residence of Constantinople, nor does he appear to have been tormented by such a genius as cannot be amused or occupied unless by the administration of an empire. Yet Olibrius yielded to the importunities of his friends, perhaps of his wife, rashly plunged into the dangers and calamities of a civil war, and with the secret connivance of the Emperor Leo, accepted the Italian purple, which was bestowed and resumed at the capricious will of a barbarian. He landed without obstacle, for Genseric was the master of the sea, either at Ravenna or the port of Ostia, and immediately proceeded to the camp of Ricimer, where he was received as the sovereign of the western world. The patrician, who had extended his posts from the Anio to the Milvian Bridge, already possessed two quarters of Rome, the Vatican, and the Janiculum, which are separated by the Tiber from the rest of the city, and it may be conjectured that an assembly of seceding senators imitated, in the choice of Olibrius, the forms of a legal election. But the body of the Senate and people firmly adhered to the cause of Anthemius, and the more effectual support of a Gothic army enabled him to prolong his reign and the public distress by a resistance of three months, which produced the concomitant evils of famine and pestilence. At length Ricimer made a furious assault on the bridge of Hadrian, or Sant Angelo, and the narrow pass was defended with equal valor by the Goths till the death of Gilimir, their leader. The victorious troops, breaking down every barrier, rushed with irresistible violence into the heart of the city, and Rome, if we may use the language of a contemporary pope, was subverted by the civil fury of Anthemius and Ricimer. The unfortunate Anthemius was dragged from his concealment and inhumanly massacred by the command of his son-in-law, who thus added a third, or perhaps a fourth, emperor to the number of his victims. The soldiers who united the rage of factious citizens with the savage manners of barbarians were indulged without control in the license of rapine and murder. The crowd of slaves and plebeians, who were unconcerned in the event, could only gain by the indiscriminate pillage, and the face of the city exhibited the strange contrast of stern cruelty and dissolute intemperance. Forty days after this calamitous event, the subject not of glory but of guilt, Italy was delivered by a painful disease from the tyrant Ricimer, who bequeathed the command of his army to his nephew, Gundobald, one of the princes of the Burgundians. In the same year, all the principal actors in this great revolution were removed from the stage, and the whole reign of Olibrius, whose death does not betray any symptoms of violence, is included within the term of seven months. He left one daughter, the offspring of his marriage with Placidia, and the family of the great Theodosius, transplanted from Spain to Constantinople, was propagated in the female line as far as the eighth generation. Whilst the vacant throne of Italy was abandoned to lawless barbarians, the election of a new colleague was seriously agitated in the council of Leo. The empress Verena, studious to promote the greatness of her own family, had married one of her nieces to Julius Nepos, who succeeded his uncle Marcellinus in the sovereignty of Dalmatia, a more solid possession than the title which he was persuaded to accept of Emperor of the West. But the measures of the Byzantine court were so languid and irresolute that many months elapsed after the death of Anthemius, and even of Olibrius, before their destined successor can show himself with a respectable force to his Italian subjects. During that interval, Glycarius, an obscure soldier, was invested with the purple by his patron Gundobald, but the Burgundian prince was unable or unwilling to support his nomination by a civil war. The pursuits of domestic ambition recalled him beyond the Alps, and his client was permitted to exchange the Roman scepter for the bishopric of Salona. After extinguishing such a competitor, 
the emperor Nepos was acknowledged by the senate and the Italians and by the provincials of Gaul. His moral virtues and military talents were loudly celebrated, and those who derived any private benefit from his government announced in prophetic strains the restoration of the public felicity. Their hopes, if such hopes had been entertained, were confounded within the term of a single year, and the treaty of peace, which ceded Auvergne to the Visigoths, is the only event of his short and inglorious reign. The most faithful subjects of Gaul were sacrificed by the Italian emperor to the hopes of domestic security, but his repose was soon invaded by a furious sedition of the barbarian confederates, who, under the command of Orestes, their general, were in full march from Rome to Ravenna. Nepos trembled at their approach, and instead of placing a just confidence in the strength of Ravenna, he hastily escaped to his ships and retired to his Dalmatian principality on the opposite coast of the Hadriatic. By this shameful abdication, he protracted his life about five years, in a very ambiguous state between an emperor and an exile, till he was assassinated at Salona by the ungrateful Glycarius, who was translated, perhaps as the reward of his crime, to the archbishopric of Milan. The nations who had asserted their independence after the death of Attila were established by the right of possession or conquest in the boundless countries to the north of the Danube, or in the Roman provinces between the river and the Alps. But the bravest of their youth enlisted in the army of confederates, who formed the defense and the terror of Italy. And in this curious multitude, the names of the Heruli, the Scyri, the Alani, the Tucurlingi, and the Rugians appear to have predominated. The example of these warriors was imitated by Orestes, the son of Tatulus, and the father of the last Roman emperor of the West. Orestes, who had already been mentioned in this history, had never deserted his country. His birth and fortunes rendered him one of the most illustrious subjects of Pannonia. When that province was ceded to the Huns, he entered into the service of Attila, his lawful sovereign, obtained the office of his secretary, and was repeatedly sent ambassador to Constantinople to represent the person and signify the commands of the imperious monarch. The death of that conqueror restored him to his freedom, and Orestes might honorably refuse either to follow the sons of Attila into the Scythian desert, or to obey the Ostrogoths, who had usurped the dominion of Pannonia. He preferred the service of the Italian princes, the successors of Valentinian, and as he possessed the qualifications of courage, industry, and experience, he advanced with rapid steps in the military profession, till he was elevated, by the favor of Nepos himself, to the dignities of patrician and master general of the troops. These troops had been long accustomed to reverence the character and authority of Orestes, who affected their manners, conversed with them in their own language, and was intimately connected with their national chieftains by long habits of familiarity and friendship. At his solicitation they rose in arms against the obscure Greek who presumed to claim their obedience, and when Orestes, from some secret motive, declined the purple, they consented, with the same faculty, to acknowledge his son, Augustulus, as the emperor of the West. By the abdication of Nepos, Orestes had now obtained the summit of his ambitious hopes, but he soon discovered, before the end of the first year, that the lessons of perjury and ingratitude which a rebel must inculcate will be retorted against himself, and that the precarious sovereign of Italy was only permitted to choose whether he would be the slave or the victim of his barbarian mercenaries. The dangerous alliance of those strangers had oppressed and insulted the last remains of Roman freedom and dignity. At each revolution their pay and privileges were augmented, but their insolence increased in a still more extravagant degree. They envied the fortune of their brethren in Gaul, Spain, and Africa, whose victorious arms had acquired an independent and perpetual inheritance, and they insisted on their peremptory demand that a third part of the lands of Italy should be immediately divided among them. Orestes, with a spirit which, in another situation, might be entitled to our esteem, chose rather to encounter the rage of an armed multitude than to subscribe the ruin of an innocent people. He rejected the audacious demand, and his refusal was favorable to the ambition of Odoacer, a bold barbarian, who assured his fellow soldiers that, if they dared to associate under his command, they might soon extort the justice which had been denied to their dutiful petitions. From all the camps and garrisons of Italy, the confederates, actuated by the same resentment and the same hopes, 
impatiently flocked to the standard of this popular leader, and the unfortunate patrician, overwhelmed by the torrent, hastily retreated to the strong city of Pavia, the episcopal seat of the holy Epiphantes. Pavia was immediately besieged, the fortifications were stormed, the town was pillaged, and although the bishop might labor, with much zeal and some success, to save the property of the church and the chastity of the female captives, the tumult could only be appeased by the execution of Orestes. His brother Paul was slain in an action near Ravenna, and the helpless Augustulus, who could no longer command the respect, was reduced to implore the clemency of Indoecher. That successful barbarian was the son of Edicon, who, in some remarkable transactions, particularly described in a preceding chapter, had been the colleague of Orestes himself. The honor of an ambassador should be exempt from suspicion, and Edicon had listened to a conspiracy against the life of his sovereign. But this apparent guilt was expiated by his merit or repentance. His rank was eminent and conspicuous. He enjoyed the favor of Attila, and the troops under his command, who guarded in their turn the royal village, consisted of a tribe of the Skiri, his immediate and hereditary subjects. In the revolt of the nation, they still adhered to the Huns, and, more than twelve years afterwards, the name of Edicon is honorably mentioned in their unequal contest with the Ostrogoths, which was terminated after two bloody battles by the defeat and dispersion of the Skiri. Their gallant leader, who did not survive this national calamity, left two sons, Onulf and Odoacer, to struggle with adversity, and to maintain, as they might, by rapine or service, the faithful followers of their exile. Onulf directed his steps towards Constantinople, where he sullied, by the assassination of a generous benefactor, the fame which he had acquired in arms. His brother Odoacer had a wandering life among the barbarians of Noricum, with a mind and a fortune suited to the most desperate adventures, and when he fixed his choice, he piously visited the cell of Severinus, the popular saint of the country, to solicit his approbation and blessing. The lowness of the door would not admit the lofty stature of Odoacer. He was obliged to stoop, but in that humble attitude the saint could discern the symptoms of his future greatness, and addressing him in a prophetic tone, Pursue, said he, your design. Proceed to Italy. You will soon cast away this coarse garment of skins, and your wealth will be adequate to the liberality of your mind. The barbarian, whose daring spirit accepted and ratified the petition, was admitted into the service of the Western Empire, and soon obtained an honorable rank in the guards. His manners were gradually polished, his military skill was improved, and the confederates of Italy would not have elected him for their general unless the exploits of Odoacer had established a high opinion of his courage and capacity. Their military acclamations saluted him with the title of king, but he abstained during his whole reign from the use of the purple and diadem, lest he should offend those princes whose subjects, by their accidental mixture, had formed the victorious army which time and policy might insensibly unite into a great nation. Royalty was familiar to the barbarians, and the submissive people of Italy was prepared to obey, without a murmur, the authority which he should condescend to exercise as the vice-regent of the emperor of the West. But Odoacer had resolved to abolish that useless and expensive office, and such is the weight of antique prejudice that it required some boldness and penetration to discover the extreme faculty of the enterprise. The unfortunate Augustulus was made the instrument of his own disgrace. He signified his resignation to the Senate, and that assembly, in their last act of obedience to a Roman prince, still affected the spirit of freedom and the forms of the Constitution. An epistle was addressed, by their unanimous decree, to the Emperor Zeno, the son-in-law and successor of Leo, who had lately been restored after a short rebellion to the Byzantine throne. They solemnly disclaim the necessity, or even the wish, of continuing any longer the imperial secession in Italy, since, in their opinion, the majesty of a sole monarch is sufficient to pervade and protect, at the same time, both the East and West. In their own name, and in the name of the people, they consent that the seat of universal empire shall be transferred from Rome to Constantinople, and they basely renounced the right of choosing their master, the only vestige that yet remained of the authority which had given laws to the world. The Republic, they repeat that name without a blush, 
might safely confide in the civil and military virtues of Odoacer, and they humbly request that the emperor would invest him with the title of patrician and the administration of the diocese of Italy. The deputies of the Senate were received at Constantinople with some marks of displeasure and indignation, and when they were admitted to the audience of Zeno, he sternly reproached them with their treatment of the two emperors, Anthemius and Nepos, whom the East had successively granted to the prayers of Italy. The first, continued he, you have murdered. The second you have expelled. But the second is still alive, and whilst he lives, he is your lawful sovereign. But the prudent Zeno soon deserted the hopeless cause of his abdicated colleague. His vanity was gratified by the title of sole emperor, and by the statues erected to his honor in the several quarters of Rome. He entertained a friendly, though ambiguous, correspondent with the patrician Odoacer, and he gratefully accepted the imperial ensigns, the sacred ornaments of the throne and palace, which the barbarian was not unwilling to remove from the sight of the people. In the space of twenty years since the death of Valentinian, nine emperors had successively disappeared, and the son of Orestes, a youth recommended only by his beauty, would be the least entitled to the notice of posterity, if his reign, which was marked by the extinction of the Roman Empire in the West, did not leave a memorable era in the history of mankind. The patrician Orestes had married the daughter of Count Romulus of Petovio in Noricum. The name of Augustus, notwithstanding the jealousy of power, was known at Aquileia as a familiar surname, and the appellations of the two great founders of the city and of the monarchy were thus strangely united in the last of their successors. The son of Orestes assumed and disgraced the names of Romulus Augustus, but the first was corrupted into Momulus by the Greeks, and the second has been changed by the Latins into the contemptible diminutive Augustulus. The life of this inoffensive youth was spared by the generous clemency of Odoacer, who dismissed him with his whole family from the imperial palace, fixed his annual allowance at six thousand pieces of gold, and assigned the castle of Lucullus in Campania for the place of his exile or retirement. As soon as the Romans breathed from the toils of the Punic War, they were attracted by the beauties and the pleasures of Campania, and the country house of the elder Scipio and Laternium exhibited a lasting model of their rustic simplicity. The delicious shores of the Bay of Naples was crowded with villas, and Scylla applauded the masterly skill of his rival, who had seated himself on the lofty promontory of Misenum, that commands on every side the sea and land, as far as the boundaries of the horizon. The villa of Marius was purchased within a few years by Lucullus, and the price had increased from 2,500 to more than fourscore thousand pounds sterling. It was adorned by the new proprietor with Grecian arts and Asiatic treasures, and the houses and gardens of Lucullus obtained a distinguished rank in the list of imperial palaces. When the Vandals became formidable to the seacoast, the Lucullan villa on the promontory of Mycenaeum gradually assumed the strength and appellation of a strong castle, the obscure retreat of the last emperor of the West. About twenty years after that great revolution, it was converted into a church and monastery to receive the bones of St. Severinus. They secretly reposed, amidst the broken trophies of Kimbric and Armenian victories, till the beginning of the tenth century, when the fortifications which might afford a dangerous shelter to the Saracens were demolished by the people of Naples. Odoacer was the first barbarian who reigned in Italy, over a people who had once asserted their just superiority above the rest of mankind. The disgrace of the Romans still excites our respectful compassion, and we fondly sympathize with the imaginary grief and indignation of their degenerate posterity. But the calamities of Italy had gradually subdued the proud consciousness of freedom and glory. In the age of Roman virtue, the provinces were subject to the arms and the citizens to the laws of the Republic, till those laws were subverted by civil discord, and both the city and the provinces became the servile property of a tyrant. The forms of the Constitution, which alleviated or disguised their abject slavery, were abolished by time and violence. The Italians alternately lamented the presence or the absence of the sovereigns whom they detested or despised, and the secession of five centuries inflicted the various evils of military license, capricious despotism, and elaborate oppression. 
During the same period, the barbarians had emerged from obscurity and contempt, and the warriors of Germany and Scythia were introduced into the provinces as the servants, the allies, and at length the masters of the Romans, whom they insulted or protected. The hatred of the people was suppressed by fear. They respected the spirit and splendor of the martial chiefs who were invested with the honors of the empire, and the fate of Rome had long depended on the sword of those formidable strangers. The stern Ricimer, who trampled on the ruins of Italy, had exercised the power without assuming the title of a king, and the patient Romans were insensibly prepared to acknowledge the royalty of a Doerker and his barbaric successors. The king of Italy was not unworthy of the high station to which his valor and fortune had exalted him. His savage manners were polished by the habits of conversation, and he respected, though a conqueror and a barbarian, the institutions and even the prejudices of his subjects. After an interval of seven years, Odoacer restored the consulship of the West. For himself, he modestly or proudly declined an honor, which was still accepted by the emperors of the East. But the curial chair was successfully filled by eleven of the most illustrious senators, and the list is adorned by the respectful name of Basilus, whose virtues claim the friendship and the grateful applause of Sidonius, his client. The laws of the emperors were strictly enforced, and the civil administration of Italy was still exercised by the praetorian prefect and his subordinate officers. Odoacer devolved on the Roman magistrates the odious and oppressive task of collecting the public revenue, but he reserved for himself the merit of seasonable and popular indulgence. Like the rest of the barbarians, he had been instructed in the Arian heresy, but he revered the monastic and episcopal characters and the silence of the Catholics attest the toleration which they enjoyed. The peace of the city required the interposition of his prefect Basilus in the choice of a Roman pontiff. The decree which restrained the clergy from alienating their lands was ultimately designed for the benefit of the people, whose devotion would have been taxed to repair the dilapidations of the church. Italy was protected by the arms of its conqueror, and its frontiers were respected by the barbarians of Gaul and Germany who had so long insulted the feeble race of Theodosius. Odoacer passed the Hadriatic to chastise the assassins of the Emperor Nepos and to acquire the maritime province of Dalmatia. He passed the Alps to rescue the remains of Noricum from Fava, or Philetius, king of the Rugians, who had held his residence beyond the Danube. The king was vanquished in battle and led away a prisoner. A numerous colony of captives and subjects were transplanted into Italy. In Rome, after a long period of defeat and disgrace, might claim the triumph of her barbarian master. Notwithstanding the prudence and success of Odoacer, his kingdom exhibited the sad prospect of misery and desolation. Since the age of Tiberius, the decay of agriculture had been felt in Italy, and it was a just subject of complaint that the life of the Roman people depended on the accidents of the winds and waves. In the division and the decline of the empire, the tributary harvests of Egypt and Africa were withdrawn. The numbers of the inhabitants continually diminished with the means of subsistence, and the country was exhausted by the irretrievable losses of war, famine, and pestilence. St. Ambrose had deplored the ruin of a populous district, which had once adorned with the flourishing cities of Bologna, Modena, Regium, and Placentia. Pope Galasius was a subject of Odoacer, and he affirms with strong exaggeration, that in Emilia, Tuscany, and the adjacent provinces, the human species was almost extirpated. The plebeians of Rome, who were fed by the hand of their master, perished or disappeared as soon as his liberality was suppressed. The decline of the arts reduced the industrious mechanics to idleness and want, and the senators, who might support with patience the ruin of their country, bewailed their private loss of wealth and luxury. One third of those ample estates, to which the ruin of Italy is originally imputed, was extorted for the use of the conquerors. Injuries were aggravated by insults. The sense of actual sufferings was embittered by the fear of more dreadful evils. And as new lands were allotted to new swarms of barbarians, each senator was apprehensive lest the arbitrary surveyors should approach his favorite villa or his most profitable farm. The least unfortunate were those who submitted without a murmur to the power which it was impossible to resist. 
since they desired to live, they owed some gratitude to the tyrant who had spared their lives, and since he was the absolute master of their fortunes, the portion which he left must be accepted as his pure and voluntary gift. The distress of Italy was mitigated by the prudence and humanity of Odoacer, who had bound himself, as the price of his elevation, to satisfy the demands of a licentious and turbulent multitude. The kings of the barbarians were frequently resisted, deposed or murdered by their native subjects, and the various bands of Italian mercenaries, who associated under the banner of an elective general, claimed a larger privilege of freedom and rapine. A monarchy destitute of national union and hereditary right hastened to its dissolution. After a reign of fourteen years, Odoacer was oppressed by the superior genius of Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, a hero alike excellent in the arts of war and of government, who restored an age of peace and prosperity, and whose name still excites and deserves the attention of mankind. The indissoluble connection of civil and ecclesiastical affairs has compelled and encouraged me to relate the progress, the persecutions, the establishment, the divisions, the final triumph, and the gradual corruption of Christianity. I have purposely delayed the consideration of two religious events, interesting in the study of human nature, and important in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. First, the institution of the monastic life, and second, the conversion of the northern barbarians. Prosperity and peace introduced the distinction of the vulgar and the ascetic Christians. The loose and imperfect practice of religion satisfied the conscience of the multitude. The prince or magistrate, the soldier or merchant reconciled their fervent zeal and implicit faith with the exercise of their profession, the pursuit of their interest, and the indulgence of their passion. But the ascetics, who obeyed and abused the rigid precepts of the gospel, were inspired by the savage enthusiasm which represents man as a criminal, and God as a tyrant. They seriously renounced the business and the pleasures of the age, abjured the use of wine, flesh, and marriage, chastised their body, mortified their affections, and embraced a life of misery as the price of eternal happiness. In the reign of Constantine, the ascetics fled from a profane and degenerate world to perpetual solitude, or religious society. Like the first Christians of Jerusalem, they resigned the use or property of their temporal possessions, established regular communities of the same sex, and a similar disposition, and assumed the name of hermits, monks, and anchorites, expressive of their lonely retreat in a natural or artificial desert. They soon acquired the respect of the world which they despised, and the loudest applause was bestowed on this divine philosophy which surpassed, without the aid of science or reason, the laborious virtues of the Grecian schools. The monks might indeed contend with the Stoics in contempt of fortune, pain, and death. The Pythagorean silence and submission were revived in their servile discipline, and they disdained, as firmly as the cynics themselves, all the forms and decencies of civil society. But the votaries of this divine philosophy aspired to imitate a purer and more perfect model. They trod in the footsteps of the prophets, who had retired to the desert, and they restored the devout and contemplative life, which had been instituted by the Essenians in Palestine and Egypt. The philosophic eye of Pliny had surveyed with astonishment a solitary people, who dwelt among the palm trees near the Dead Sea, who subsisted without money, who were propagated without women, and who derived from the disgust and repentance of mankind a perpetual supply of voluntary associates. Egypt the fruitful parent of superstition, afforded the first example of monastic life. Antony, an illiterate youth of the lower parts of Thebes, distributed his patrimony, deserted his family and native home, and executed his monastic penance with original and intrepid fanaticism. After a long and painful novitiate among the tombs and in a ruined tower, he boldly advanced into the desert three days' journey to the eastward of the Nile, discovered a lonely spot which possessed the advantages of shade and water, and fixed his last residence on Mount Colson, near the Red Sea, where an ancient monastery still preserves the name and memory of the saint. The curious devotion of the Christians pursued him to the desert, and when he was obliged to appear at Alexandria, in the face of mankind he supported his fame with discretion and dignity. He enjoyed the friendship of Athanasius, whose doctrine he approved, and the Egyptian peasant respectfully declined a respectful invitation from the Emperor Constantine. The venerable patriarch, 
for Antony attained the age of one hundred and five years, beheld the numerous progeny which had been formed by his example and his lessons. The prolific colonies of monks multiplied with rapid increase on the sands of Libya, upon the rocks of Thebes, and in the cities of the Nile. To the south of Alexandria, the mountain and adjacent desert of Nitria were peopled by five thousand anchorets, and the and the traveller may still investigate the ruins of fifty monasteries, which were planted in that barren soil by the disciples of Antony. In the upper Thebes, the vacant island of Taban was occupied by Pacomius and fourteen hundred of his brethren. That holy abbot successively founded nine monasteries of men and one of women, and the festival of Easter sometimes collected fifty thousand religious persons who followed his angelic rule of discipline. The stately and populous city of Oxyrhynchus, the seat of Christian orthodoxy, had devoted the temples, the public edifices, and even the ramparts to pious and charitable uses, and the bishop, who might preach in twelve churches, computed ten thousand females and twenty thousand males of the monastic profession. The Egyptians, who gloried in this marvellous revolution, were disposed to hope and to believe that the number of monks was equal to the remainder of the people, and posterity might repeat the saying, which had been formerly applied to the sacred animals of the same country, that in Egypt it was less difficult to find a god than a man. <laughs> Athanasius introduced into Rome the knowledge and practice of the monastic life, and a school of this new philosophy was opened by the disciples of Antony, who accompanied their primate to the holy threshold of the Vatican. The strange and savage appearance of these Egyptians excited at first horror and contempt, and at length applause and zealous imitation. The senators, and more especially the matrons, transformed their palaces and villas into religious houses, and the narrow institution of six vestals was eclipsed by the frequent monasteries, which were seated on the ruins of ancient temples and in the midst of the Roman Forum. Inflamed by the example of Antony, a Syrian youth, whose name was Hilarion, fixed his dreary abode on a sandy beach, between the sea and Amoris, about seven miles from Gaza. The austere penance in which he persisted forty-eight years diffused a similar enthusiasm, and the holy man was followed by a train of two or three thousand anchorites, whenever he visited the innumerable monasteries of Palestine. The fame of Basil is immortal in the monastic history of the East. With a mind that had tasted the learning and eloquence of Athens, with an ambition scarcely to be satisfied with the archbishopric of Caesarea, Basil retired to a savage solitude in Pontus, and deigned for a while to give laws to the spiritual colonies which he profusely scattered along the coast of the Black Sea. In the west, Martin of Tours, a soldier, a hermit, a bishop, and a saint, established the monasteries of Gaul. Two thousand of his disciples followed him to the grave, and his eloquent historian challenges the deserts of Thebes to produce, in a more favorable climate, a champion of equal virtue. The progress of the monks was not less rapid or universal than that of Christianity itself. Every province, and at last every city of the empire, was filled with their increasing multitudes, and the bleak and barren isles from Lorenz to Lepari, that rose out of the Tuscan Sea, were chosen by the anchorites for the place of their voluntary exile. An easy and perpetual intercourse by sea and land connected the provinces of the Roman world, and the life of Hilarion displays the facility with which an indigent hermit of Palestine might traverse Egypt, embark for Sicily, escape to Epirus, and finally settle in the island of Cyprus. The Latin Christians embraced the religious institutions of Rome. The pilgrims who visited Jerusalem eagerly copied in the most distant climates of the earth the faithful model of the monastic life. The disciples of Antony spread themselves beyond the tropic over the Christian empire of Ethiopia. The monastery of Bancor in Flintshire, which contained above two thousand brethren, dispersed a numerous colony among the barbarians of Ireland, and Iona, one of the Hebrides, which was planted by the Irish monks, diffused over the northern regions a doubtful ray of science and superstition. These unhappy exiles from social life were impelled by the dark and implacable genius of superstition. Their mutual resolution was supported by the example of millions of either sex, of every age and of every rank, and each proselyte who entered the gates of a monastery was persuaded that he trod the steep and thorny path of eternal happiness. 
but the operation of these religious motives was variously determined by the temper and situation of mankind. Reason might subdue or passion suspend their influence, but they acted most forcibly on the infirm minds of children and females. They were strengthened by secret remorse or accidental misfortune, and they might derive some aid from the temporal considerations of vanity or interest. It was naturally supposed that the pious and humble monks, who had renounced the world to accomplish the work of their salvation, were the best qualified for the spiritual government of the Christians. The reluctant hermit was torn from his cell, and seated amidst the acclamations of the people, on the episcopal throne, the monasteries of Egypt, Gaul, and the East, supplied a regular succession of saints and bishops, and ambition soon discovered the secret road which led to the possession of wealth and honor. The popular monks, whose reputation was connected with the fame and success of the order, assiduously labored to multiply the number of their fellow captives. They insinuated themselves into noble and opulent families, and the specious arts of flattery and seduction were employed to secure those proselytes who might bestow wealth or dignity on the monastic profession. The indignant father bewailed the loss, perhaps, of an only son. The credulous maid was betrayed by vanity to violate the laws of nature, and the matron aspired to imaginary perfection by renouncing the virtues of domestic life. Paula yielded to the persuasive eloquence of Jerome, and the profane title of mother-in-law of God tempted that illustrious widow to consecrate the virginity of her daughter Eustochium. By the advice and in the company of her spiritual guide, Paula abandoned Rome and her infant son, retired to the holy village of Bethlehem, founded a hospital in four monasteries, and acquired, by her alms and penance, an eminent and conspicuous station in the Catholic Church. Such rare and illustrious penitents were celebrated as the glory and example of their age, but the monasteries were filled by a crowd of obscure and abject plebeians, who gained in the cloister much more than they had sacrificed in the world. Peasant slaves and mechanics might escape from poverty and contempt to a safe and honorable profession, whose apparent hardships are mitigated by custom, by popular applause, and by the secret relaxation of discipline. The subjects of Rome, whose persons and fortunes were made responsible for unequal and exorbitant tributes, retired from the oppression of the imperial government, and the pusillanimous youth preferred the penance of a monastic to the dangers of a military life. The affrighted provincials of every rank who fled before barbarians found shelter and subsistence. Whole legions were buried in these religious sanctuaries, and the same cause which relieved the distress of individuals impaired the strength and fortitude of the empire. The monastic profession of the ancients was an act of voluntary devotion. The inconstant fanatic was threatened with the eternal vengeance of the god whom he deserted, but the doors of the monastery were still open for repentance. Those monks whose conscience was fortified by reason or passion were at liberty to resume the character of men and citizens, and even the spouses of Christ might accept the legal embraces of an earthly lover. The examples of scandal and the progress of superstition suggested the propriety of more forcible restraints. After a sufficient trial, the fidelity of the novice was secured by a solemn and perpetual vow, and his irrevocable engagement was ratified by the laws of church and state. A guilty fugitive was pursued, arrested, and restored to his perpetual prison, and the interposition of the magistrate oppressed the freedom and the merit which had alleviated in some degree the abject slavery of the monastic discipline. The actions of a monk, his words and even his thoughts, were determined by an inflexible rule, or a capricious superior. The slightest offences were corrected by disgrace or confinement, extraordinary fasts or bloody flagellation, and disobedience, murmur or delay were ranked in the catalogue of the most heinous sins. Blind submission to the commands of the abbot, however absurd or criminal they might seem, was the ruling principle, the first virtue of the Egyptian monks, and their patience was frequently exercised by the most extravagant trials. They were directed to remove an enormous walk, assiduously to water a barren staff that was planted in the ground till, at the end of three years, it should vegetate and blossom like a tree, to walk into a fiery furnace, or to cast their infant into a deep pond, and several saints or madmen have been immortalized in monastic story by their thoughtless and fearless obedience. The freedom of the mind, the source of every generous and rational sentiment, was destroyed by the habits of credulity and submission, and the monk, contracting the vices of a slave, devoutly followed the faith and passion of his ecclesiastical tyrant. 
the peace of the Eastern Church was invaded by a swarm of fanatics, incapable of fear or reason or humanity, and the imperial troops acknowledged without shame that they were much less apprehensive of an encounter with the fiercest barbarians. Superstition has often framed and consecrated the fantastic garments of the monks, but their apparent singularity sometimes proceeds from their uniform attachment to a simple primitive model, which the revolutions of fashion have made ridiculous in the eyes of mankind. The father of the Benedictines expressly disclaims all idea of choice and merit, and soberly exhorts his disciples to adopt the coarse and convenient dress of the countries which they may inhabit. The monastic habits of the ancients varied with the climate, and their mode of life, and they assumed with the same indifference the sheepskin of the Egyptian peasants or the cloak of Grecian philosophers. They allowed themselves the use of linen in Egypt, where it was a cheap and domestic manufacture, but in the West they rejected such as an expensive article of foreign luxury. It was the practice of the monks either to cut or shave their hair. They wrapped their heads in a cowl to escape the sight of profane objects. Their legs and feet were naked, except in extreme cold of winter, and their slow and feeble steps were supported by a long staff. The aspect of a genuine anchoret was horrid and disgusting. Every sensation that is offensive to man was thought acceptable to God, and the angelic rule of Tibet condemned the salutary custom of bathing the limbs in water and of anointing them with oil. The austere monks slept on the ground, on a hard mat, or a rough blanket, and the same bundle of palm leaves served them as a seat in the day and a pillow in the night. Their original cells were low, narrow huts, built of the slightest materials which formed, by the regular distribution of the streets, a large and populous village, enclosing within the common wall a church, a hospital, perhaps a library, some necessary offices, a garden, and a fountain or reservoir of fresh water. Thirty or forty brethren composed a family of separate discipline and diet, and the great monasteries of Egypt consisted of thirty or forty families. Pleasure and guilt are synonymous terms in the language of the monks, and they discovered by experience that rigid fasts and abstemious diet are the most effectual preservatives against the impure desires of the flesh. The rules of abstinence which they imposed or practiced were not uniform or perpetual. The cheerful festival of the Pentecost was balanced by the extraordinary mortification of Lent. The fervor of new monasteries was insensibly relaxed and the voracious appetite of the Gauls could not imitate the patient and temperate virtue of the Egyptians. The disciples of Antony and Pacomius were satisfied with their daily pittance, of twelve ounces of bread, or rather biscuit, which they divided into two frugal repasts of the afternoon and of the evening. It was esteemed a merit, and almost a duty, to abstain from the boiled vegetables which were provided for the refectory. But the extraordinary bounty of the abbot sometimes indulged them with the luxury of cheese, fruit salad, and the small dried fish of the Nile, a more ample latitude of sea and river fish was gradually allowed or assumed, but the use of flesh was long confined to the sick or travellers, and when it gradually prevailed in the less rigid monasteries of Europe, a singular distinction was introduced, as if birds, whether wild or domestic, had been less profane than the grosser animals of the field. Water was the pure and innocent beverage of the primitive monks, and the founder of the Benedictines regrets the daily portion of half a pint of wine which had been extorted from him by the intemperance of the age. Such an allowance might easily be supplied by the vineyards of Italy, and his victorious disciples, who passed the Alps, the Rhine, and the Baltic, required in place of wine an adequate compensation of strong beer or cider. The candidate who aspired to the virtue of evangelical poverty abjured at his first entrance into a regular community the idea and even the name of all separate or exclusive possessions. The brethren were supported by their manual labor and the duty of labor was strenuously recommended as a penance, as an exercise, and as the most laudable means of securing their daily subsistence. The garden and fields, which the industry of the monks had often rescued from the forest or the morass, were diligently cultivated by their hands. They performed without reluctance the menial offices of slaves and domestics, and the several trades that were necessary to provide their habits, their utensils, and their lodging were exercised within the precincts of the great monasteries. The monastic studies have tended for the most part to darken rather than to dispel the cloud of superstition. Yet the curiosity or zeal of some learned solitaries has cultivated the ecclesiastical and even the profane sciences, and posterity must gratefully acknowledge that the monuments of Greek and Roman literature have been preserved and multiplied by their indefatigable pens. The more humble industry of the monks, especially in Egypt, 
was contented with the silent, sedentary occupation of making wooden sandals, or of twisting the leaves of the palm tree into mats and blankets. The superfluous stock, which was not consumed in domestic use, supplied by trade the wants of the community. The boats of Taban and the other monasteries of Thebais descended the Nile as far as Alexandria, and in a Christian market the sanctity of the workmen might enhance the intrinsic value of the work. But the necessity of manual labor was insensibly superseded. The novice was tempted to bestow his fortune on the saints, in whose society he was resolved to spend the remainder of his life, and the pernicious indulgence of the laws permitted him to receive for their use any future accessions of legacy or inheritance. Melania contributed her plate, three hundred pounds weight of silver, and Paula contracted an immense debt for the relief of their favorite monks, who kindly imparted the merits of their prayers and penance to a rich and liberal sinner. Time continually increased, and accidents could seldom diminish the estates of the popular monasteries, which spread over the adjacent country and cities, and in the first century of their institution the infidel Zosimus had maliciously observed that, for the benefit of the poor, the Christian monks had reduced a great part of mankind to a state of beggary. As long as they maintained their original fervor, they approved themselves, however, the faithful and benevolent stewards of the charity which was entrusted to their care. But their discipline was corrupted by prosperity. They gradually assumed the pride of wealth, and at last indulged the luxury of expense." their public luxury might be excused by the magnificence of religious worship, and the decent motive of erecting durable habitations for an immortal society. But every age of the Church has accused the licentiousness of the degenerate monks, who no longer remembered the object of their institution, embraced the vain and sensual pleasures of the world which they had renounced, and scandalously abused the riches which had been acquired by the austere virtues of their founders. Their natural descent— from such painful and dangerous virtue to the common vices of humanity, will not, perhaps, excite much grief or indignation in the mind of a philosopher. The lives of the primitive monks were consumed in penance and solitude, undisturbed by the various occupations which fill the time and exercise the faculties of reasonable, active, and social beings. Whenever they were permitted to step beyond the precincts of the monastery, two jealous companions were the mutual guards and spies of each other's actions— and after their return they were condemned to forget, or at least to suppress, whatever they had seen and heard in the world. Strangers who professed the orthodox faith were hospitably entertained in a separate apartment, but their dangerous conversation was restricted to some chosen elders of approved discretion and fidelity. Except in their presence the monastic slave might not receive the visits of his friends or kindred, and it was deemed highly meritorious if he afflicted a tender sister or an aged parent by the obstinate refusal of a word or look. The monks themselves passed their lives without personal attachments, among a crowd which had been formed by accident, and was detained in the same prison by force or prejudice. Recluse fanatics have few ideas or sentiments to communicate. A special license of the abbot regulated the time and duration of their familiar visits, and at their silent meals they were enveloped in their cowls, inaccessible and almost invisible to each other. Study is the resource of solitude but education had not prepared and qualified for any liberal studies the mechanics and peasants who filled the monastic communities. They might work, but the vanity of spiritual perfection was tempted to disdain the exercise of manual labor, and the industry must be faint and languid which is not excited by the sense of personal interest. According to their faith and zeal, they might employ the day which they passed in their cells either in vocal or mental prayer. They assembled in the evening, and they were awakened in the night for the public worship of the monastery. The precise moment was determined by the stars, which are seldom clouded in the serene sky of Egypt, and a rustic horn or trumpet, the signal of devotion, twice interrupted the vast silence of the desert. Even sleep, the last refuge of the unhappy, was rigorously measured. The vacant hours of the monk heavily rolled along without business or pleasure, and before the close of each day he had repeatedly accused the tedious progress of the sun. In this comfortless state superstition still pursued and tormented her wretched votaries. The repose which they had sought in the cloister was disturbed by a tardy repentance, profane doubts, and guilty desires, and while they considered each natural impulse as an unpardonable sin, they perpetually trembled on the edge of a flaming and bottomless abyss. From the painful struggles of disease and despair, these unhappy victims were sometimes relieved by madness or death, and in the sixth century a hospital was founded at Jerusalem for a small portion of the austere penitents, who were deprived of their senses." their visions, before they attained this extreme and acknowledged term of frenzy, have afforded ample materials of supernatural history. 
It was their firm persuasion that the air which they breathed was peopled with invisible enemies, with innumerable demons who watched every occasion and assumed every form to terrify, and above all to tempt, their unguarded virtue. The imagination and even the senses were deceived by the illusions of distempered fanaticism, and the hermit, whose midnight prayer was oppressed by involuntary slumber, might easily confound the phantoms of horror or delight which had occupied his sleeping and his waking dreams. The monks were divided into two classes, the Knobites, who lived under a common and regular discipline, and the Anachorets, who indulged their unsocial independent fanaticism. The most devout or the most ambitious of the spiritual brethren renounced the convent, as they had renounced the world. The fervent monasteries of Egypt, Palestine, and Syria were surrounded by a lora, a distinct circle of solitary cells, and the extravagant penance of hermits was stimulated by applause and emulation. They sunk under the painful weight of crosses and chains, and their emaciated limbs were confined by collars, bracelets, gauntlets, and greaves of massy and rigid iron. All superfluous encumbrance of dress they contemptuously cast away, and some savage saints of both sexes have been admired whose naked bodies were only covered by their long hair. They aspired to reduce themselves to the rude and miserable state in which the human brute is scarcely distinguishable above his kindred animals, and the numerous sect of Anachorets derived their name from their humble practice of grazing in the fields of Mesopotamia with the common herd. They often usurped the den of some wild beast whom they affected to resemble. They buried themselves in some gloomy cavern which art or nature had scooped out of the rock, and the marble quarries of Thebaeus are still inscribed with the monuments of their penance. The most perfect hermits are supposed to have passed many days without food, many nights without sleep, and many years without speaking. And glorious was the man, I abuse that name, who contrived any cell or seat of a peculiar construction, which might expose him, in the most inconvenient posture, to the inclemency of the seasons. Among these heroes of the monastic life, the name and genius of Simeon Stylites have been immortalized by the singular invention of an aerial penance. At the age of thirteen, the young Syrian deserted the profession of a shepherd and threw himself into an austere monastery. After a long and painful novitiate, in which Simeon was repeatedly saved from pious suicide, he established his residence on a mountain, about thirty or forty miles to the east of Antioch. Within the space of a mandra, or circle of stones, to which he had attached himself by a ponderous chain, he ascended a column, which was successively raised from the height of nine to that of sixty feet from the ground. In this last and lofty station, the Syrian Anachoret resisted the heat of thirty summers, and the cold of as many winters. Habit and exercise instructed him to maintain his dangerous situation without fear or giddiness, and successively to assume the different postures of devotion. He sometimes prayed in an erect attitude, with his outstretched arms in the figure of a cross, but his most familiar practice was that of bending his meager skeleton from the forehead to the feet and a curious spectator, after numbering twelve hundred and forty-four repetitions, at length desisted from the endless account. The progress of an ulcer in his thigh might shorten, but it could not disturb the celestial life, and the patient hermit expired without descending from his column. A prince who should capriciously inflict such tortures would be deemed a tyrant, but it would surpass the power of a tyrant to impose a long and miserable existence on the reluctant victims of his cruelty. This voluntary martyrdom must have gradually destroyed the sensibility both of mind and body, nor can it be presumed that the fanatics who torment themselves are susceptible of any lively affection for the rest of mankind. A cruel, unfeeling temper has distinguished the monks of every age and country. Their stern indifference, which is seldom mollified by personal friendship, is inflamed by religious hatred, and their merciless zeal has strenuously administered the holy office of the Inquisition. The monastic saints, who excite only the contempt and pity of a philosopher, were respected and almost adored by the prince and people. Successive crowds of pilgrims from Gaul and India saluted the divine pillar of Simeon. The tribes of Saracens disputed in arms the honor of his benediction. The queens of Arabia and Persia gratefully confessed his supernatural virtue, and the angelic hermit was consulted by the younger Theodosius in the most important concerns of the church and state. His remains were transported from the mountain of Telenissa, by a solemn procession of the patriarch, the master-general of the East, six bishops, twenty-one counts or tribunes, and six thousand soldiers. And Antioch revered his bones as her glorious ornament and impregnable defense. The fame of the apostles and martyrs was gradually eclipsed by those recent and popular anachorets. 
the Christian world fell prostrate before their shrines, and the miracles ascribed to their relics exceeded, at least in number and duration, the spiritual exploits of their lives. But the golden legend of their lives was embellished by the artful credulity of their interested brethren, and a believing age was easily persuaded that the slightest caprice of an Egyptian or Assyrian monk had been sufficient to interrupt the eternal laws of the universe. The favorites of heaven were accustomed to cure inveterate diseases with a touch, a word, or a distant message, and to expel the most obstinate demons from the souls or bodies which they possessed. They familiarly accosted, imperiously commanded, the lions and serpents of the desert, infused vegetation into a sapless trunk, suspended iron on the surface of the water, passed the Nile on the back of a crocodile, and refreshed themselves in a fiery furnace. These extravagant tales, which display the fiction without the genius of poetry, have seriously affected the reason, the faith, and the morals of Christians. Their credulity debased and vitiated the faculties of the mind. They corrupted the evidence of history, and superstition gradually extinguished the hostile light of philosophy and science. Every mode of religious worship which had been practiced by the saints, every mysterious doctrine which they believed, was fortified by the sanction of divine revelation, and all the manly virtues were oppressed by the servile and pusillanimous reign of the monks. If it be possible to measure the interval between the philosophic writings of Cicero and the sacred legend of Theodoret, between the character of Cato and that of Simeon, we appreciate the memorable revolution which was accomplished in the Roman Empire within a period of five hundred years. The progress of Christianity has been marked by two glorious and decisive victories, over the learned and luxurious citizens of the Roman Empire, and over the warlike barbarians of Scythia and Germany, who subverted the empire and embraced the religion of the Romans. The Goths were the foremost of these savage proselytes, and the nation was indebted for its conversion to a countryman, or at least to a subject worthy to be ranked among the inventors of useful arts, who have deserved the remembrance and gratitude of posterity. A great number of Roman provincials had been led into captivity by the Gothic bands, who ravaged Asia in the time of Gallienus, and of these captives many were Christians, and several belonged to the ecclesiastical order. These involuntary missionaries, dispersed as slaves in the villages of Decia, successively labored for the salvation of their masters. The seeds which they planted of the evangelic doctrine were gradually propagated, and before the end of a century the pious work was achieved by the labors of Ophilus, whose ancestors had been transported beyond the Danube for a small town of Cappadocia. Ophilus, the bishop and apostle of the Goths, acquired their love and reverence by his blameless life and indefatigable zeal, and they received, with implicit confidence, the doctrines of truth and virtue which he preached and practiced. He executed the arduous task of translating the scriptures into their native tongue, a dialect of the German or Teutonic language, but he prudently suppressed the four books of kings, as they might tend to irritate the fierce and sanguinary spirit of the barbarians. The rude, imperfect idiom of soldiers and shepherds so ill-qualified to communicate any spiritual ideas was improved and modulated by his genius. And Ulphilus, before he could frame his version, was obliged to compose a new alphabet of twenty-four letters, four of which he invented, to express the peculiar sounds that were unknown to the Greek and Latin pronunciation. But the prosperous state of the Gothic church was soon afflicted by war and intestine discord, and the chieftains were divided by religion as well as by interest. Fritern, the friend of the Romans, became the proselyte of Ophilus, while the haughty soul of Athenaric disdained the yoke of the empire and of the gospel. The faith of the new converts was tried by the persecution which he excited. A wagon bearing aloft the shapeless image of Thor, perhaps, or of Woden, was conducted in solemn procession through the streets of the camp. And the rebels, who refused to worship the god of their fathers, were immediately burnt with their tents and families. The character of Ulphilus recommended him to the esteem of the eastern court, where he twice appeared as a minister of peace. He pleaded the case of the distressed Goths, who implored the protection of Valens, and the name of Moses was applied to this spiritual guide, conducted his people through the deep waters of the Danube, to the land of promise. The devout shepherds, who were attached to his person and tractable to his voice, acquiesced in their settlement, at the foot of the Macian mountains, in a country of woodlands and pastures, which supported their flocks and herds, and enabled them to purchase the corn and wine of the more plentiful provinces. These harmless barbarians multiplied in obscure peace and the profession of Christianity. Their fiercer brethren, the formidable Visigoths, universally adopted the religion of the Romans, with whom they maintained a perpetual intercourse of war, of friendship, or of conquest. In their long and victorious march from the Danube to the Atlantic Ocean, they converted their allies, they educated the rising generation, 
and the devotion which reigned in the camp of Alaric or the court of Thalos might edify or disgrace the palaces of Rome and Constantinople. During the same period Christianity was raised by almost all the barbarians, who established their kingdoms on the ruins of the Western Empire, the Burgundians in Gaul, the Suevi in Spain, the Vandals in Africa, and the Ostrogoths in Pannonia, and the various bands of mercenaries that raised Oedacer to the throne of Italy. The Franks and the Saxons still persevered in the errors of paganism, but the Franks obtained the monarchy of Gaul by their submission to the example of Clovis, and the Saxon conquerors of Britain were reclaimed from their savage superstition by the missionaries of Rome. These barbarian proselytes displayed an ardent and successful zeal in the propagation of the faith. The Merovingian kings and their successors, Charlemagne and the Othos, extended by their laws and victories the dominion of the cross. England produced the apostle of Germany, and the evangelic light was gradually diffused from the neighborhood of the Rhine to the nations of the Elbe, the Vistula, and the Baltic. The different motives which influenced the reason or the passions of the barbarian converts cannot easily be ascertained. They were often capricious and accidental. A dream, an omen, the report of a miracle, the example of some priest or hero, the charms of a believing wife, and, above all, the fortunate event of a prayer or vow which, in a moment of danger, they had addressed to the God of the Christians. The early prejudices of education were insensibly erased by the habits of frequent and familiar society. The moral precepts of the Gospels were protected by the extravagant virtues of the monks, and a spirit theology was supported by the visible power of relics, and the pomp of religious worship. But the rational and ingenious mode of persuasion, which a Saxon bishop suggested to a popular saint, might sometimes be employed by the missionaries, who labored for the conversion of infidels. Admit, says the sagacious disputant, whatever they are pleased to assert of the fabulous and carnal genealogy of their gods and goddesses who are propagated from each other. From this principle deduce their imperfect nature and human infirmities, the assurance that they were born, and the probability that they will die. At what time, by what means, from what cause, were the eldest of the gods or goddesses produced? Do they still continue, or have they ceased to propagate? If they have ceased, summon your antagonists to declare the reason of this strange alteration. If they still continue, the number of gods must become infinite, and shall we not risk, by the indiscreet worship of some impotent deity, to excite the resentment of his jealous superior? The visible heavens and earth, the whole system of the universe which may be conceived by the mind, is it created or eternal? If created, how or where could the gods themselves exist before creation? If eternal, how could they assume the empire of an independent and pre-existing world? Urge these arguments, with temper and moderation. Insinuate at seasonable intervals the truth and beauty of the Christian revelation, and endeavor to make the unbelievers ashamed without making them angry. This metaphysical reasoning, too refined, perhaps, for the barbarians of Germany, was fortified by the grosser weight of authority and popular consent. The advantage of temporal prosperity had deserted the pagan cause, and passed over to the service of Christianity. The Romans themselves, the most powerful and enlightened nation of the globe, had renounced their ancient superstition, and if the ruin of their empire seemed to accuse the efficacy of the new faith, the disgrace was already retrieved by the conversion of the victorious Goths. The valiant and fortunate barbarians, who subdued the provinces of the West, successfully received and reflected the same edifying example. Before the age of Charlemagne, the Christian nations of Europe might exult in the exclusive possession of the temperate climates, of the fertile lands, which produced corn, wine, and oil, while the savage idolaters and their helpless idols were confined to the extremities of the earth, the dark and frozen regions of the north. Christianity which opened the gates of heaven to the barbarians, introduced an important change in their moral and political condition. They received at the same time the use of letters, so essential to a religion whose doctrines are contained in a sacred book, and while they studied the divine truth, their minds were insensibly enlarged by the distant view of history, of nature, of the arts, and of society. The version of the scriptures into their native tongue, which had facilitated their conversion, must excite among their clergy some curiosity to read the original text, to understand the sacred liturgy of the Church, and to examine in the ranks of the Fathers the chain of ecclesiastical tradition. These spiritual gifts were preserved in the Greek and Latin languages, which concealed the inestimable monuments of ancient learning. The immortal productions of Virgil, Cicero, and Livy, which were accessible to the Christian barbarians, maintained a silent intercourse between the reign of Augustus and the times of Clovis and Charlemagne. The emulation of mankind was encouraged by the remembrance of a more perfect state, and the flame of science was scarcely kept alive to warm and enlighten the mature age of the Western world. In the most corrupt state of Christianity, 
the barbarians might learn justice from the law and mercy from the gospel and if the knowledge of their duty was insufficient to guide their actions or to regulate their passions they were sometimes restrained by conscience and frequently punished by remorse but the direct authority of religion was less effectual than the holy communion which united them with their christian brethren in spirit friendship the influence of these sentiments contributed to secure their fidelity in the servants or the alliance of the romans to alleviate the horrors of the war to moderate the insolence of conquest and to preserve in the downfall of the empire a permanent respect for the name and institutions of rome in the days of paganism the priests of gaul and germany reigned over the people and controlled the jurisdiction of the magistrates and the zealous proselytes transferred to an equal or more ample measure of devout obedience to the pontiffs of the christian faith the sacred character of the bishops was supported by their temporal possessions they obtained an honorable seat in the legislative assemblies of soldiers and freemen and it was their interest as well as their duty to mollify by peaceful counsels the fierce spirit of the barbarians the perpetual correspondence of the latin clergy the frequent pilgrimages to rome and jerusalem and the growing authority of the popes cemented the union of the christian republic and gradually produced the similar manners and common jurisprudence which have distinguished from the rest of mankind the independent and even hostile nations of modern europe but the operation of these causes was checked and retarded by the unfortunate accident which infused a deadly poison into the cup of salvation whatever might be the early sentiments of ulphilas his connections with the empire and the church were formed during the reign of arianism the apostle of the goths subscribed the creed of rimini professed with freedom and perhaps with sincerity that the son was not equal or consubstantial to the father communicated these errors to the clergy and the people and infected the barbaric world with a heresy which great theodosius prescribed and extinguished among the romans the temper and understanding of the new proselytes were not adapted to metaphysical subtleties but they strenuously maintained what they had piously received as the pure and genuine doctrines of christianity the advantage of preaching and expounding the scriptures in the teutonic language promoted the apostolic labors of ulphilas and his successors and they ordained a competent number of bishops and presbyters for the instruction of the kindred tribes the ostrogoths the burgundians the suevi and the vandals who had listened to the eloquence of the latin clergy preferred the more intelligible lessons of their domestic teachers and arianism was adopted as the national faith of the warlike converts who were seated on the ruins of the western empire this irreconcilable difference of religion was a perpetual source of jealousy and hatred and the reproach of barbarian was embittered by the more odious epithet of heretic the heroes of the north who had submitted with some reluctance to believe that all their ancestors were in hell were astonished and exasperated to learn that they themselves had only changed the mode of their internal condemnation instead of the smooth applause which christian kings are accustomed to expect from their royal prelates the orthodox bishops and their clergy were in a state of opposition to the arian courts and their indiscreet opposition frequently became criminal and sometimes might be dangerous the pulpit that safe and sacred organ of sedition resounded with the names of pharaoh and holophernes the public discontent was inflamed by the hope or promise of glorious deliverance and the seditious saints were tempted to promote the accomplishment of their own predictions notwithstanding these provocations the catholics of gaul spain and italy enjoyed under the reign of the arians the free and peaceful exercise of their religion their haughty masters respected the zeal of a numerous people resolved to die at the foot of their altars and the example of their devout constancy was admired and imitated by the barbarians themselves the conquerors evaded however the disgraceful reproach or confession of fear by attributing their toleration to the liberal motives of reason and humanity and while they affected the language they imperceptibly imbibed the spirit of genuine christianity the peace of the church was sometimes interrupted the catholics were indiscreet the barbarians were impatient and the partial acts of severity or injustice which had been recommended by the arian clergy were exaggerated by the orthodox writers the guilt of persecution may be imputed to yorick king of the visigoths who suspended the exercise of the ecclesiastical or at least of episcopal functions and punished the popular bishops of aquitaine with imprisonment exile and confiscation but the cruel and absurd enterprise of subduing the minds of a whole people was undertaken by the vandals alone genseric himself in his early youth had renounced the orthodox communion and the apostate could neither grant nor expect a sincere forgiveness 
He was exasperated to find that the Africans, who had fled before him in the field, still presumed to dispute his will in synods and churches, and his ferocious mind was incapable of fear or of compassion. His Catholic subjects were oppressed by intolerant laws and arbitrary punishments. The language of Genseric was furious and formidable. The knowledge of his intentions might justify the most unfavorable interpretation of his actions, and the Arians were reproached with the frequent executions which stained the palace and the dominions of the tyrant. Arms and ambition were, however, the ruling passions of the mark of the sea. But Huneric, his inglorious son, who seemed to inherit only his vices, went to the Catholics with the same unrelenting fury which had been fatal to his brother, his nephews, and the friends and favorites of his father, and even to the Arian patriarch, who was inhumanly burnt alive in the midst of Carthage. The religious war was preceded and prepared by an insidious truce. Persecution was made the serious and important business of Vandal Court, and a loathsome disease which had hastened the death of Huneric revenged the injuries without contributing to the deliverance of the Church. The throne of Africa was successively filled by the two nephews of Huneric, by Gundamund, who reigned about twelve, and by Thrasimund, who governed the nation about twenty-seven years. Their administration was hostile and oppressive to the Orthodox party. Gundamund appeared to emulate or even to surpass the cruelty of his uncle, and if at length he relented, if he recalled the bishops and restored the freedom of Athanasian worship, a premature death intercepted the benefits of his tardy clemency. His brother, Thrasimund, was the greatest and most accomplished of the Vandal kings, whom he excelled in beauty, prudence, and magnanimity of soul. But this magnanimous character was degraded by his intolerant zeal and deceitful clemency. Instead of threats and tortures, he employed the gentle but efficacious powers of seduction. Wealth, dignity, and the royal favor were the liberal rewards of apostasy. The Catholics, who had violated the laws, might purchase their pardon by the renunciation of their faith, and whenever Thrasimund meditated any rigorous measure, he patiently waited till the indiscretion of his adversaries furnished him with a specious opportunity. Bigotry was his last sentiment in the hour of death, and he exacted from his successor a solemn oath that he would never tolerate the sectaries of Athanasius. But his successor, Hilderic, the gentle son of the savage Huneric, preferred the duties of humanity and justice to the vain obligation of an impious oath, and his accession was gloriously marked by the restoration of peace and universal freedom. The throne of that virtuous though feeble monarch was usurped by his cousin Gelimer, a zealous Arian, but the Vandal kingdom, before he could enjoy or abuse his power, was subverted by the arms of Belisarius, and the Orthodox party retaliated the injuries which they had endured. The passionate declamations of the Catholics, the sole historians of this persecution, cannot afford any distinct series of causes and events, any impartial view of the characters or counsels, but the most remarkable circumstances that deserve either credit or notice may be referred to the following heads. 1. In the original law, which is still extant, Huneric expressly declares, and the declaration appears to be correct, that he had faithfully transcribed the regulations and penalties of the imperial edicts against the heretical congregations, the clergy, and the people, who dissented from the established religion. If the rights of conscience had been understood, the Catholics must have condemned their past conduct or acquiesced in their actual suffering but they still persisted to refuse the indulgence which they claimed. While they trembled under the lash of persecution, they praised the laudable severity of Huneric himself, who burnt or banished great numbers of Manichaeans, and they rejected with horror the ignominious compromise that the disciples of Arius and of Athanasius should enjoy a reciprocal and similar toleration in the territories of the Romans and in those of the Vandals. 2. The practice of a conference, which the Catholics had so frequently used to insult and punish their obstinate antagonists, was retorted against themselves. At the command of Huneric, four hundred and sixty-six Orthodox bishops assembled at Carthage, but when they were admitted into the hall of audience, they had the mortification of beholding the Arian Cyrilla exalted on the patriarchal throne. The disputants were separated, after the mutual and ordinary reproaches of noise and silence, of delay and precipitation of military force, and of popular clamor. One martyr and one confessor were selected on the Catholic bishops. Twenty-eight escaped by flight, and eighty-eight by conformity. Forty-six were sent into Corsica to cut timber for the royal navy, and three hundred and two were banished to the different parts of Africa, exposed to the insults of their enemies, and carefully deprived of all temporal and spiritual comforts of life. 
The hardship of ten years' exile must have reduced their numbers, and if they had complied with the law of Thrasimund, which prohibited any episcopal consecrations, the Orthodox Church of Africa must have expired with the lives of its actual members. They disobeyed, and their disobedience was punished by a second exile of two hundred and twenty bishops into Sardinia, where they languished fifteen years till the accession of the gracious Hilderic. The two islands were judiciously chosen by the malice of their Arian tyrants. Seneca, from his own experience, has deplored and exaggerated the miserable state of Corsica, and the plenty of Sardinia was overbalanced by the unwholesome quality of the air. 3. The zeal of Generic and his successors for the conversion of the Catholics must have rendered them still more jealous to guard the purity of the Vandal faith. Before the churches were finally shut, it was a crime to appear in barbarian dress, and those who presumed to neglect the royal mandate were rudely dragged backwards by their long hair. The Palatine officers, who refused to profess the religion of their prince, were ignominiously stripped of their honors and employments, banished to Sardinia and Sicily, or condemned to the servile labors of slaves and peasants in the fields of Utica. In the districts which had been particularly allotted to the Vandals, the exercise of the Catholic worship was more strictly prohibited, and severe penalties were denounced against the guilt both of the missionary and the proselyte. By these arts, the faith of the barbarians was preserved, and their zeal was inflamed. They discharged with devout fury the office of spies, informers, and executioners, and whenever their cavalry took the field, it was the favorite amusement of the march to defile the churches and to insult the clergy and the adder's faction. The citizens who had been educated in the luxury of the Roman province were delivered with exquisite cruelty to the moors of the desert. A venerable train of bishops, presbyters, and deacons, with a faithful crowd of four thousand ninety-six persons, whose guilt is not precisely ascertained, were torn from their native homes by the command of Huneric. During the night they were confined like a herd of cattle amidst their own ordure. During the day they pursued their march over the burning sands, and if they fainted under the heat and fatigue, they were goaded or dragged along till they expired in the hands of their tormentors. The unhappy exiles, when they reached the Moorish huts, might excite the compassion of a people whose native humanity was neither improved by reason nor corrupted by fanaticism, but if they escaped the dangers, they were condemned to share the distress of a savage life. 5. It is incumbent on the authors of persecution previously to reflect whether they determined to support it in the last extreme. They excite the flame which they strive to extinguish, and it soon becomes necessary to chastise the contumacy as well as the crime of the offender. The fine which he is unable or unwilling to discharge exposes his person to the severity of the law, and his contempt of lighter penalties suggests the use and propriety of capital punishment. Through veil of fiction and declamation we may clearly perceive that the Catholics, more especially under the reign of Huneric, endured the most cruel and ignominious treatment. Respectable citizens, noble matrons, and consecrated virgins were stripped naked and raised in the air by pulleys, with a weight suspended at their feet. In this painful attitude their naked bodies were torn with scourges, or burnt in the most tender parts with red-hot plates of iron. The amputation of the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the right hand was inflicted by the Arians, and although the precise number cannot be defined, it is evident that many persons, among whom a bishop and a proconsul may be named, were entitled to the crown of martyrdom. The same honor has been ascribed to the memory of Count Sebastian, who professed the Nicene Creed with unshaken constancy, and Genseric might detest as a heretic the brave and ambitious fugitive whom he dreaded as a rival. 6. A new mode of conversion, which might subdue the feeble and alarm the timorous, was employed by the Arian ministers. They imposed, by fraud or violence, the rites of baptism and punished the apostasy of the Catholics if they disclaimed this odious and profane ceremony, which scandalously violated the freedom of the will and the unity of the sacrament. The hostile sects had formerly allowed the validity of each other's baptism, and the innovation so fiercely maintained by the Vandals can be imputed only to the example and advice of the Donatists. 7. The Arian clergy surpassed in religious cruelty the king and his vandals, but were incapable of cultivating the spiritual vineyard which they were so desirous to possess. A patriarch might seat himself on the throne of Carthage. Some bishops, in the principal cities, might usurp the place of their rivals. But the smallness of their numbers, and their ignorance of the Latin language, disqualified the barbarians for the ecclesiastical ministry of a great church, 
and the Africans, after the loss of their Orthodox pastors, were deprived of the public exercise of Christianity. 8. The emperors were the natural protectors of the Homosian doctrine, and the faithful people of Africa, both as Romans and as Catholics, preferred their lawful sovereignty to the usurpation of the barbarous heretics. During an interval of peace and friendship, Huneric restored the cathedral of Carthage, at the intercession of Zeno, who reigned in the east, and of Placidia, the daughter and relict of emperors, and the sister of the queen of the Vandals. But this decent regard was of short duration, and the haughty tyrant displayed his contempt for the religion of the empire by studiously arranging the bloody images of persecution in all the principal streets through which the Roman ambassador must pass on his way to the palace. An oath was required from the bishops who were assembled at Carthage that they would support the succession of his son Hilderic, and that they would renounce all foreign or transmarine correspondence. This engagement, consistent as it should seem with their moral and religious duties, was refused by the more sagacious members of the assembly. Their refusal, faintly colored by the pretense that it is unlawful for a Christian to swear, provoked the suspicions of a jealous tyrant. The Catholics, oppressed by royal and military force, were far superior to their adversaries in numbers and learning. With the same weapons which the Greek and Latin fathers had already provided for the Arian controversy, they repeatedly silenced or vanquished the fierce and illiterate successors of Ophilus. The consciousness of their own superiority might have raised them above the arts and passions of religious warfare. Yet instead of assuming such honorable pride, the orthodox theologians were tempted, by the assurance of impunity, to compose fictions, which must be stigmatized with the epithets of fraud and forgery. They ascribed their own polemical works to the most venerable names of Christian antiquity. The characters of Athanasius and Augustine were awkwardly personated by Vigilus and his disciples, and the famous creed, which so clearly expounds the mysteries of the Trinity and the Incarnation, is deduced, with strong probability, from this African school. Even the scriptures themselves were profaned by their rash and sacrilegious hands. The memorable text, which asserts the unity of the three who bear witness in heaven, is condemned by the universal silence of the Orthodox fathers, ancient versions, and authentic manuscripts. It was first alleged by the Catholic bishops, whom Hunneric summoned to the Conference of Carthage. An allegorical interpretation, in the form, perhaps, of a marginal note, invaded the text of the Latin Bibles, which were renewed and corrected in a dark period of ten centuries. After the invention of printing, the editors of the Greek Testament yielded to their own prejudices, or those of the times, and the pious fraud, which was embraced with equal zeal at Rome and at Geneva, has been infinitely multiplied in every country and every language of modern Europe. The example of fraud must excite suspicion, and the specious miracles by which the African Catholics have defended the truth and justice of their cause may be ascribed, with more reason, to their own industry than to the visible protection of heaven. Yet the historian who views this religious conflict with an impartial eye may condescend to mention one preternatural event, which will edify the devout and surprise the incredulous. Tipasa, a maritime colony of Mauritania, sixteen miles to the east of Caesarea, had been distinguished in every age by the orthodox zeal of its inhabitants. They had braved the fury of the Donatists, they resisted or eluded the tyranny of the Arians. The town was deserted on the approach of an heretical bishop. Most of the inhabitants who could procure ships passed over to the coast of Spain, and the unhappy remnant, refusing all communion with the usurper, still presumed to hold their pious but illegal assemblies. Their disobedience exasperated the cruelty of Hunneric. A military count was dispatched from Carthage to Tipasa. He collected the Catholics in the Forum, and in the presence of the whole province, deprived the guilty of their right hands and their tongues. But the holy confessors continued to speak without tongues, and this miracle is attested by Victor, an African bishop, who published a history of the persecution within two years after the event. If any one, says Victor, should doubt of the truth, let him repair to Constantinople, and listen to the clear and perfect language of Restitutus, the subdeacon, one of these glorious sufferers, who is now lodged in the palace of the emperor Zeno, and is respected by the devout empress. 
At Constantinople we are astonished to find a cool, learned, and unexceptionable witness, without interest and without passion. Aeneas of Gaza, a Platonic philosopher, has accurately described his own observations on these African sufferers. I saw them myself, I heard them speak, I diligently inquired by what means such an articulate voice could be formed without any organ of speech. I used my eyes to examine the report of my ears. I opened their mouth and saw that the whole tongue had been completely torn away by the roots, an operation which the physicians generally supposed to be mortal. The testimony of Aeneas of Gaza might be confirmed by the superfluous evidence of the Emperor Justinian in a perpetual edict, of Count Marcellinus in his Chronicle of the Times, and of Pope Gregory I, who had resided at Constantinople as the minister of the Roman Pontiff. They all lived within the compass of a century, and they all appealed to their personal knowledge or the public notoriety for the truth of a miracle, which was repeated in several instances, displayed on the greatest theatre of the world, and submitted during a series of years to the calm examination of the senses. This supernatural gift of the African confessors, who spoke without tongues, will command the assent of those, and of those only, who already believe. That their language was pure and orthodox. But the stubborn mind of an infidel is guarded by secret, incurable suspicion, and the Arian or Socinian, who has seriously rejected the doctrine of a Trinity, will not be shaken by the most plausible evidence of an Athanasian miracle. The Vandals and the Ostrogoths persevered in the profession of Arianism till the final ruin of the kingdoms which they had founded in Africa and Italy. The barbarians of Gaul submitted to the orthodox dominion of the Franks, and Spain was restored to the Catholic Church by the voluntary conversion of the Visigoths. This salutary revolution was hastened by the example of a royal martyr, whom our calmer reason may style an ungrateful rebel. Leovigild, the Gothic monarch of Spain, deserved the respects of his enemies, and the love of his subjects. The Catholics enjoyed a free toleration. And his Arian synods attempted, without much success, to reconcile their scruples by abolishing the unpopular rite of a second baptism. His eldest son, Hermenegild, who was invested by his father with the royal diadem, and the fair principality of Ptica, contracted an honorable and orthodox alliance with the Merovingian princess, the daughter of Sigebert, king of Austrasia, and of the famous Brunechild. The beauteous Ingundis, who was no more than thirteen years of age, was received, beloved, and persecuted in the Arian court of Toledo, and her religious constancy was alternately assaulted with blandishments and violence by Giosvinta, the Gothic queen, who abused the double claim of maternal authority. Incensed by her resistance, Giosvinta seized the Catholic princess by her long hair, inhumanly dashed her against the ground, Kicked her till she was covered with blood, and at last gave orders that she should be stripped and thrown into a basin or fish pond. Love and honor might excite Hermenegild to resent this injurious treatment of his bride, and he was gradually persuaded that Ingundis suffered for the cause of divine truth. Her tender complaints and the weighty arguments of Leander, Archbishop of Seville, accompanied his conversion, and the heir of the Gothic monarchy was initiated in the Nicene faith. By the solemn rites of confirmation, the rash youth, inflamed by zeal and perhaps by ambition, was tempted to violate the duties of a son and a subject. And the Catholics of Spain, although they could not complain of persecution, applauded his pious rebellion against an heretical father. The civil war was protracted by the long and obstinate sieges of Merida, Cordova, and Seville, which had strenuously espoused the party of Hermenegild. He invited the orthodox barbarians, the Suevi, and the Franks to the destruction of his native land. He solicited the dangerous aid of the Romans, who possessed Africa and a part of the Spanish coast, and his holy ambassador, the Archbishop Leander, effectually negotiated in person with the Byzantine court. But the hopes of the Catholics were crushed by the active diligence of the monarch, who commanded the troops and treasures of Spain. And the guilty Hermenegild, after his vain attempts to resist or escape, 
was compelled to surrender himself into the hands of an incensed father. Leovigild was still mindful of that sacred character, and the rebel, despoiled of the regal ornaments, was still permitted, in a decent exile, to profess the Catholic religion. His repeated and unsuccessful treasons at length provoked the indignation of the Gothic king, and the sentence of death, which he pronounced with apparent reluctance, was privately executed in the Tower of Seville. The inflexible constancy with which he refused to accept the Arian communion, as the price of his safety, may excuse the honors that had been paid to the memory of St. Hermenegild. His wife and infant son were detained by the Romans in ignominious captivity, and this domestic misfortune tarnished the glories of Leovigild, and embittered the last moments of his life. His son and successor, Recared, the first Catholic king of Spain, had imbibed the faith of his unfortunate brother, which he supported with more prudence and success. Instead of revolting against his father, Recared patiently expected the hour of his death. Instead of condemning his memory, he piously supposed that the dying monarch had abjured the errors of Arianism and recommended to his son the conversion of the Gothic nation. To accomplish that salutary end, Recared convened an assembly of the Arian clergy and nobles, declared himself a Catholic, and exhorted them to imitate the example of their prince. The laborious interpretation of doubtful texts, or the curious pursuit of metaphysical arguments, would have excited an endless controversy, and the monarch discreetly proposed to his illiterate audience two substantial and visible arguments, the testimony of earth and of heaven. The earth had submitted to the Nicene Synod. The Romans, the barbarians, and the inhabitants of Spain unanimously professed the same orthodox creed, and the Visigoths resisted, almost alone, the consent of the Christian world. A superstitious age was prepared to reverence, as the testimony of heaven, the preternatural cures, which were performed by the skill or virtue of the Catholic clergy, the baptismal fonts of Osset and Batica, which were spontaneously replenished every year, on the vigil of Easter, and the miraculous shrine of St. Martin of Tours, which had already converted the Suevic prince and the people of Galicia. The Catholic king encountered some difficulties on this important change of the national religion. A conspiracy, secretly fomented by the Queen Dowager, was formed against his life, and two counts excited a dangerous revolt in the Narbonese Gaul. But Recared disarmed the conspirators, defeated the rebels, and executed severe justice, which the Arians, in their turn, might brand with the reproach of persecution. Eight bishops, whose names betray their barbaric origin, abjured their errors, and all the books of Arian theology were reduced to ashes, with the house in which they had been purposefully collected. The whole body of the Visigoths and Suevi were allured or driven into the pale of the Catholic communion. The faith, at least of the rising generation, was fervent and sincere, and the devout liberality of the barbarians enriched the churches and monasteries of Spain. Seventy bishops, assembled in the Council of Toledo, received the submission of their conquerors, and the zeal of the Spaniards improved the Nicene Creed, by declaring the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Son, as well as from the Father, a weighty point of doctrine which produced, long afterwards, the schism of the Greek and Latin churches. The royal proselyte immediately saluted and consulted Pope Gregory, surnamed the Great, a learned and holy prelate whose reign was distinguished by the conversion of heretics and infidels. The ambassadors of Recared respectfully ordered, on the threshold of the Vatican, his rich presents of gold and gems. They accepted, as a lucrative exchange, the hairs of St. John the Baptist, a cross which enclosed a small piece of the true wood, and a key that contained some particles of iron which had been scraped from the chains of St. Peter. The same Gregory, the spiritual conqueror of Britain, encouraged the pious Theodolinda, Queen of the Lombards, to propagate the Nicene faith among the victorious savages, whose recent Christianity was polluted by the Arian heresy. Her devout labors still left room for the industry and success of future missionaries, and many cities of Italy were still disputed by hostile bishops. But the cause of Arianism was gradually suppressed by the weight of truth, 
of interest, and of example, and the controversy which Egypt had derived from the Platonic school was terminated, after a war of three hundred years, by the final conversion of the Lombards of Italy. The first missionaries who preached the gospel to the barbarians appealed to the evidence of reason and claimed the benefit of toleration. But no sooner had they established their spiritual dominion than they exhorted the Christian kings to extirpate, without mercy, the remains of Roman or barbaric superstition. The successors of Clovis inflicted one hundred lashes on the peasants who refused to destroy their idols. The crime of sacrificing to the demons was punished by the Anglo Saxon laws with the heavier penalties of imprisonment and confiscation, and even the wise Alfred adopted, as an indispensable duty, the extreme rigor of the Mosaic institutions. But the punishment and the crime were gradually abolished among a Christian people. The theological disputes of the schools were suspended by propitious ignorance, and the intolerant spirit which could find neither idolaters nor heretics was reduced to the persecution of the Jews. That exiled nation had founded some synagogues in the cities of Gaul, but Spain, since the time of Hadrian, was filled with their numerous colonies. The wealth which they accumulated by trade and the management of the finances invited the pious avarice of their masters. And they might be oppressed without danger, as they had lost the use and even the remembrance of arms. Sisebut, a Gothic king, who reigned in the beginning of the seventh century, proceeded at once to the last extremes of persecution. Ninety thousand Jews were compelled to receive the sacrament of baptism. The fortunes of the obstinate infidels were confiscated, their bodies were tortured, and it seems doubtful whether they were permitted to abandon their native country. The excessive zeal of the Catholic king was moderated, even by the clergy of Spain, who solemnly pronounced an inconsistent sentence, that the sacraments should not be forcibly imposed, but that the Jews who had been baptized should be constrained, for the honor of the church, to persevere in the external practice of religion which they disbelieved and detested. Their frequent relapses provoked one of the successors of Sisebut to banish the whole nation from his dominions, And a council of Toledo published a decree that every Gothic king should swear to maintain this salutary edict. But the tyrants were unwilling to dismiss the victims whom they delighted to torture, or to deprive themselves of the industrious slaves over whom they might exercise a lucrative oppression. The Jews still continued in Spain under the weight of the civil and ecclesiastical laws. Which in the same country have been faithfully transcribed in the code of the Inquisition. The Gothic kings and bishops at length discovered that injuries will produce hatred, and that hatred will find the opportunity of revenge. A nation, the secret or professed enemies of Christianity, still multiplied in servitude and distress, and the intrigues of the Jews promoted the rapid success of the Arabian conquerors. As soon as the barbarians withdrew their powerful support, the unpopular heresy of Arius sunk into contempt and oblivion. But the Greeks still retained their subtle and loquacious disposition, the establishment of an obscure doctrine suggested new questions and new disputes, and it was always in the power of an ambitious prelate or a fanatic monk to violate the peace of the church and perhaps of the empire. The historian of the empire may overlook these disputes, which were confined to the obscurity of schools and synods. The Manichaeans, who labored to reconcile the religions of Christ and Zoroaster, had secretly introduced themselves into the provinces, but these foreign sectaries were involved in the common disgrace of the Gnostics, and the imperial laws were executed by the public hatred. The rational opinions of the Pelagians were propagated from Britain to Rome. Africa and Palestine, and silently expired in a superstitious age. But the East was distracted by the Nestorian and Eutychian controversies, which attempted to explain the mystery of the incarnation, and hastened the ruin of Christianity in her native land. These controversies were first agitated under the reign of the younger Theodosius, but their important consequences extend far beyond the limits of the present volume. The metaphysical chain of argument, the contests of ecclesiastical ambition, and their political influence on the decline of the Byzantine Empire, 
may afford an interesting and instructive series of history, from the general councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon to the conquest of the East by the successors of Mohammed. The Gauls, who impatiently supported the Roman yoke, received a memorable lesson from one of the lieutenants of Vespasian, whose weighty sense has been refined and expressed by the genius of Tacitus. The protection of the Republic has delivered Gaul from internal discord and foreign invasions. By the loss of national independence, you have acquired the name and privileges of Roman citizens. You enjoy, in common with ourselves, the permanent benefits of civil government, and your remote situation is less exposed to the accidental mischiefs of tyranny. Instead of exercising the rights of conquest, we have been contented to impose such tributes as are requisite for your own preservation. Peace cannot be secured without armies, and armies must be supported at the expense of the people. It is for your sake, not for our own, that we guard the barrier of the Rhine against the ferocious Germans who have so often attempted, and who will always desire, to exchange the solitude of their woods and morasses for the wealth and fertility of Gaul. The fall of Rome would be fatal to the provinces, and you would be buried in the ruins of that mighty fabric which has been raised by the valor and wisdom of eight hundred years. Your imaginary freedom would be insulted and impressed by a savage master, and the expulsion of the Romans would be succeeded by the eternal hostilities of the barbarian conquerors. This salutary advice was accepted, and this strange prediction was accomplished. In the space of four hundred years, the hardy Gauls, who had encountered the arms of Caesar, were imperceptibly melted into the general mass of citizens and subjects. The Western Empire was dissolved, and the Germans who had passed the Rhine fiercely contended for the possession of Gaul, and excited the contempt or abhorrence of its peaceful and polished inhabitants. With that conscious pride which the preeminence of knowledge and luxury seldom fails to inspire, they derided the hairy and gigantic savages of the north, their rustic manners, dissonant joy, voracious appetite, and their horrid appearance, equally disgusting to the sight and to the smell. The liberal studies were still cultivated in the schools of Altoon and Bordeaux, and the language of Cicero and Virgil was familiar to the Gallic youth. Their ears were astonished by the harsh and unknown sounds of the Germanic dialect, and they ingeniously lamented that the trembling muses fled from the harmony of a Burgundian lyre. The Gauls were endowed with all the advantages of art and nature, but, as they wanted courage to defend them, they were justly condemned to obey, and even to flatter, the victorious barbarians by whose clemency they held their precarious fortunes and their lives. As soon as Odoacer had extinguished the Western Empire, he sought the friendship of the most powerful of the barbarians. The new sovereign of Italy resigned to Yorick, king of the Visigoths, all the Roman conquests beyond the Alps, and as far as the Rhine and the ocean. And the Senate might confirm this liberal gift with some ostentation of power, and without any real loss of revenue or dominion. The lawful pretensions of Yorick were justified by ambition and success, and the Gothic nation might aspire under his command to the monarchy of Spain and Gaul. Arles and Marseille surrendered to his arms. He oppressed the freedom of Auvergne, and the bishop condescended to purchase his recall from exile by a tribute of just but reluctant praise. Sidonius waited before the gates of the palace among a crowd of ambassadors and suppliants, and their various business at the court of Bordeaux attested the power and the renown of the king of the Visigoths. The Heruli of the distant ocean, who painted their naked bodies with its cerulean color, implored his protection, and the Saxons respected the maritime provinces of a prince who was destitute of any naval force. The tall Burgundians submitted to his authority, nor did he restore the captive Franks till he had imposed on that fierce nation the terms of an unequal peace. The Vandals of Africa cultivated his useful friendship, and the Ostrogoths of Pannonia were supported by his powerful aid against the oppression of the neighboring Huns. The North, such are the lofty strains of the poet, was agitated or appeased by the nod of Yurik. The great king of Persia consulted the oracle of the West, and the aged god of the Tiber was protected by the swelling genius of the Garon. The fortune of nations has often depended on accidents, 
and France may ascribe her greatness to the premature death of the Gothic king, at a time when his son Alaric was a helpless infant, and his adversary Clovis an ambitious and valiant youth. While Childeric, the father of Clovis, lived in exile in Germany, he was hospitably entertained by the queen as well as by the king of the Thuringians. After his restoration, Bafina escaped from her husband's bed to the arms of her lover, freely declaring that, if she had known a man wiser, stronger, or more beautiful than Childeric, that man should have been the object of her preference. Clovis was the offspring of this voluntary union, and when he was no more than fifteen years of age, he succeeded, by his father's death, to the command of the Salian tribe. The narrow limits of his kingdom were confined to the island of the Batavians, with the ancient diocese of Tournay and Arras, and the, at the baptism of Clovis the number of his warriors could not exceed five thousand. The kindred tribes of the Franks, who had seated themselves along the Belgic rivers, the Scheldt, the Meuse, the Moselle, and the Rhine, were governed by their independent kings of the Merovingian race, the equals, the allies, and sometimes the enemies of the Salic prince. But the Germans, who obeyed in peace the hereditary jurisdiction of their chiefs, was, were free to follow the standard of a popular and victorious general, and the superior merit of Clovis attracted the respect and allegiance of the national confederacy. When he first took the field, he had neither gold and silver in his coffers, nor wine and corn in his magazines, but he imitated the example of Caesar, who in the same country had acquired wealth by the sword and purchased soldiers with the fruits of conquest. After each successful battle or expedition, the spoils were accumulated in one common mass. Every warrior received his proportionable share, and the royal prerogative submitted to the equal regulations of military law. The untamed spirit of the barbarians was taught to acknowledge the advantages of regular discipline. At the annual review of the month of March, their arms were diligently inspected, and when they traversed a peaceful territory, they were prohibited from touching a blade of grass. The justice of Clovis was inexorable, and his careless or disobedient soldiers were punished with instant death. It would be superfluous to praise the valor of a Frank, but the valor of Clovis was directed by cool and consummate prudence. In all his transactions with mankind, he calculated the weight of interest, of passion, and of opinion, and his manners were sometimes adapted to the sanguinary measures of the Germans, and sometimes moderated by the milder genius of Rome and Christianity. He was intercepted in the career of victory, since he died in the forty-fifth year of his age, but he had already accomplished, in a reign of thirty years, the establishment of the French monarchy in Gaul. The first exploit of Clovis was the defeat of Syagrius, the son of Aegidius, and the public quarrel might on this occasion be inflamed by private resentment. The glory of the father still insulted the Merovingian race, the power of the son might excite the jealous ambition of the king of the Franks. Syagrius inherited, as a patrimonial estate, the city and diocese of Soissons, the desolate remnant of the second Belgic, Reims and Troyes, Beauvais and Amiens, would naturally submit to the count or patrician, and after the dissolution of the Western Empire, he might reign with the title, or at least with the authority of King of the Romans. As a Roman, he had been educated in the liberal studies of rhetoric and jurisprudence, but he was engaged by accident and policy in the familiar use of the Germanic idiom. The independent barbarians resorted to the tribunal of a stranger who possessed the singular talent of explaining, in their native tongue, the dictates of reason and equity. The diligence and affability of their judge rendered him popular. The impartial wisdom of his decrees obtained their voluntary obedience and the reign of Siagrius over the Franks and Burgundians seemed to revive the original institution of civil society. In the midst of these peaceful occupations, Siagrius received, and boldly accepted, the hostile defiance of Clovis, who challenged his rival in the spirit, and almost in the language of chivalry, to appoint the day and the field of battle. In the time of Caesar, Soissons would have poured forth a body of fifty thousand horse, and such an army might have been plentifully supplied with shields, cuirasses, and military engines from the three arsenals or manufacturers of the city. But the courage and the numbers of the Gallic youth were long since exhausted, 
and the loose bands of volunteers or mer mercenaries who marched under the standard of Sagrius were incapable of contending with the national valor of the Franks. It would be ungenerous, without some more accurate knowledge of his strength and resources, to condemn the rapid flight of Siagrius, who escaped, after the loss of a battle, to the distant court of Toulouse. The feeble minority of Alaric could not assist or protect an unfortunate fugitive. The pusillanimous Goths were intimidated by the menaces of Clovis, and the Roman king, after a short confinement, was delivered into the hands of the executioner. The Belgic cities surrendered to the king of the Franks, and his dominions were enlarged to the east by the ample diocese of Tongre, which Clovis subdued in the, in the tenth year of his reign. The name of the Alamanni has been absurdly derived from their imaginary settlements on the banks of the Laman Lake. That fortunate district, from the lake to Avench to, and Mount Jura, was occupied by the Burgundians. The northern parts of Helvetia had indeed been subdued by the ferocious Alamanni, who destroyed with their own hands the fruit of their conquest. A province, improved and adorned by the arts of Rome, was again reduced to a savage wilderness, and some vestige of the stately Vindanissa may still be discovered in the fertile and populous valley of the Arar. From the source of the Rhine to his conflux with the Maine and the Moselle, the formidable swarms of the Alamanni commanded either side of the river by the right of ancient possession or recent victory. They spread themselves into Gaul over the modern provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, and their bold invasion of the kingdom of Cologne summoned the Salic prince to the defense of his Ripurian allies. Clovis encountered the invaders of Gaul in the plain of Tobiac, about twenty-four miles from Cologne, and the two fiercest nations of Germany were mutually animated by the memory of past exploits and the prospect of future greatness. The Franks, after an obstinate struggle, gave way, and the Alamanni, raising a shout of victory, impetuously pressed the retreat. But the battle was restored by the valor, the conduct, and perhaps by the piety of Clovis. And the event of the bloody day decided forever the alternative of empire or servitude. The last king of the Alamanni was slain in the field, and his people were slaughtered and pursued till they threw down their arms and yielded to the mercy of the conqueror. Without discipline, it was impossible for them to rally. They had contemptuously demolished the walls and fortifications which might have protected their distress, and they were followed into the heart of their forests by an enemy not less active or intrepid than themselves. The great Theodoric congratulated the victory of Clovis, whose sister, Albofleda, the king of Italy, had lately married. But he mildly interceded with his brother in favor of the suppliants and fugitives who implored his protection. The Gallic territories, which were possessed by the Alamanni, became the prize of their conqueror, and the haughty nation, invincible or rebellious to the arms of Rome, acknowledged the sovereignty of the Merovingian kings, who graciously permitted them to enjoy their peculiar manners and institutions under the government of official and at length of hereditary dukes. After the conquest of the western provinces, the Franks alone maintained their ancient habitations beyond the Rhine. They gradually subdued and civilized the exhausted countries as far as the Elbe and the mountains of Bohemia, and the peace of Europe was secured by the obedience of Germany. Till the thirtieth year of his age, Clovis continued to worship the gods of his ancestors. His disbelief, or rather disregard of Christianity, might encourage him to pillage with less remorse the churches of an hostile territory. But his subjects of Gaul enjoyed the free exercise of religious worship, and the bishops entertained a more favorable hope of the idolater than of the heretics. The Merovingian prince had contracted a fortunate alliance with the fair Clotilda, the niece of the king of the Bur Burgundy, who in the midst of an Arian court was educated in the profession of the Catholic faith. It was her interest, as well as her duty, to achieve the con conversion of a pagan husband and Clovis insensibly elicited the voice of love and religion. He consented, perhaps such terms had been previously stipulated, to the baptism of his eldest son, and though the sudden death of the infant excited some superstitious fears, he was persuaded a second time to repeat the dangerous experiment. In the distress of the Battle of Tolbiac, Clovis loudly invoked the god of Clotilda 
and of the Christians. And the victory disposed him to hear, with respectful gratitude, the eloquent Remigius, the bishop of Rheim, who forcibly displayed the temporal and spiritual advantages of his conversion. The king declared himself satisfied of the truth of the Catholic faith, and the political reasons which might have suspended his public professions were removed by the devout or loyal acclamations of the Franks, who showed themselves alike prepared to follow their heroic leader to the field of battle or to the baptismal font. The important ceremony was performed in the Cathedral of Rheims with every circumstance of magnificence and solemnity which could impress an awful sense of religion on the minds of its rude proselytes. The new Constantine was immediately baptized with three thousand of his warlike subjects, and their example was imitated by the remainder of the gentle barbarians, who, in obedience to the victorious prelate, adored the cross which they had burnt, and burnt the idols which they had formerly adored. The mind of Clovis was susceptible of transient fervor. He was exasperated by the pathetic tale of the passion and death of Christ, and instead of weighing the salutary consequences of that mysterious sacrifice, he exclaimed with indiscreet fury, Had I been present at the head of my valiant Franks, I would have revenged his injuries. But the savage conqueror of Gaul was incapable of examining the proofs of a religion which depends on the laborious investigation of historic evidence and speculative theology. He was still more incapable of feeling the mild influence of the gospel which persuades and purifies the heart of a genuine convert. His ambitious reign was a perpetual violation of moral and Christian duties. His hands were stained with blood in peace as well as in war. And as soon as Clovis had di dismissed a synod of the Gallican church, he calmly assassinated all the princes of the Merovingian race. Yet the king of the Franks might sincerely worship the Christian God as a being more excellent and powerful than his national deities, and the signal deliverance and victory of Tolbiac encouraged Clovis to confide in the future protection of the Lord of Hosts. Martin, the most popular of the saints, had filled the western world with the fame of those miracles which were incessantly performed at his holy sepulchre of Tours. His visible or invisible aid promoted the cause of a liberal and orthodox prince, and the profane remark of Clovis himself that St. Martin was an expensive friend need not be interpreted as a symptom of any permanent or rational skepticism. But earth, as well as heaven, rejoiced in the conversion of the Franks. On the memorable day which Clovis ascended from the baptismal font, he alone in the Christian world deserved the name and prerogatives of a Catholic king. The emperor, Anastasius, entertained some dangerous errors concerning the nature of the divine incarnation. In the barbarians of Africa, Italy, Spain, and Gaul were involved in the Arian heresy. The eldest, or rather the only son of the church, was acknowledged by the clergy as their lawful sovereign or glorious deliverer, and the arms of Clovis were strenuously supported by the zeal in favor of the Catholic faction. Under the Roman Empire, the wealth and jurisdiction of the bishops, their sacred character and perpetual office, their numerous dependents, popular eloquence, and provincial assemblies had rendered them always respectable and sometimes dangerous. Their influence was augmented with the progress of superstition, and the establishment of the French monarchy may, in some degree, be ascribed to the firm alliance of a hundred prelates, who reigned in the discontented or independent cities of Gaul. The slight foundations of the Amorican Republic had been repeatedly shaken or overthrown, but the same people still guarded their domestic freedom, asserted the dignity of the Roman name, and bravely resisted the predatory inroads and regular attacks of Clovis, who labored to extend his conquests from the Seine to the Loire. Their successful opposition introduced an equal and honorable union. The Franks esteemed the valor of the Amoricans and the Amoricans were reconciled by the religion of the Franks. The military force which had been stationed for the defense of Gaul consisted of 100 different bands of cavalry or infantry, and these troops, while they assumed the title and privileges of Roman soldiers, were renewed by an incessant supply of the barbarian youth. The extreme fortifications and scattered fragments of the empire were still defended by their hopeless courage but their retreat was intercepted 
and their communication was impracticable. They were abandoned by the Greek princes of Constantinople, and they piously disclaimed all connections with the Aryan usurpers of Gaul. They accepted, without shame or reluctance, the generous capitulation which was proposed by a Catholic hero, and this spurious or legitimate progeny of the Roman legions were distinguished in the succeeding age by their arms, their ensigns, and their peculiar dress and institu institutions. But the national strength was increased by these powerful and voluntary accessions, and the neighboring kingdoms dreaded the numbers as well as the spirit of the Franks. The reduction of the northern provinces of Gaul, instead of being decided by the chance of a single battle, appears to have been slowly effected by the gradual operation of war and treaty, and Clovis acquired each object of his ambition by such efforts or such concessions as were adequate to its real value. His savage character and the virtues of Henry the Fourth suggest the most opposite ideas of human nature. Yet some resemblance may be found in the situation of two princes who conquered France by their valor, their policy, and the merits of a seasonable conversion. The kingdom of the Burgundians, which was defined by the course of two Gallic rivers, the Saint and the Rhone, ex extended from the forests of Vos to the Alps and the Sea of Marseille. The scepter was in the hands of Gundobald. That valiant and ambitious prince had reduced the number of royal candidates by the death of two brothers, one of whom was the father of Clotilda. But his imperfect prudence still permitted Godesgil, the youngest of his brothers, to possess the dependent principality of Geneva. The Arian monarch was justly alarmed by the satisfaction and the hopes which seemed to animate his clergy and people after the conversion of Clovis, and Gundobald convened at Lyon an assembly of his bishops to reconcile, if it were possible, their religious and political discontents. A vain conference was agitated between the two factions. The Arians upbraided the Catholics for the worship of three gods. The Catholics defended their cause by theological distinctions, and the usual arguments, objections, and replies were reverberated with obstinate clamor, till the king revealed his secret apprehensions by an abrupt but decisive question, which he addressed to the orthodox bishops. If you truly profess the Christian religion, why do you not restrain the king of the Franks? He has declared war against me, and forms alliances with my enemies for my destruction. A sanguinary and covetous mind is not the symptom of a sincere conversion. Let him show his faith by his works. The answer of Avitus, bishop of Vienne, who spoke in the name of his brethren, was delivered with the voice and countenance of an angel. We are ignorant of the motives and intentions of the king of the Franks, but we are taught by scripture that the kingdoms which abandon the divine law are frequently subverted, and that the enemies will arise on every side against those who have made God their enemy. Return with thy people to the law of God, and he will give peace and security to thy dominions. The king of Burgundy, who was not prepared to accept the condition which the Catholics considered as essential to the treaty, delayed and dismissed the ecclesiastical conference, after reproaching his bishops that Clovis, their friend and proselyte, had privately attempted the allegiance of his brother. The allegiance of his brother was already seduced, and the obedience of Godzigil, who joined the royal standard with the troops of Geneva, more effectually promoted the success of the conspiracy. While the Franks and Burgundians contended with equal valor, his seasonable desertion decided the event of the battle, and as Gundobald was faintly supported by the disaffected Gauls, he yielded to the arms of Clovis and hastily retreated from the field, which appears to have been situated between Langres and Dijon. He distrusted the strength of Dijon, a quadrangular fortress encompassed by two rivers and a wall thirty feet high and fifteen thick, with four gates and thirty-three towers. He abandoned to the pursuit of Clovis the important cities of Lyon and Vienne, and Gundobald still fled with precipitation till he had reached Avignon, at the distance of two hundred and fifty miles from the field of battle. A long siege and an artful negotiation admonished the king of the Franks of the danger and difficulty of his enterprise. He imposed a tribute on the Burgundian prince, compelled him to pardon and reward his brother's treachery, and proudly returned to his own dominions with the spoils and captives of the southern provinces. This splendid triumph 
was soon clouded by the intelligence that Gundobald had violated his recent obligations, and that the unfortunate Godzigil, who was left at Vienne with a garrison of five thousand francs, had been besieged, surprised, and massacred by his inhuman brother. Such an outrage might have exasperated the patience of the most peaceful sovereign, yet the conqueror of Gaul dissembled the injury released the tribute, and accepted the alliance and military servants of the king of Burgundy. Clovis no longer possessed those advantages which had assured the success of the preceding war, and his rival, instructed by adversity, had found new resources in the affections of his people. The Gauls, or Romans, applauded the mild and impartial laws of Gundobald, which almost raised them to the same level with their conquerors. The bishops were reconciled and flattered by the hopes which he artfully suggested of his approaching conversion, and though he eluded their accomplishment to the last moment of his life, his moderation secured the peace and suspended the ruin of the kingdom of Burgundy. I am impatient to pursue the final ruin of that kingdom, which was accomplished under the reign of Sigismund, the son of Gundobald. The Catholic Sigismund had acquired the honors of a saint and martyr, but the hands of the royal saint were stained with the blood of his innocent son whom he inhumanly sacrificed to the pride and resentment of a stepmother. He soon discovered his heir and bewailed the irreparable loss. While Sigismund embraced the corpse of the unfortunate youth, he received a severe admonition from one of his attendants. It is not his situation, O king. It is thine which deserves pity and lamentation. The reproaches of a guilty conscience were alleviated, however, by his liberal donations to the monastery of Agunum, or St. Maurice, in Valais, which he himself had founded in honor of the imaginary martyrs of the Thebian legion. A full chorus of perpetual psalmody was instituted by the pious king. He assiduously practiced the austere devotion of the monks, and it was his humble prayer that heaven would inflict in this world the punishment of his sins. His prayer was heard, the avengers were at hand, and the provinces of Burgundy were overwhelmed by an army of victorious Franks. After the event of an unsuccessful battle, Singusman, who wished to protract his life that he might prolong his penance, concealed himself in the desert in a religious habit till he was discovered and betrayed by his subjects, who solicited the favor of their new masters. The captive monarch, with his wife and two children, were transported to Orléans and buried alive in a deep well by the stern command of the sons of Clovis whose cruelty might derive some excuse from the maxims and examples of the barbarous age. Their ambition, which urged them to achieve the conquest of Burgundy, was inflamed or disguised by filial piety, and Clotilda, whose sanctity did not consist in the forgiveness of injuries, pressed them to revenge her father's death on the family of his assassin. The rebellious Burgundians, for they had attempted to break their chains, were still permitted to enjoy their national laws, under the obligations of tribute and military service, and the Merovingian princes peacefully reigned over a kingdom whose glory and greatness had first been overthrown by the arms of Clovis. The first victories of Clovis had insulted the honor of the Goths. They viewed his rapid progress with jealousy and terror, and the youthful fame of Alaric was oppressed by the more potent genius of his rival. Some disputes inevitably arose on the edge of their contiguous dominions and after the delays of fruitless negotiation, a personal interview of the two kings was proposed and accepted. The conference of Clovis and Alaric was held in a small island of the Loire, near Ambois. They embraced, familiarly conversed, and feasted together, and separated with the warmest professions of peace and brotherly love. But their apparent confidence concealed a dark suspicion of hostile and treacherous designs, and their mutual complaints solicited, alluded, and disclaimed a final arbitration. At Paris, which he had already considered as his royal seat, Clovis declared to an assembly of the princes and warriors the pretense and the motive of a Gothic war. It grieves me to see that the Arians still possess the fairest portion of Gaul. Let us march against them with the aid of God, and having vanquished the heretics, we will possess and defied their fertile provinces." The Franks, who were inspired by hereditary valor and recent zeal, applauded the generous design of their monarch, expressed their resolution to conquer or die, since death and conquest would be equally profitable, and solemnly protested that they would never shave their beards till victory should absolve them from that inconvenient vow. The enterprise was promoted by the public or private exhortations of Clotilda, 
She reminded her husband how effectually some pious foundation would propitiate the deity and his servants, and the Christian hero, darting his battle-axe with a skillful and nervous hand. There, said he, on that spot where my Francisca shall fall, will I erect a church in honor of the holy apostles. This ostentatious piety confirmed and justified the attachment of the Catholics, with whom he secretly corresponded, and their devout wishes were gradually ripened into a formidable conspiracy. The people of Aquitaine was alarmed by the indiscreet reproaches of the Gothic tyrants, who justly accused them of preferring the dominion of the Franks. And their zealous adherent, Quintianus, bishop of Vaudez, preached more forcibly in his exile than in his diocese. To resist these foreign and domestic enemies, who were fortified by the alliance of the Burgundians, Alaric collected his troops, far more numerous than the military powers of Clovis. The Visigoths resumed the exercise of arms, which they had neglected in a long and luxurious peace. A select band of valiant and robust slaves attended their masters to the field, and the cities of Gaul were compelled to furnish their doubtful and reluctant aid. Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, who reigned in Italy, had labored to maintain the tranquility of Gaul, and he assumed, or affected for that purpose, the impartial character of a mediator. But the sagacious monarch dreaded the rising empire of Clovis, and he was firmly engaged to support the national and religious cause of the Goths. The accidental or artificial prodigies which adorned the expedition of Clovis were accepted by a superstitious age as the manifest declaration of the divine favor. He marched from Paris, and as he proceeded with decent reverence through the holy dioceses of Tours, his anxiety tempted him to consult the shrine of St. Martin, the sanctuary and the oracle of Gaul. His messengers were instructed to remark the words of the psalm, which had happened to be chanted at the precise moment when they entered the church. Those words most fortunately expressed the valor and the victory of the champions of heaven, and the application was easily transferred to the new Joshua, the new Gideon, who went forth to battle against the enemies of the Lord. Orléans secured to the Franks a bridge on the Loire, but at the distance of forty miles from Poitiers, their progress was intercepted by an extraordinary swell of the river Vigena, or Vienne, and the opposite banks were covered by the encampment of the Visigoths. Delay must always be dangerous to barbarians, who consume the country through which they march, and had Clovis possessed leisure and materials, it might have been impracticable to construct a bridge or to force a passage in the face of a superior enemy. But the affectionate peasants, who were impatient to welcome the deliverer, could easily betray some unknown or unguarded ford. The merit of the discovery was enhanced by the useful interposition of fraud or fiction, and a white heart of singular size and beauty, appeared to guide and animate the march of the Catholic army. The councils of the Visigoths were irresolute and distracted. A crowd of impatient warriors, presumptuous in their strength and disdaining to fly before the robbers of Germany, excited Alaric to assert in arms the name and blood of the conqueror of Rome. The advice of the graver chieftains pressed him to elude the first ardor of the Franks, and to expect in the southern provinces of Gaul, the veteran and victorious Ostrogoths, whom the king of Italy had already sent to his assistance. The decisive moments were wasted in idle deliberation, and the Goths too hastily abandoned, perhaps, an advantageous post, and the opportunity of a secure retreat was lost by their slow and disorderly motions. After Clovis had passed the ford, as it is still named, of the heart, he advanced with bold and hasty steps to prevent the escape of the enemy. His nocturnal march was directed by a flaming meteor suspended in the air above the cathedral portier, and this signal, which might be previously concerted with the orthodox successor of St. Hilary, was compared to the column of fire that guided the Israelites in the desert. At the third hour of the day, about ten miles beyond portier, Clovis overtook and instantly attacked the Gothic army, whose defeat was already prepared by terror and confusion. Yet they rallied in their extreme distress, and the martial youths, who had clamorously demanded the battle, refused to survive the ignominy of flight. The two kings encountered each other in single combat. Alaric fell by the hand of his rival, and the victorious Frank was saved, by the goodness of his cuirass and the vigor of his horse, from the spears of two desperate Goths, who furiously rode against him to revenge the death of their sovereign. The vague expression of a mountain of the slain serves to indicate a cruel, though indefinite, slaughter. But Gregory has carefully observed that his valiant countrymen, 
Apollinarius, the son of Sidonius, lost his life at the head of the nobles of Avernia. Perhaps these suspected Catholics had been maliciously exposed to the blind assault of the enemy, and perhaps the influence of religion was superseded by personal attachment or military honor. Such is the empire of fortune, if we may still disguise our ignorance under that popular name, that it is almost equally difficult to foresee the events of war or to explain their various consequences. A bloody and complete victory has sometimes yielded no more than the possession of the field, and the loss of 10,000 men has sometimes been sufficient to destroy in a single day the work of ages. The decisive battle of Portier was followed by the conquest of Aquitaine. Alaric had left behind him an infant son, a bastard competitor, factious nobles, and a disloyal people, and the remaining forces of the Goths were oppressed by the general consternation or opposed to each other in civil discord. The victorious king of the Franks proceeded without delay to the siege of Angoulême. At the sound of his trumpets, the walls of the city imitated the example of Jericho and instantly fell to the ground, a splendid miracle which may be reduced to the supposition that some clerical engineers had secretly undermined the foundations of the rampart. At Bordeaux, which submitted without resistance, Clovis established his winter quarters, and his prudent economy transported from Toulouse the royal treasuries, which were deposited in the capital of the monarchy. The conqueror penetrated as far as the confines of Spain, restored the honors of the Catholic Church, fixed in Aquitaine a colony of Franks, and delegated to his lieutenants the easy task of subduing or extirpating the nation of the Visigoths. But the Visigoths were protected by the wise and powerful monarch of Italy. While the balance was still equal, Theodoric had perhaps delayed the march of the Ostrogoths, but their strenuous efforts successfully resisted the ambition of Clovis, and the army of the Franks and their Burgundian allies was compelled to raise the siege of Arles, with the loss, as it was said, of thirty thousand men. These vicissitudes inclined the fierce spirit of Clovis to acquiesce in an advantageous treaty of peace. The Visigoths were suffered to retain the possession of Septimania, a narrow tract of seacoast from the Rhone to the Pyrenees, but the ample province of Aquitaine, from those mountains to the Loire, was ill-dissolvably united to the kingdom of France. After the success of the Gothic War, Clovis accepted the honors of the Roman consulship. The emperor Anastasius ambitiously bestowed on the most powerful rival of Theodoric the titles and ensigns of that eminent dignity. Yet, from some unknown cause, the name of Clovis has not been inscribed in the Fasti, either in the east or west. On the solemn day, the monarch of Gaul, placing a diadem on his head, was invested in the church of St. Martin with a purple tunic and mantle. From thence, he proceeded on horseback to the cathedral of Tours, and, as he passed through the streets, profusely scattered with his own hand a donative of gold and silver to the joyful multitude, who incessantly repeated their acclamations of Consul and Augustus. The legal or actual authority of Clovis could not receive any new accessions from the consular dignity. It was a name, a shadow, an empty pageant. And if the conqueror had been instructed to claim the ancient prerogatives of that high office, they must have expired with the period of its annual duration. But the Romans were disposed to revere in the person of their master that antique title which the emperors condescended to assume. The barbarian himself seemed to contract a sacred obligation to respect the majesty of the Republic, and the successors of Theodosius, by soliciting his friendship, tacitly forgave and almost ratified the usurpation of Gaul. Twenty-five years after the death of Clovis, this important concession was more formally declared in the treaty between his sons and the Emperor Justinian. The Ostrogoths of Italy, unable to defend their distant acquisitions, had resigned to the Franks the cities of Arles and Marseilles. Of Arles, still adorned with the seat of a Praetorian prefect, and of Marseilles, enriched by the advantages of trade and navigation. This transaction was confirmed by the imperial authority, and Justinian, generously yielding to the Franks the sovereignty of the countries beyond the Alps, which they already possessed, absolved the presentials from their allegiance, and established on a more lawful, though not more solid, foundation the throne of the Merovingians. After that era, they enjoyed the right of celebrating at Arles the games of the circus, and by a singular privilege, which was denied even to the Persian monarch, the gold coin impressed their name and image, obtained a legal currency in the empire. A Greek historian of that age has praised the private and public virtues of the Franks, with a partial enthusiasm 
which that cannot be sufficiently justified by their domestic annals. He celebrates their politeness and urbanity, their regular government and orthodox religion, and boldly asserts that these barbarians could be distinguished only by their dress and language from the subjects of Rome. Perhaps the Franks already displayed the social disposition and lively graces, which in every age have disguised their vices and sometimes concealed their intrinsic merit. Perhaps Agathius and the Greeks were dazzled by the rapid progress of their arms and the splendor of their empire. Since the conquest of Burgundy, Gaul, except the Gothic province of Septimania, was subject in its whole extent to the sons of Clovis. They had extinguished the German kingdom of Thuringia, and their vague dominion penetrated beyond the Rhine into the heart of their native forests. The Alemanni and Bavarians, who had occupied the Roman provinces of Raetia and Noricum to the south of the Danube, confessed themselves the humble vassals of the Franks, and the feeble barrier of the Alps was incapable of resisting their ambition. When the last survivor of the sons of Clovis united the inheritance and the conquests of the Merovingians, his kingdom extended far beyond the limits of modern France. Yet modern France, such has been the progress of arts and policy, far surpasses in wealth and populousness and power the spacious yet savage realms of Clotaire or Dagobert. The Franks, or French, are the only people of Europe who can deduce a perpetual secession from the conquerors of the Western Empire, but their conquest of Gaul was followed by ten centuries of anarchy and ignorance. On the revival of learning, the students who had been formed in the schools of Athens and Rome disdained their barbarian ancestors, and a long period elapsed before the patient labor could provide the requisite materials to satisfy, or rather to excite, the curiosity of more enlightened times. At length, the eye of criticism and philosophy was directed to the antiquities of France, but even philosophers have been tainted by the contagion of prejudice and passion. The most extreme and exclusive systems of the personal servitude of the Gauls, or of their voluntary and equal alliance with the Franks, have been rashly conceived and obstinately defended, and the intemperate disputants have accused each other of conspiring against the prerogative of the crown, the dignity of the nobles, or the freedom of the people. Yet the sharp conflict has usefully exercised the adverse powers of learning and genius, and each antagonist, alternately vanquished and victorious, has extirpated some ancient errors and established some interesting truths. An impartial stranger, instructed by their discoveries, their disputes, and even their faults, may describe from the same original materials the state of the Roman provincials after Gaul had submitted to the arms and laws of the Merovingian kings. The rudest, or the most servile condition of human society is regulated, however, by some fixed and general rules. When Tacitus surveyed the primitive simplicity of the Germans, he discovered some permanent maxims or customs of public and private life which were preserved by faithful tradition till the introduction of the art of writing and of the Latin tongue. Before the election of the Merovingian kings, the most powerful tribe or nation of the Franks appointed four venerable chieftains to compose the Salic Laws, and their labors were examined and approved in three successive assemblies of the people. After the baptism of Clovis, he reformed several articles that appeared incompatible with Christianity. The Salic Law was again amended by his sons, and at length, under the reign of Dagobert, the code was revised and promulgated in its actual form, 120 years after the establishment of the French monarchy. Within the same period, the customs of the Ripurians were transcribed and published, and Charlemagne himself, the legislator of his age and country, had accurately studied the two national laws which still prevailed among the Franks. The same care was extended to their vassals, and the rude institutions of the Alemanni and Bavarians were diligently compiled and ratified by the supreme authority of the Merovingian kings. The Visigoths and Burgundians, whose conquests in Gaul preceded those of the Franks, showed less impatience to attain one of the principal benefits of civilized society. Yorick was the first of the Gothic princes who expressed in writing the manners and customs of his people, and the compositions of the Burgundian laws was a measure of policy rather than of justice, to alleviate the yoke and regain the affections of their Gallic subjects. Thus, by a singular coincidence, the Germans framed their artless institutions at a time when the elaborate system of Roman jurisprudence was finally consummated. In the Salic Laws and the Pandects of Justinian, we may compare the first rudiments and the full maturity of civil wisdom. And whatever prejudices may be suggested in favor of barbarism 
our calmer reflections will ascribe to the Romans the superior advantage not only of science and reason, but of humanity and justice. Yet the laws of the barbarians were adapted to their wants and desires, their occupations and their capacity, and they all contributed to preserve the peace and to promote the improvements of the society for whose use they were originally established. The Merovingians, instead of imposing a uniform rule of conduct on their various subjects, permitted each people and each family of their empire freely to enjoy their domestic institutions, nor were the Romans excluded from the common benefits of this legal toleration. The children embraced the law of their parents, the wife that of her husband, the freedman that of his patron, and in all causes where the parties were of different nations, the plaintiff or accuser was obliged to follow the tribunal of the defendant, who may always plead a judicial presumption of the right or innocence. A more ample latitude was allowed if every citizen, in the presence of a judge, might declare the law under which he desired to live, and the national society to which he chose to belong. Such an indulgence would abolish the partial distinctions of victory, and the Roman provincials might patiently acquiesce in the hardships of their condition, since it depended on themselves to assume the privilege if they dared to assert the character of free and warlike barbarians. When justice inexorably requires the death of a murderer, each private citizen is fortified by the assurance that the laws, the magistrate, and the whole community are the guardians of his personal safety. But in the loose society of the Germans, revenge was always honorable and often meritorious. The independent warrior chastised or vindicated with his own hand the injuries which he had offered or received, and he had only to dread the resentment of the sons and kinsmen of the enemy whom he had sacrificed to his selfish or angry passions. The magistrate, conscious of his weakness, interposed, not to punish, but to reconcile, and he was satisfied if he could persuade or compel the contending parties to pay or to accept the moderate fine which had been ascertained as the price of blood. The fierce spirit of the Franks would have opposed a more rigorous sentence. The same fierceness despised these ineffectual restraints, and when their simple manners had been corrupted by the wealth of Gaul, the public peace was continuously violated by acts of hasty or deliberate guilt. In every just government the same penalty is inflicted, or at least is imposed, for the murder of a peasant or a prince. But the national inequality established by the Franks in their criminal proceedings was the last insult and abuse of conquest. In the calm moments of legislation, they solemnly pronounced that the life of a Roman was of smaller value than that of a barbarian. The Antrustian, a name expressive of the most illustrious birth or dignity among the Franks, was appreciated at the sum of six hundred pieces of gold, while the noble provincial, who was admitted to the king's table, might be legally murdered at the expense of three hundred pieces. Two hundred was deemed sufficient for a Frank of ordinary condition, but the meaner Romans were exposed to disgrace and danger by a trifling compensation of one hundred or even fifty pieces of gold. Had these laws been regulated by any principle of equity or reason, the public protection should have supplied, in just proportion, the want of personal strength. But the legislator had weighed in the scale, not of justice, but of policy, the loss of a soldier against that of a slave. The head of an insolent and rapacious barbarian was guarded by a heavy fine, and the slightest aid was afforded to the most defenseless subjects. Time insensibly abated the pride of the conquerors, and the patience of the vanquished, and the boldest citizen was taught by experience that he might suffer more injuries than he could inflict. As the manners of the Franks became less ferocious, their laws were rendered more severe, and the Merovingian kings attempted to imitate the impartial rigor of the Visigoths and Burgundians. Under the empire of Charlemagne, murder was universally punished with death, and the use of capital punishments has been liberally multiplied in the jurisprudence of modern Europe. The civil and military professions, which had been separated by Constantine, were again united by the barbarians. The harsh sound of the Teutonic appellations were mollified into the Latin titles of Duke, of count or of prefect, and the same officer assumed within his district the command of the troops and the administration of justice. But the fierce and illiterate chieftain was seldom qualified to discharge the duties of a judge, which require all the faculties of a philosophic mind, laboriously cultivated by experience and study, 
and his rude ignorance was compelled to embrace some simple and visible methods of ascertaining the cause of justice. In every religion, the deity has been invoked to confirm the truth or to punish the falsehood of human testimony. But this powerful instrument was misapplied and abused by the simplicity of the German legislators. The party accused might justify his innocence by producing before the tribunal a number of friendly witnesses who solemnly declared their belief or assurance that he was not guilty. According to the weight of the charge, this legal number of compurgators was multiplied. Seventy-two voices were required to absolve an incendiary or assassin. When the chastity of a queen of France was suspected, three hundred gallant nobles swore without hesitation that the infant prince had been actually begotten by her deceased husband. The sin and scandal of manifest and frequent perjuries engaged the magistrates to remove these dangerous temptations and to supply the defects of human testimony by the famous experiments of fire and water. These extraordinary trials were so capriciously contrived that in some cases guilt and the innocence in others could not be proved without the interposition of a miracle. Such miracles were readily provided by fraud and credulity. The most intricate causes were determined by this easy and infallible method, and the turbulent barbarians, who might have disdained the sentence of a magistrate, submissively acquiesced in the judgment of God. But the trials of single combat gradually obtained superior credit and authority among a warlike people, who could not believe that a brave man deserved to suffer, or that a coward deserved to live. Both in civil and criminal proceedings, the plaintiff or accuser, the defendant, or even the witness, were exposed to mortal challenge from the antagonist who was destitute of legal proofs, and it was incumbent on them either to desert their cause or publicly to maintain their honor in the lists of battle. They fought either on foot or on horseback, according to the custom of their nation, and the decision of the sword or lance was ratified by the sanction of heaven, of the judge, and of the people. This sanguinary law was introduced into Gaul by the Burgundians, and their legislator Gundobald condescended to answer the complaints and objections of his subject, Avitus. Is it not true, said the king of Burgundy to the bishop, that the event of national wars and private combats is directed by the judgment of God, and that his providence awards the victory to the juster cause? By such prevailing arguments, the absurd and cruel practice of judicial duels, which had been peculiar to some tribes of Germany, was propagated and established in all the monarchies of Europe, from Sicily to the Baltic. At the end of ten centuries, the reign of legal violence was not totally extinguished and the ineffectual censures of saints, of popes, and of synods may seem to prove that the influence of superstition is weakened by its unnatural alliance with reason and humanity. The tribunals were stained with the blood, perhaps, of innocent and respectable citizens. The law, which now favors the rich, then yielded to the strong, and the old, the feeble, and the infirm were condemned either to renounce their fairest claims and possessions, to sustain the dangers of an unequal conflict, or to trust the doubtful aid of a mercenary champion. This oppressive jurisprudence was imposed on the provincials of Gaul, who complained of any injuries in their persons and property. Whatever might be the strength or courage of individuals, the victorious barbarians excelled in the love and exercise of arms, and the vanquished Roman was unjustly summoned to repeat in his own person the bloody contest which had already been decided against his country. A devouring host of 120,000 Germans had formerly passed the Rhine under the command of Ariovistus. One-third part of the fertile lands of the Sequani was appropriated to their use, and the conqueror soon repeated his oppressive demand of another third for the accommodation of a new colony of 24,000 barbarians, whom he had invited to share the rich harvest of Gaul. At the distance of 500 years, the Visigoths and Burgundians, who revenged the defeat of Ariovistus, usurped the same unequal proportion of two-thirds of the subject lands. But this distribution, instead of spreading over the province, may be reasonably confined to the peculiar districts where the victorious people had been planted by their own choice or the policy of their leader. In these districts, each barbarian was connected by the ties of hospitality with some Roman provincial. To this unwelcome guest, the proprietor was compelled to abandon two-thirds of his patrimony. But the German, a shepherd and a hunter, might sometimes content himself with a spacious range of wood and pasture, 
and resigned the smallest, though most valuable portion, to the toil of the industrious husbandman. The silence of ancient and authentic testimony has encouraged an opinion that the rapine of the Franks was not moderated or disguised by the forms of a legal division, that they dispersed themselves over the provinces of Gaul without order or control, and that each victorious robber, according to his wants, his avarice, and his strength, measured with his sword the extent of his new inheritance. At a distance from their sovereign, the barbarians might indeed be tempted to exercise such arbitrary depredation, but the firm and artful policy of Clovis must curb a licentious spirit, which would aggravate the misery of the vanquished, whilst it corrupted the union and discipline of the conquerors. The memorable vase of Soissons is a monument and a pledge of the regular distribution of the Gallic spoils. It was the duty and interest of Clovis to provide rewards for a successful army, and settlements for a numerous people, without inflicting any wanton or superfluous injuries on the loyal Catholics of Gaul. The ample fund, which he might lawfully acquire of the imperial patrimony, vacant lands, and Gothic usurpations, would diminish the cruel necessity of seizure and confiscation, and the humble provincials would more patiently acquiesce in the equal and regular distribution of their loss. The wealth of the Merovingian princes consisted in their extensive domain. After the conquest of Gaul, they still delighted in the rustic simplicity of their ancestors. The cities were abandoned to solitude and decay, and their coins, their charters, and their synods are still inscribed with the names of the villas or rural palaces in which they successfully resided. One hundred and sixty of these palaces, a title which need not excite any unseasonable ideas of art or luxury, were scattered throughout the provinces of their kingdom and if some might claim the honors of a fortress, the far greater part could be esteemed only in the light of profitable farms. The mansion of the long-haired kings was surrounded with convenient yards and stables for the cattle and the poultry. The garden was planted with useful vegetables. The various trades, the labors of agriculture, and even the arts of hunting and fishing were exercised by the servile hands for the emolument of the sovereign. His magazines were filled with corn and wine, either for sale or consumption, and the whole administration was conducted by the strictest maxims of private economy. This ample patrimony was appropriated to supply the hospitable plenty of Clovis and his successors, and to reward the fidelity of their brave companions, who, both in peace and war, were devoted to their personal service. Instead of a horse or a suit of armor, each companion, according to his rank or merit or favor, was invested with a benefice, the primitive name and most simple form of the feudal possessions. These gifts might be resumed at the pleasure of the sovereign, and his feeble prerogative derived some support from the influence of his liberality. But this dependent tenure was gradually abolished by the independent and rapacious nobles of France who established the perpetual property and hereditary secession of their benefices, a revolution salutary to the earth, which had been injured or neglected by its precarious masters. Besides these royal and beneficiary estates, a large proportion had been assigned in the division of Gaul of allodial and Salic lands. They were exempt from tribute, and the Salic lands were equally shared among the male descendants of the Franks. In the bloody discord and silent decay of the Merovingian line, a new order of tyrants arose in the provinces, who, under the appellation of seniors or lords, usurped a right to govern and a license to oppress the subjects of their peculiar territory. Their ambition might be checked by the hostile resistance of an equal, but the laws were extinguished, and the sacrilegious barbarians who dared to provoke the vengeance of a saint or bishop would seldom respect the landmarks of a profane and defenseless neighbor. The common or public right of nature, such as they had always been deemed by the Roman jurisprudence, were severely restrained by the German conquerors, whose amusement, or rather passion, was the exercise of hunting. The vague dominion which man has assumed over the wild inhabitants of the earth, the air, and the waters, was confined to some fortunate individuals of the human species. Gaul was again overspread with woods, and the animals, who were reserved for the use or pleasure of the Lord, might ravage with impunity the fields of his industrious vassals. The chase was the sacred privilege of the nobles and their domestic servants. 
plebeian transgressors were legally chastised with stripes and imprisonment. But in an age which admitted a slight composition for the life of a citizen, it was a capital crime to destroy a stag or wild bull within the precincts of the royal forests. According to the maxims of ancient war, the conqueror became the lawful master of the enemy whom he had subdued and spared, and the fruitful cause of personal slavery, which had been almost suppressed by the peaceful sovereignty of Rome, was again revived and multiplied by the perpetual hostilities of the independent barbarians. The Goth, the Burgundian, or the Frank, who returned from a successful expedition, dragged after him a long train of sheep, of oxen, and of human captives, whom he treated with the same brutal contempt. The youths of an elegant form and ingenious aspect were set apart for the domestic service, a doubtful situation, which alternately exposed them to the favorable or cruel impulse of passion. The useful mechanics and servants, smiths, carpenters, tailors, shoemakers, cooks, gardeners, dyers, and workmen in gold and silver, etc., employed their skill for the use or profit of their master. But the Roman captives, who were destitute of art, but capable of labor, were condemned, without regard to their former rank, to tend the cattle and cultivate the lands of the barbarians. The number of the hereditary bondsmen who were attached to the Gallic estates was continuously increased by new supplies, and the servile people, according to the situation and temper of their lords, was sometimes raised by precarious indulgence, and more frequently depressed by capricious despotism. An absolute power of life and death was exercised by these lords, and when they married their daughters, a train of useful servants, chained on the wagons to prevent their escape, was sent as a nuptial present into a distant country. The magistracy of the Roman laws protected the liberty of each citizen against the rash effects of his own distress or despair, but the subjects of the Merovingian kings might alienate their personal freedom, and this act of legal suicide which was familiarly practiced, is expressed in terms most disgraceful and afflicting to the dignity of human nature. The example of the poor, who purchase life by the sacrifice of all that can render life desirable, was gradually imitated by the feeble and the devout, who, in times of public disorder, pusillanimously crowded to shelter themselves under the battlements of a powerful chief and around the shrine of a popular saint. Their submission was accepted, by these temporal or spiritual patrons, and the hasty transaction irrevocably fixed their own condition and that of their latest posterity. From the reign of Clovis, during five successive centuries, the laws and manners of Gaul uniformly tended to promote the increase and to confirm the duration of personal servitude. Time and violence had almost obliterated the intermediate ranks of society, and left an obscure and narrow interval between the noble and the slave. This arbitrary and recent division has been transformed by pride and prejudice into a national distinction, universally established by the arms and laws of the Merovingians. The nobles who claim their genuine or fabulous descent from the independent and victorious Franks have asserted and abused the indefeasible right of conquest over a prostrate crowd of slaves and plebeians, to whom they imputed the imaginary disgrace of a Gallic or Roman extraction. The general state in revolutions of France, a name which was imposed by the conquerors, may be illustrated by the particular example of a province, a diocese, or a senatorial family. Auvergne had formerly maintained a just preeminence among the independent states and cities of Gaul. The brave and numerous inhabitants displayed a singular trophy, the sword of Caesar himself, which he had lost when he was repulsed before the walls of Gergovia. As the common offspring of Troy, they claimed a fraternal alliance with the Romans, and if each province had imitated the courage and loyalty of Auvergne, the fall of the Western Empire might have been prevented or delayed. They firmly maintained the fidelity which they had reluctantly sworn to the Visigoths, but when their bravest nobles had fallen in the Battle of Poitiers, they accepted without resistance a victorious and Catholic sovereign. This easy and valuable conquest was achieved and possessed by Theodoric, the eldest son of Clovis. But the remote province was separated from his Austrasian dominions by the intermediate kingdoms of Soissons, Paris, and Orléans, which formed, after their father's death, the inheritance of his three brothers. 
The king of Paris, Childebert, was tempted by the neighborhood and beauty of Auvergne, the upper country which rises towards the south into the mountains of the Cévennes, presented a rich and various prospect of woods and pastures. The sides of the hills were clothed with vines, and each eminence was crowned with a villa or castle. In the lower Auvergne, the river Aouye flows through the fair and spacious plain of La Mangue, and the inexhaustible fertility of the soil supplied, and still supplies, without any interval of repose, the constant repetition of the same harvests. On the false report that their lawful sovereign had been slain in Germany, the city and diocese of Auvergne was betrayed by the grandson of Sidonius Apollonarius. Childebert enjoyed this clandestine victory, and the free subjects of Theodoric threatened to desert his standard if he indulged his private resentment while that nation was engaged in the Burgundian War. But the Franks of Austrasia soon yielded to the persuasive eloquence of their king. Follow me, said Theodoric, into Auvergne. I will lead you into a province where you will acquire gold, silver, slaves, cattle, and precious apparel to the full extent of your wishes. I repeat my promise. I give you the people and their wealth as your prey, and you may transport them at pleasure into your own country. By the execution of this promise, Theodoric justly forfeited the allegiance of a people whom he devoted to destruction. His troops, reinforced by the fiercest barbarians of Germany, spread desolation over the fruitful face of Auvergne, and two places only, a strong castle and a holy shrine, were saved or redeemed from their licentious fury. The castle of Moroliac was seated on a lofty rock which rose a hundred feet above the surface of the plain, and a large reservoir of fresh water was enclosed with some arable lands within the circle of its fortifications. The Franks beheld with envy and despair this impregnable fortress, but they surprised a party of fifty stragglers, and, as they were oppressed by the numbers of their captives, they fixed at a trifling ransom the alternative of life or death for these wretched victims, whom the cruel barbarians were prepared to massacre on the refusal of the garrison. Another detachment penetrated as far as Brivas or Briaud, where the inhabitants, with their valuable effects, had taken refuge in the sanctuary of St. Julian. The doors of this church resisted the assault, but a daring soldier entered through a window of the choir and opened a passage to his companions. The clergy and people, the sacred and the profane spoils, were rudely torn from the altar, and the sacrilegious division was made at a small distance from the town of Briaud. But this act of impiety was severely chastised by the devout son of Clovis. He punished with death the most atrocious offenders, left their secret accomplices to the vengeance of St. Julian, released the captives, restored the plunder, and extended the rites of sanctuary five miles around the sepulchre of the holy martyr. Before the Austrasian army retreated from Auvergne, Theodoric exacted some pledges of the future loyalty of a people whose just hatred could be restrained only by their fear. A select band of noble youths, the sons of the principal senators, was delivered to the conqueror as the hostages of the faith of Childebert and of their countrymen. On the first rumor of war or conspiracy, these guiltless youths were reduced to a state of servitude, and one of them, Attalus, whose adventures are more particularly related, kept his master's horses in the diocese of Treva. After a painful search, he was discovered in this unworthy occupation by the emissaries of his grandfather, Gregory, Bishop of Longer, but his offers of ransom were sternly rejected by the avarice of the barbarian, who required an exorbitant sum of ten pounds of gold for the freedom of his noble captive. His deliverance was effected by a hardy stratagem of Leo, a slave belonging to the kitchens of the bishops of Longra. An unknown agent easily introduced him into the same family. The barbarian purchased Leo for the price of twelve pieces of gold, and was pleased to learn that he was deeply skilled in the luxury of an episcopal table. Next Sunday, said the Frank, I shall invite my neighbors and kinsmen, exert thy art, and force them to confess that they have never seen or tasted such an entertainment, even in the king's house. Leo assured him that, if he would provide a sufficient quantity of poor poultry, his wishes would be satisfied. The master, who already aspired to the merit of elegant hospitality, assumed as his own the praise which the voracious guests unanimously bestowed on his cook and the dexterous Leo insensibly acquired the trust and management of his household. After the patient expectation of a whole year, 
he cautiously whispered his design to Attalus, and exhorted him to prepare for flight in the ensuing night. At the hour of midnight, the intemperate guests retired from table, and the frank son-in-law, whose Leo attended to his apartment with a nocturnal potation, condescended to jest on the faculty with which he might betray his trust. The intrepid slave, after sustaining this dangerous raillery, entered his master's bedchamber, removed his spear and shield, silently drew the fleetest horses from the stable, unbarred the ponderous gates, and excited Atlas to save his life and liberty by incessant diligence. Their apprehensions urged them to leave their horses on the banks of the Meuse. They swam the river, wandered three days in the adjacent forest, and subsisted only by the accidental discovery of a wild plum tree. As they lay concealed in a dark thicket, they heard the noise of horses. They were terrified by the angry countenance of their master, and they anxiously listened to his declaration that, if he could seize the guilty fugitives, one of them he would cut in pieces with his sword, the other would be exposed on a gibbet. At length Attalus and his faithful Leo reached the friendly habitations of a presbyter of Reim, who recruited their fainting strength with bread and wine, concealed them from the search of their enemy, and safely conducted them beyond the limits of the Austrasian kingdom to the episcopal palace of Longra. Gregory embraced his grandson with tears of joy, gratefully delivered Leo with his whole family from the yoke of servitude, and bestowed on him the property of a farm where he might end his days in happiness and freedom. Perhaps this singular adventure, which is marked with so many circumstances of truth and nature, was related by Attalus himself to his cousin or nephew, the first historian of the Franks. Gregory of Tours was born about sixty years after the death of Sidonius Apollinarius, and their situation was almost similar, since each of them was a native of Auvergne, a senator, and a bishop. The difference of their style and sentiments may, therefore, express the decay of Gaul, and clearly ascertain how much, in so short a space, the human mind had lost of its energy and refinement. We are now qualified to despise the opposite and perhaps artful misrepresentations which have softened or exaggerated the oppression of the Romans of Gaul under the reign of the Merovingians. The conquerors never promulgated any universal edict of servitude or confiscation, but a degenerate people, who excused their weakness by the specious names of politeness and peace, were exposed to the arms and laws of the ferocious barbarians, who contemptuously insulted their possessions, their freedom, and their safety. Their personal insults were partial and irregular, but the great body of the Romans survived the revolution and still preserved the property and privileges of citizens. A large portion of their lands was exhausted for the use of the Franks, but they enjoyed the remainder exempt from tribute, and the same irresistible violence which swept away the arts and manufacturers of Gaul destroyed the elaborate and expensive system of imperial despotism. The provincials must frequently deplore the savage jurisprudence of the Salic or Ripurian laws, but their private life, in the important concerns of marriage, testaments, or inheritance, was still regulated by the Theodosian Code, and a discontented Roman might freely aspire or descend to the title and character of a barbarian. The honors of the state were accessible to his ambition. The education and temper of the Romans more peculiarly qualified them for offices of civil government, and as soon as emulation had rekindled their military ardor, they were permitted to march in the ranks and even at the head of the victorious Germans. I shall not attempt to enumerate the generals and magistrates whose names attest the liberal policy of the Merovingians. The supreme command of Burgundy, with the title of patrician, was successfully entrusted to three Romans. The last and most powerful, Momulus, who alternately saved and disturbed the monarchy, had supplanted his father in the station of Count of Autun, and left the treasury of thirty talents of gold and two hundred and fifty talents of silver. The fierce and illiterate barbarians were excluded during several generations from the dignities and even from the orders of the church. The clergy of Gaul consisted almost entirely of native provincials. The haughty Franks fell prostrate at the feet of their subjects who were dignified with the episcopal character and the power and riches which had been lost in war were insensibly recovered by superstition. In all temporal affairs, the Theodosian Code was the universal law of the clergy, but the barbaric jurisprudence had liberally provided for their personal safety. A subdeacon was equivalent to two francs, and Altrusian and priest were held in similar estimation. 
and the life of a bishop was appreciated far above the common standard, at the price of nine hundred pieces of gold. The Romans communicated to their conquerors the use of the Christian religion and Latin language, but their language and their religion had alike degenerated from the simple purity of the Augustan and apostolic age. The progress of superstition and barbarism was rapid and universal. The worship of the saints concealed from vulgar eyes the god of the Christians, and the rustic dialect of peasants and soldiers was corrupted by a Teutonic idiom and pronunciation. Yet, such intercourse of sacred and social communion eradicated the distinctions of birth and victory. The nations of Gaul were gradually confounded under the name and government of the Franks. The Franks, after they mingled with their Gallic subjects, might have imparted the most valuable of human gifts, a spirit and system of constitutional liberty. Under a king, hereditary but limited, the chiefs and counselors might have debated at Paris in the palace of the Caesars. The adjacent field, where the emperors reviewed their mercenary legions, would have admitted the legislative assembly of freedmen and warriors, and the rude model which had been sketched in the woods of Germany might have been polished and improved by the civil wisdom of the Romans. But the careless barbarians, secure of their personal independence, disdained the labor of government. The annual assemblies of the month of March were silently abolished, and the nation was separated and almost dissolved by the conquest of Gaul. The monarchy was left without any regular establishment of justice, of arms, or of revenue. The successors of Clovis wanted resolution to assume, or strength to exercise, the legislative and executive powers which the people had abdicated. The royal prerogative was distinguished only by a more ample privilege of rapine and murder, and the love of freedom, so often invigorated and disgraced by private ambition, was reduced among the licentious Franks to the contempt of order and the desire of impunity. Seventy-five years after the death of Clovis, his grandson, Gontran, king of Burgundy, sent an army to invade the Gothic possessions of Septimania, or Languedoc. The troops of Burgundy, Berry, Auvergne, and the adjacent territories were excited by the hopes of spoil. They marched without discipline under the banners of German or Gallic counts. Their attack was feeble and unsuccessful, but the friendly and hostile provinces were desolated with indiscriminate rage. The cornfields, the villages, the churches themselves were consumed by fire. The inhabitants were massacred or dragged into captivity, and in the disorderly retreat, 5,000 of these inhuman savages were destroyed by hunger or intestine discord. When the pious Gontran reproached the guilt or neglect of their leaders and threatened to inflict not a legal sentence but instant and arbitrary execution, they accused the universal and incurable corruption of the people. No one, they said, any longer fears or respects his king, his duke, or his count. Each man loves to do evil and freely indulges his criminal inclinations. The most gentle correction provokes an immediate tumult, and the rash magistrate who presumes to censure or restrain his seditious subjects seldom escapes alive from the revenge. It has been reserved for the same nation to expose, by their intemperate vices, the most odious abuse of freedom, and to supply its loss by the spirit of honor and humanity which now alleviates and dignifies their obedience to an absolute sovereign. The Visigoths had resigned to Clovis the greatest part of their Gallic possessions, but their loss was amply compensated by the easy conquest and secure enjoyment of the provinces of Spain. From the monarchy of the Goths, which soon involved the Suevic kingdom of Galicia, the modern Spaniards still derived some national vanity, but the historian of the Roman Empire is neither invited nor compelled to pursue the obscure and barren series of their annals. The Goths of Spain were separated from the rest of mankind by the lofty ridge of the Pyrenean Mountains. Their manners and institutions, as far as they were common to the Germanic tribes, have already been explained. I have anticipated in the preceding chapter the most important of their ecclesiastical events, the fall of Arianism and the persecution of the Jews and it only remains to observe some interesting circumstances which relate to the civil and ecclesiastical constitution of the Spanish kingdom. After their conversion from idolatry or heresy, the Franks and the Visigoths were disposed to embrace with equal submission the inherent evils and accidental benefits of superstition. But the prelates of France, long before the extinction of the Merovingian race, had degenerated into fighting and hunting barbarians. They disdained the use of synods, 
forgot the laws of temperance and chastity, and preferred the indulgence of private ambition and luxury to the general interest of the sacerdotal profession. The bishops of Spain respected themselves, and were respected by the public. Their indissoluble union disguised their vices and confirmed their authority, and the regular discipline of the church introduced peace, order, and stability into the government of the state. From the reign of Recared, the first Catholic king, to that of Witiza, the immediate predecessor of the unfortunate Roderick, sixteen national councils were successfully convened. The six metropolitans, Toledo, Seville, Mareda, Braga, Tarragona, and Narbonne, presided according to the respective seniority. The assembly was composed of their suffragan bishops, who appeared in person, or by their proxies, and a place was assigned to the most holy or opulent of the Spanish abbots. During the first three days of the convocation, as long as they agitated the ecclesiastical questions of doctrine and discipline, the profane laity was excluded from their debates, which were conducted, however, with decent solemnity. But on the morning of the fourth day, the doors were thrown open for the entrance of the great officers of the palace, the dukes and counts of the provinces, the judges of the cities, and the Gothic nobles, and the decrees of heaven were ratified by the consent of the people. The same rules were observed in the provincial assemblies, the annual synods, which were empowered to hear complaints and redress grievances, and a legal government was supported by the prevailing influence of the Spanish clergy. The bishops, who, in each revolution, were prepared to flatter the victorious and to insult the prostrate, labored with diligence and success to kindle the flames of persecution and to exalt the mitre above the crown. Yet the national councils of Toledo, in which the free spirit of the barbarians was tempered and guided by episcopal policy, have established some prudent laws for the common benefit of the king and people. The vacancy of the throne was supplied by the choice of the bishops and palatines, and after the failure of the line of Alaric, the regal dignity was still limited to the pure and noble blood of the Goths. The clergy, who anointed their lawful prince, always recommended, and sometimes practiced, the duty of allegiance and the spiritual censures were denounced on the heads of the impious subjects who should resist his authority and conspire against his life, or violate, by an indecent union, the chastity even of his widow. But the monarch himself, when he ascended the throne, was bound by a reciprocal oath to God and his people that he would faithfully execute his important trust. The real or imaginary faults of his administration were subject to the control of a powerful aristocracy and the bishops and palatines were guarded by a fundamental privilege, that they should not be degraded, imprisoned, tortured, nor punished with death, exile, or confiscation, unless by the free and public judgment of their peers. One of these legislative councils of Toledo examined and ratified the code of laws which had been compiled by a succession of Gothic kings from the fierce Uric to the devout Egica. As long as the Visigoths themselves were satisfied with the rude customs of their ancestors, they indulged their subjects of Aquitaine and Spain in the enjoyment of the Roman law. Their gradual improvement in arts, in policy, and at length in religion encouraged them to imitate and to supersede these foreign institutions, and to compose a code of civil and criminal jurisprudence for the use of a great and united people. The same obligations and the same privileges were communicated to the nations of the Spanish monarchy and the conquerors, insensibly renouncing the Teutonic idiom, submitted to the restraints of equity, and exalted the Romans to the participation of freedom. The merit of this impartial policy was enhanced by the situation of Spain under the reign of the Visigoths. The provincials were long separated from their Arian masters, by the irreconcilable difference of religion. After the conversion of Recared had removed the prejudices of the Catholics, the coasts, both of the ocean and Mediterranean, were still possessed by the eastern emperors, who secretly excited a discontented people to reject the yoke of the barbarians and to assert the name and dignity of Roman citizens. The allegiance of doubtful subjects is indeed most effectually secured by their own persuasion that they hazard more in a revolt that they can hope to obtain by a revolution. But it has appeared so natural to oppress those whom we hate and fear that the contrary system well deserves the praise of wisdom and moderation. While the kingdoms of the Franks and Visigoths were established in Gaul and Spain, the Saxons achieved the conquest of Britain, the third great diocese of the prefecture of the West. 
Since Britain was already separated from the Roman Empire, I might, without reproach, decline a story familiar to the most illiterate and obscure to the most learned of my readers. The Saxons, who excelled in the use of the oar or the battle-axe, were ignorant of the art which alone could perpetuate the fame of their exploits. The provincials, relapsing into barbarism, neglected to describe the ruin of their country, and the doubtful tradition was almost ex extinguished before the missionaries of Rome restored the light of science and Christianity. The declamations of Gildas, the fragments or fables of Nennius, the obscure hints of the Saxon laws and chronicles, and the ecclesiastical tales of the Venerable Bede, have been illustrated by the diligence, and sometimes embellished by the fancy of succeeding writers, whose works I am not ambitious either to censure or to transcribe. Yet the historian of the empire may be tempted to pursue the revolutions of a Roman province till it vanishes from his sight, and an Englishman may curiously trace the establishment of the barbarians from which he derives his name, his laws, and perhaps his origin. About forty years after the dissolution of the Roman government, Vortigern appears to have obtained the supreme, though precarious, command of the princes and cities of Britain. That unfortunate monarch has been almost universally condemned for the weak and mischievous policy of inviting a formidable stranger to repel the vexatious inroads of a domestic foe. His ambassadors are dispatched by the gravest historians to the coast of Germany, they address a pathetic oration to the general assembly of the Saxons, and those warlike barbarians resolve to assist, with a fleet and army, the suppliants of a distant and unknown island. If Britain had indeed been unknown to the Saxons, the measure of its calamities would have been less complete. But the strength of the Roman government cannot always guard the maritime province against the pirates of Germany. The independent and divided states were exposed to their attacks, and the Saxons might sometimes join the Scots and the Picts, and a tacit or express confederacy of rapine and destruction. Vortigern could only balance the various perils which assaulted on every side his throne and his people, and his policy may deserve either praise or excuse if he preferred the alliance of those barbarians whose naval power rendered them the most dangerous enemies and the most serviceable allies. Hengist and Horsa, as they ranged along the eastern coast with three ships, were engaged by the promise of an ample stipend to embrace the defense of Britain, and their intrepid valor soon delivered the country from the Chalcedonian invaders. The Isle of Thanet, a secure and fertile district, was allotted for the residence of these German auxiliaries, and they were supplied, according to the treaty, with a plentiful allowance of clothing and provisions. This favorable reception encouraged 5,000 warriors to embark with their families in 17 vessels, and the infant power of Hengist was fortified by this strong and seasonable reinforcement. The crafty barbarian suggested to Vortigern the obvious advantage of fixing, in the neighborhood of the Picts, a colony of faithful allies. A third fleet of 40 ships, under the command of his son and nephew, sailed from Germany, ravaged the Orkneys, and disembarked with a new army on the coast of Northumberland, or Lothian, at the opposite extremity of the devoted land. It was easy to foresee, but it was impossible to prevent the impending evils. The two nations were soon divided and exasperated by mutual jealousies. The Saxons magnified all that they had done and suffered in the cause of an ungrateful people, while the Britons regretted the liberal rewards which could not satisfy the avarice of those haughty mercenaries. The causes of fear and hatred were inflamed into an irreconcilable quarrel. The Saxons flew to arms, and if they perpetrated a ferocious massacre during the security of a feast, they destroyed the reciprocal confidence which sustains the intercourse of peace and war. Hengist, who boldly aspired to the conquest of Britain, exhorted his countrymen to embrace the glorious opportunity. He painted in lively colors the fertility of the soil, the wealth of the cities, the pusillanimous temper of the natives and the convenient situation of a spacious, solitary island, accessible on all sides to the Saxon fleets. The successive colonies which issued in the period of a century from the mouths of the Elbe, the Wesser, and the Rhine, were principally composed of three valiant tribes, or nations, of Germany, the Jutes, the Old Saxons, and the Angles. The Jutes, who fought under the peculiar banner of Hengist, assumed the merit of leading their countrymen in the paths of glory, and of erecting in Kent the first independent kingdom. 
The fame of the enterprise was attributed to the primitive Saxons, and the common laws and language of the conquerors are described by the national appellation of a people which, at the end of four hundred years, produced the first monarchs of South Britain. The Angles were distinguished by their numbers and their success, and they claimed the honor of fixing a perpetual name on the country on which they occupied the most ample portion. The barbarians, who followed the hopes of rapine, either on the land or sea, were insensibly blended with this triple confederacy. The Frisians, who had been tempted by their vicinity to the British shores, might balance during a short space the strength and reputation of the native Saxons. The Danes, the Prussians, and the Rusians are faintly described, and some adventurous Huns, who had wandered as far as the Baltic, might embark on board the German vessels for the conquest of a new world. But this arduous achievement was not prepared or executed by the Union of National Powers. Each intrepid chieftain, according to the measure of his fame and fortunes, assembled his followers, equipped a fleet of three or perhaps of sixty vessels, chose the place of the attack, and conducted his subsequent operations according to the events of the war and dictates of his private interest. In the invasion of Britain, many heroes vanquished and fell, but only seven victorious leaders assumed, or at least maintained, the title of kings. Seven independent thrones, the Saxon Heptarchy, were founded by the conquerors, in seven families, one of which has been continued by female secession to our present sovereign, derived their equal and sacred lineage from Woden, the god of war. It has been pretended that this republic of kings was moderated by a general council and a supreme magistrate, but such an artful scheme of policy is repugnant to the rude and turbulent spirit of the Saxons. Their laws are silent, and their imperfect annals afford only a dark and bloody prospect of intestine discord. A monk, who, in the profound ignorance of human life, has presumed to exercise the office of historian, strangely disfigures the state of Britain at the time of its separation from the Western Empire. Gildas describes in florid language the improvements of agriculture, the foreign trade which flowed with every tide into the Thames and Severn, the solid and lofty construction of public and private edifices. He accuses the sinful luxury of the British people, of a people, according to the same writer, ignorant of the most simple arts, and incapable, without the aid of the Romans, of providing walls of stone or weapons of iron for the defense of their native land. Under the long dominion of the emperors, Britain had insensibly molded into the elegant and servile form of a Roman province, whose safety was entrusted to a foreign power. The subjects of Honorius contemplated their new freedom with surprise and terror, and they were left destitute of any civil or military constitution, and their uncertain rulers wanted either skill or courage or authority to direct the public force against the public enemy. The introduction of the Saxons betrayed their internal weakness and degraded the character both of the prince and of the people. Their consternation magnified the danger, and the want of union diminished their resources, and the madness of civil factions was more solicitous to accuse than to remedy the evils which they imputed to the misconduct of their adversaries. Yet the Britons were not ignorant, they could not be ignorant, of the manufacture or use of arms. The successive and disorderly attacks of the Saxons allowed them to recover from their amazement and the prosperous or adverse events of the war added discipline and experience to their native valor. While the continent of Europe and Africa yielded without resistance to the barbarians, the British island, alone and unaided, maintained a long, a vigorous, though an unsuccessful struggle against the formidable pirates who, almost at the same instant, assaulted the northern, the eastern, and the southern coasts. The cities, which had been fortified with skill, were defended with resolution, the advantages of ground, hills, forests, and morasses were diligently improved by the inhabitants. The conquest of each district was purchased with blood, and the defeats of the Saxons are strongly attested by the discreet silence of their analyst. Hengist might hope to achieve the conquest of Britain, but his ambition, in an active reign of thirty-five years, was confined to the possession of Kent, and the numerous colony which he had planted in the north was extirpated by the sword of the Britons. The monarchy of the West Saxons was laboriously founded by the persevering efforts of three martial generations. The life of Cerdric, one of the bravest of the children of Woden, was consumed in the conquest of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, and the loss which he sustained in the battle of Mount Baden reduced him to a state of inglorious repose. Kenric, 
his valiant son, advanced into Wiltshire, besieged Salisbury, at that time seated on a commanding eminence, and vanquished an army which advanced to the relief of the city. In the subsequent battle of Marlborough, his British enemies displayed their military science. Their troops were formed in three lines, and each line consisted of three distinct bodies, and the cavalry, the archers, and the pikemen were distributed according to the principles of Roman tactics. The Saxons charged in one weighty column, boldly encountered with their short swords the long lances of the Britons, and maintained an equal conflict till the approach of night. Two decisive victories, the death of three British kings, and the reduction of Curranchester, Bath, and Gloucester, established the fame and power of Caolin, the grandson of Cerdric, who carried his victorious arms to the banks of the Severn. After a war of a hundred years, the independent Britons still occupied the whole extent of the western coast, from the wall of Antoninus to the extreme promontory of Cornwall, and the principal cities of the inland country still opposed the arms of the barbarians. Resistance became more languid, as the number and boldness of the assailants continually increased, winning their way by slow and painful efforts, the Saxons, the Angles, and their various confederates, advanced from the north, from the east, and from the south, till their victorious banners were united in the center of the island. Beyond the Severn, the Britons still asserted their national freedom, which survived the heptarchy and even the monarchy of the Saxons. The bravest warriors, who preferred exile to slavery, found a secure refuge in the mountains of Wales. The reluctant submission of Cornwall was delayed for some ages, and a band of fugitives acquired a settlement in Gaul by their own valor or the liberality of the Merovingian kings. The western angle of Amorica acquired the new appellations of Cornwall and the Lesser Britain, and the vacant hands of the Osimii were filled by a strange people, who, under the authority of their counts and bishops, preserved the laws and language of their ancestors. To the feeble descendants of Clovis and Charlemagne, the Britons of Amorica refused the customary tribute, subdued the neighboring dioceses of Van, Rain, and Nantes, and formed a powerful though vassal state which has been united to the crown of France. In a century of perpetual, or at least implacable war, much courage and some skill must have been exerted for the defense of Britain. Yet, if the memory of its champions is almost buried in oblivion, we need not repine, since every age, however destitute of science or virtue, sufficiently abounds in acts of blood and military renown. The tomb of Vortimer, the son of Vortigern, was erected on the margin of the seashore as a landmark formidable to the Saxons, whom he had thrice vanquished in the fields of Kent. Ambrosius Aurelian was descended from a noble family of Romans. His modesty was equal to his valor, and his valor, till the last fatal action, was crowned with splendid success. But every British name is effaced by the illustrious name of Arthur, the hereditary prince of the Celeres, in South Wales, and the elective king or general of the nation. According to the most rational account, he defeated, in twelve successive battles, the Angles of the North and the Saxons of the West. But the declining age of the hero was embittered by popular ingratitude and domestic misfortunes. The events of his life are less interesting than the singular revolutions of his fame. During a period of five hundred years, the tradition of his exploits was preserved and rudely embellished by the obscure bards of Wales and Amorica, who were odious to the Saxons and unknown to the rest of mankind. The pride and curiosity of the Norman conquerors prompted them to inquire into the ancient history of Britain. They listened with fond credulity to the tale of Arthur, and eagerly applauded the merit of a prince who had triumphed over the Saxons, their common enemies. His romance, transcribed in the Latin of Geoffrey of Monmouth, and afterwards translated into the fashionable idiom of the times, was enriched with the various, though incoherent, ornaments which were familiar to the experience, the learning, or the fancy of the twelfth century. The progress of a Phrygian colony, from the Tiber to the Thames, was easily engrafted onto the fable of the Aeneid, and the royal ancestors of Arthur derived their origin from Troy, and claimed their alliance with the Caesars. His trophies were decorated with the captive provinces and imperial titles, and his Danish victories avenged the recent injuries of his country. The gallantry and superstition of the British hero, his feasts and tournaments, and the memorable institution of his Knights of the Round Table, were faithfully copied from the reigning manners of chivalry, 
and the fabulous exploits of Uther's son appear less incredible than the adventures which were achieved by the enterprising valor of the Normans. Pilgrimage and the holy wars introduced into Europe the specious miracles of Arabian magic. Fairies and giants, flying dragons, and enchanted palaces were blended with the more simple fictions of the West, and the fate of Britain depended on the art or the predictions of Merlin. Every nation embraced and adorned the popular romance of Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Their names were celebrated in Greece and Italy, and the voluminous tales of Sir Lancelot and Sir Tristram were devoutly studied by the princes and nobles who disregarded the genuine heroes and historians of antiquity. At length the light of science and reason was rekindled, the talisman was broken, the visionary fabric melted into air, and by a natural, though unjust, reverse of the popular opinion, the severity of the present age is inclined to question the existence of Arthur. Resistance, if it cannot avert, must increase the miseries of conquest, and conquest has never appeared more dreadful and destructive than in the hands of the Saxons, who hated the valor of their enemies, disdained the faith of treaties, and violated without remorse the most sacred objects of the Christian worship. The fields of battle might be traced almost in every district by monuments of bones, and the fragments of falling towers were stained with blood. The last of the Britons, without distinction of age or sex, was massacred in the ruins of Andorita, and the repetition of such calamities was frequent and familiar under the Saxon heptarchy. The arts and religion, the laws and language, which the Romans had so carefully planted in Britain, were extirpated by the barbarous successors. After the destruction of the principal churches, the bishops, who had declined the crown of martyrdom, retired with the holy relics into Wales and Amorica and the remains of their flocks were left destitute of any spiritual food. The practice, and even the remembrance of Christianity, were abolished, and the British clergy might obtain some comfort from the damnation of the idolatrous strangers. The kings of France maintained the privileges of the Roman subjects, but the ferocious Saxons trampled on the laws of Rome and of the emperors. The proceedings of civil and criminal jurisprudence, the titles of honor, the forms of office, the ranks of society, and even the domestic rights of marriage, testament, and inheritance were finally suppressed, and the indiscriminate crowd of noble and plebeian slaves were governed by the traditionary customs which had been coarsely framed for the shepherds and pirates of Germany. The language of science, of business, and of conversation, which had been introduced by the Romans, was lost in the general desolation. A sufficient number of Latin or Celtic words might be assumed by the barbarians to express their new wants and ideas, but those illiterate pagans preserved and established the use of their national dialect. Almost every name, conspicuous either in church or state, reveals its Teutonic origin, and the geography of England was universally inscribed with foreign characters and appellations. The example of a revolution so rapid and so complete may not easily be found but it will excite a probable suspicion that the arts of Rome were less deeply rooted in Britain than in Gaul or Spain, and that the native rudeness of the country and its inhabitants was covered by a thin varnish of Italian manners. This strange alteration has persuaded historians and even philosophers that the provincials of Britain were totally exterminated, and that the vacant land was again peopled by the perpetual influx and rapid increase of the German colonies. 300,000 Saxons are said to have obeyed the summons of Hengist. The entire emigration of the Angles was attested, in the age of Bede, by the solitude of their native country, and our experience has shown the free propagation of the human race if they are cast on a fruitful wilderness, where their steps are unconfined and their subsistence is plentiful. The Saxon kingdoms displayed the face of recent discovery and cultivation. The towns were small, the villages were distant, the husbandry was languid and unskillful. Four sheep were equivalent to an acre of the best land. An ample space of wood and morass was resigned to the vague dominion of nature, and the modern bishopric of Durham, and the whole territory from the Tyne to the Tees, had returned to its primitive state of a savage and solitary forest. Such imperfect population might have been supplied in some generations by the English colonies, but neither reason nor fact could justify the unnatural supposition that the Saxons of Britain remained alone in the desert which they had subdued. 
After the sanguinary barbarians had secured their dominion and gratified their revenge, it was their interest to preserve the peasants, as well as the cattle of the unresisting country. In each successive revolution, the patient herd becomes the property of its new masters, and the salutary compact of food and labor is silently ratified by their mutual necessities. Wilfred, the apostle of Sussex, accepted from his royal convert the gift of the peninsula of Selsey, near Kirkester, with the persons and property of its inhabitants, who then amounted to eighty-seven families. He released them at once from spiritual and temporal bondage, and two hundred and fifty slaves of both sexes were baptized by their indulgent master. The kingdom of Sussex, which spread from the sea to the Thames, contained seven thousand families, twelve hundred were ascribed to the Isle of Wight, and, if we multiply this vague computation, it may seem probable that England was cultivated by a million of servants, or villains, who were attached to the states of their arbitrary landlords. The indigent barbarians were often tempted to sell their children or themselves into perpetual and even foreign bondage. Yet the special exemptions which were granted to national slaves sufficiently declare that they were much less numerous than the strangers and captives who had lost their liberty or changed their masters by the accidents of war. When time and religion had mitigated the fierce spirits of the Anglo-Saxons, the laws encouraged the frequent practice of manumission, and their subjects of Welsh or Cambrian extraction assumed the respectable station of inferior freedmen possessed of lands and entitled to the rights of civil society. Such gentle treatment might secure the allegiance of a fierce people, who had been recently subdued on the confines of Wales and Cornwall. The sage Ina, the legislator of Wessex, united the two nations in the bands of domestic alliance, and four British lords of Somerset sire may be honorably distinguished in the court of a Saxon monarch. The independent Britons appear to have relapsed into the state of original barbarism from whence they had been imperfectly reclaimed. Separated by their enemies from the rest of mankind, they soon became an object of scandal and abhorrence to the Catholic world. Christianity was still professed in the mountains of Wales, but the rude schismatics, in the form of the clerical tonsure and in the day of the celebration of Easter, obstinately resisted the imperious mandates of the Roman pontiffs. The use of the Latin language was insensibly abolished, and the Britons were deprived of the arts and learning which Italy communicated to her Saxon proselytes. In Wales and Amorica, the Celtic tongue, the native idiom of the West, was preserved and propagated, and the bards, who had been the companions of the Druids, were still protected in the 16th century by the laws of Elizabeth. Their chief, a respectable officer of the courts of Pingorn, or Aberfrar, or Caermarthen, accompanied the king's servants to war. The monarchy of the Britons, which he sung in the front of battle, excited their courage and justified their depredations, and the songster claimed for his legitimate prize the fairest heifer of the spoil. His subordinate ministers, the masters and disciples of vocal and instrumental music, visited in their respective circuits the royal, the noble, and the plebeian houses and the public poverty, almost exhausted by the clergy, was oppressed by the importunate demands of the bards. Their rank and merit were ascertained by solemn trials, and the strong belief of supernatural inspiration exalted the fancy of the poet and of his audience. The last retreats of Celtic freedom, the extreme territories of Gaul and Britain, were less adapted to agriculture than to pasturage, and the wealth of the Britons consisted in their flocks and herds, Milk and flesh were their ordinary food, and bread was sometimes esteemed or rejected as a foreign luxury. Liberty had peopled the mountains of Wales and the morasses of Amorica, but their populousness had been maliciously ascribed to the loose practice of polygamy, and the houses of these licentious barbarians had been supposed to contain ten wives and perhaps fifty children. Their disposition was rash and choleric. They were bold in action and in speech. And, as they were ignorant of the arts of peace, they alternately indulged their passions in foreign and domestic war. The cavalry of Amorica, the spearmen of Gwent, and the archers of Marioneth were equally formidable, but their poverty could seldom procure either shields or helmets, and the inconvenient weight which would have retarded the speed and agility of their desolatory operations. One of the greatest of the English monarchs was requested 
to satisfy the curiosity of a Greek emperor concerning the state of Britain, and Henry II could assert from his personal experience that Wales was inhabited by a race of naked warriors who encountered without fear the defensive armor of their enemies. By the revolution of Britain, the limits of science as well as of empire were contracted. The dark cloud, which had been cleared by the Phoenician discoveries and finally dispelled by the arms of Caesar, again settled on the shores of the Atlantic, and a Roman province was again lost among the fabulous islands of the ocean. One hundred and fifty years after the reign of Honorius, the gravest historian of the times describes the wonders of a remote isle, whose eastern and western parts are divided by an antique wall, the boundary of life and death, or more properly of truth and fiction. The east is a fair country, inhabited by a civilized people. The air is healthy, the waters are pure and plentiful, and the earth yields her regular and fruitful increase. In the west, beyond the wall, the air is infectious and mortal, the ground is covered with serpents, and this dreary solitude is the region of departed spirits, who are transported from the opposite shores in substantial boats and by living rowers. Some families of fishermen, the subjects of the Franks, are excused from tribute, in consideration of the mysterious office which is performed by these charons of the ocean. Each in his turn is summoned, at the hour of midnight, to hear the voices and even the names of the ghosts. He is sensible of their weight, and feels himself impelled by an unknown but irresistible power. After this dream of fancy, we read with astonishment that the name of this island is Britia, that it lies in the ocean, against the mouth of the Rhine, and less than thirty miles from the continent, that it is possessed by three nations, the Phrygians, the Angles, and the Britons, and that some Angles have appeared at Constantinople in the train of the French ambassadors. From these ambassadors, Procopius might be informed of a singular, though not improbable, adventure which announces the spirit rather than the delicacy of an English heroine. She had been betrothed to Radiger, the king of the Varini, a tribe of Germans who touched the ocean and the Rhine. But the perfidious lover was tempted, by motives of policy, to prefer his father's widow, the sister of Theodobert, king of the Franks. The forsaken princess of the Angles, instead of bewailing, revenged her disgrace. Her warlike subjects are said to have been ignorant of the use, and even of the form of a horse. But she boldly sailed from Britain to the mouth of the Rhine with a fleet of four hundred ships and an army of one hundred thousand men. After the loss of a battle, the captive Radiger employed the mercy of his victorious bride, who generously pardoned his offense, dismissed her rival, and compelled the king of the Varney to discharge with honor and fidelity the duties of a husband. This gallant exploit appears to be the last naval enterprise of the Anglo-Saxons. The arts of navigation, by which they had acquired the empire of Britain and of the sea, was soon neglected by the indolent barbarians, who supinely renounced all the commercial advantages of their insular situation. Seven independent kingdoms were agitated by perpetual discord, and the British world was seldom connected either in peace or war with the nations of the continent. I have now accomplished the laborious narrative of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, from the fortunate age of Trajan and the Antonines to its total extinction in the West, about five centuries after the Christian era. At that unhappy period, the Saxons fiercely struggled with the natives for the possession of Britain. Gaul and Spain were divided between the powerful monarchies of the Franks and Visigoths, and the dependent kingdoms of the Suevi and Burgundians. Africa was exposed to the cruel persecution of the Vandals, and the savage insults of the Moors. Rome and Italy, as far as the banks of the Danube, were afflicted by an army of barbarian mercenaries, whose lawless tyranny was succeeded by the reign of Theodoric the Ostrogoth. All the subjects of the empire, who, by the use of the Latin language, more particularly deserved the name and privileges of Romans, were oppressed by the disgrace and calamities of foreign conquest, and the victorious nations of Germany established a new system of manners and government in the western countries of Europe. The majesty of Rome was faintly represented by the princes of Constantinople, the feeble and imaginary successors of Augustus, Yet they continued to reign over the east, from the Danube to the Nile and Tigris. The Gothic and Vandal kingdoms of Italy and Africa were subverted by the arms of Justinian, and the history of the Greek emperors 
may still afford a long series of instructive lessons and interesting revolutions. The Greeks, after their country had been reduced into a province, imputed the triumphs of Rome not to the merit, but to the fortune of the Republic. The inconstant goddess, who so blindly distributes and resumes her favors, had now consented, such was the language of envious flattery, to resign her wings, to descend from her globe, and to fix her firm and immutable throne on the banks of the Tiber. A wiser Greek, who has composed with the philosophic spirit the memorable history of his own times, deprived his countrymen of this vain and delusive comfort by opening to their view the deep foundations of the greatness of Rome. The fidelity of the citizens to each other and to the state was confirmed by the habits of education and the prejudices of religion. Honor, as well as virtue, was the principle of the Republic. The ambitious citizens labored to deserve the solemn glories of the triumph, and the ardor of the Roman youth was kindled into the active emulation as often as they beheld the domestic images of their ancestors. The temperate struggles of the patricians and plebeians had finally established the firm and equal balance of the Constitution, which united the freedom of popular assemblies with the authority and wisdom of a Senate and the executive powers of a regal magistrate. When the consul displayed the standard of the Republic, each citizen bound himself, by the obligation of an oath, to draw his sword in the cause of his country till he had discharged the sacred duty by a military service of ten years. This wise institution continually poured into the field the rising generations of freemen and soldiers, and their numbers were reinforced by the warlike and populous states of Italy, who, after a brave resistance, had yielded to the valor and embraced the alliance of the Romans. The sage historian, who excited the virtue of the younger Scipio, and beheld the ruin of Carthage, has accurately described their military systems, their levies, arms, exercises, subordination, marches, encampments, and the invincible legion superior and active strength to the Macedonian phalanx of Philip and Alexander. From these institutions of peace and war, Polybius has deduced the spirit and success of a people incapable of fear and impatient of repose. The ambitious design of conquest, which might have been defeated by the seasonable conspiracy of mankind, was attempted and achieved, and the perpetual violation of justice was maintained by the political virtues of prudence and courage. The arms of the Republic, sometimes vanquished in battle, always victorious in war, advanced with rapid steps to the Euphrates, the Danube, the Rhine, and the ocean and the images of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. The rise of a city, which swelled into an empire, may deserve, as a singular prodigy, the reflection of a philosophic mind. But the decline of Rome was the natural and inevitable effect of immoderate greatness. Prosperity ripened the principle of decay. The causes of destruction multiplied with the extent of conquest. And as soon as time or accident had removed the artificial supports, the stupendous fabric yielded to the pressure of its own weight. The story of its ruin is simple and obvious, and instead of inquiring why the Roman Empire was destroyed, we should rather be surprised that it had subsisted so long. The victorious legions, who, in distant wars, acquired the vices of strangers and mercenaries, first oppressed the freedom of the Republic and afterwards violated the majesty of the purple. The emperors, anxious for their personal safety and the public peace, were reduced to the base expedient of corrupting the discipline which rendered them alike formidable to their sovereign and to the enemy. The rigor of the military government was relaxed, and finally dissolved by the partial institutions of Constantine, and the Roman world was overwhelmed by a deluge of barbarians. The decay of Rome has frequently been ascribed to the translation of the seat of empire. But this history has already shown that the powers of the government were divided rather than removed. The throne of Constantinople was erected in the east, while the west was still possessed by a series of emperors who held their residence in Italy and claimed their equal inheritance of the legions and provinces. This dangerous novelty impaired the strength and fermented the vices of a double reign. The institutions of an oppressive and arbitrary system were multiplied, and a vain emulation of luxury, not of merit, was introduced and supported between the degenerate successors of Theodosius. Extreme distress, which unites the virtue of a free people, embitters the factions of a declining monarchy.
the hostile favorites of Arcadius and Honorius, betrayed the Republic to its common enemies. And the Byzantine court beheld with indifference, perhaps with pleasure, the disgrace of Rome, the misfortunes of Italy, and the loss of the West. Under the succeeding reigns, the alliance of the two empires was restored, but the aid of the Oriental Romans was tardy, doubtful, and ineffectual, and the national schisms of the Greeks and Latins was enlarged by the perpetual difference of language and manners, of interests, and even of religion. Yet the salutary event approved in some measure the judgment of Constantine. During a long period of decay, his impregnable city repelled the victorious armies of barbarians, protected the wealth of Asia, and commanded, both in peace and war, the important straits which connect the Euxine and Mediterranean seas. The foundation of Constantinople more essentially contributed to the preservation of the East than to the ruin of the West. As the happiness of a future life is the great object of religion, we may hear without surprise or scandal that the introduction, or at least the abuse of Christianity, had some influence on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The clergy successfully preached the doctrines of patience and pusillanimity. The active virtues of society was discouraged, and the last remnants of military spirit were buried in the cloister. A large portion of public and private wealth was consecrated to the specious demands of charity and devotion, and the soldier's pay was lavished on the useless multitude of both sexes, who could only plead the merits of abstinence and chastity. Faith, zeal, curiosity, and the more earthly passions of malice and ambition kindled the flame of theological discord, and the church and even the state were distracted by religious factions, whose conflicts were sometimes bloody and always implacable. The attention of the emperors was diverted from camps to synods, and the Roman world was oppressed by a new species of tyranny and the persecuted sects became the secret enemies of their country. Yet party spirit, however pernicious or absurd, is a principle of union as well as of dissension. The bishops from 1800 pulpits inculcated the duty of passive obedience to a lawful and orthodox sovereign. Their frequent assemblies and perpetual correspondence maintained the communion of distant churches, and the benevolent temper of the gospel was strengthened though confined by the spiritual alliance of the Catholics. The sacred indolence of the monks was devoutly embraced by a servile and effeminate age, but if superstition had not afforded a decent retreat, the same vices would have tempted the unworthy Romans to desert, from baser motives, the standard of the Republic. Religious precepts are easily obeyed which indulge and sanctify the natural inclinations of their votaries, but the pure and genuine influence of Christianity may be traced to its beneficial, though imperfect, effects on the barbarian proselytes of the north. If the decline of the Roman Empire was hastened by the conversion of Constantine, his victorious religion broke the violence of the fall and mollified the ferocious temper of the conquerors. This awful revolution may be usefully applied to the instruction of the present age. It is the duty of a patriot to prefer and promote the exclusive interest and glory of his native country but a philosopher may be permitted to enlarge his views and to consider Europe as one great republic whose various inhabitants have attained almost the same level of politeness and cultivation. The balance of power will continue to fluctuate and the prosperity of our own or the neighboring kingdoms may be alternately exalted or depressed, but these partial events cannot essentially injure our general state of happiness. The system of arts and laws and manners which so advantageously distinguish above the rest of mankind the Europeans and their colonies. The savage nations of the globe are the common enemies of civilized society, and we may inquire with anxious curiosity whether Europe is still threatened with a repetition of those calamities which formerly oppressed the arms and institutions of Rome. Perhaps the same reflections will illustrate the fall of the mighty empire and explain the probable causes of our actual security. One. The Romans were ignorant of the extent of their danger and the numbers of their enemies. Beyond the Rhine and Danube, the northern countries of Europe and Asia were filled with innumerable tribes of hunters and shepherds, poor, voracious, and turbulent, bold in arms, and impatient to ravish the fruits of industry. The barbarian world was agitated by the rapid impulse of war, 
and the peace of Gaul or Italy was shaken by the distant revolutions of China. The Huns, who fled before a victorious enemy, directed their march towards the west, and the torrent was swelled by the gradual accession of captives and allies. The flying tribes who yielded to the Huns assumed in their turn the spirit of conquest. The endless column of barbarians pressed on the Roman Empire with accumulated weight, and, if the foremost were destroyed, the vacant space was instantly replenished by new assailants. Such formidable emigrations no longer issue from the north, and the long repose, which has been imputed to the decrease of population, is the happy consequence of the progress of arts and agriculture. Instead of some rude villages, thinly scattered among its woods and morasses, Germany now produces a list of 2,300 walled towns. The Christian kingdoms of Denmark, Sweden, and Poland have been successively established, and the Hansa merchants, with the Teutonic Knights, have extended their colonies along the coast of the Baltic as far as the Gulf of Finland. From the Gulf of Finland to the Eastern Ocean, Russia now assumes the form of a powerful and civilized empire. The plow, the loom, and the forge are introduced on the banks of the Volga, the Obi, and the Lena, and the fiercest of the Tartar hordes have been taught to tremble and obey. The reign of independent barbarians is now contracted to a narrow span, and the remnant of Kalmuks or Uzbeks, whose forces may almost be numbered, cannot seriously excite the apprehensions of the great republic of Europe. Yet this apparent security should not tempt us to forget that new enemies and unknown dangers may possibly arise from some obscure people, scarcely visible on the map of the world. The Arabs, or Saracens, who spread their conquests from India to Spain, had languished in poverty and contempt till Mohammed breathed into those savage bodies the spirit of enthusiasm. 2. The Empire of Rome was firmly established by the singular and perfect coalition of its members. The subject nations, resigning the hope and even the wish of independence, embraced the character of Roman citizens, and the provinces of the West were reluctantly torn by the barbarians from the bosom of their mother country. Yet this union was purchased by the loss of national freedom and military spirit, and the servile provinces, destitute of life and motion, expected their safety from the mercenary troops and governors who were directed by the orders of a distant court. The happiness of an hundreds millions depended on the personal merit of one or two men, perhaps children, whose minds were corrupted by education, luxury, and despotic power. The deepest wounds were inflicted on the empire during the minorities of the sons and grandsons of Theodosius, and after those incapable princes seemed to obtain the age of manhood, they abandoned the church to the bishops, the state to the eunuchs, and the provinces to the barbarians. Europe is now divided into twelve powerful, though unequal, kingdoms, three respectable commonwealths, and a variety of smaller, though independent states. The chances of royal and ministerial talents are multiplied, at least with the number of its rulers, and a Julian, or a Semiramis, may reign in the north, while Arcadius and Honorius again slumber on the thrones of the south. The abuses of tyranny are restrained by the mutual influence of fear and shame, Republics have acquired order and stability. Monarchies have imbibed the principles of freedom, or at least of moderation. And some sense of honor and justice is introduced into the most defective constitutions by the general manners of the times. In peace, the progress of knowledge and industry is accelerated by the emulation of so many active rivals. In war, the European forces are exercised by temperate and undecisive conquests. If a savage conqueror should issue from the deserts of Tartary, he must repeatedly vanquish the robust peasants of Russia, the numerous armies of Germany, the gallant nobles of France, the intrepid freedmen of Britain, who, perhaps, might confederate for their common defense. Should the victorious barbarians carry slavery and desolation as far as the Atlantic Ocean, ten thousand vessels would transport beyond their pursuit the remnants of civilized society and Europe would revive and flourish in the American world, which is already filled with her colonies and institutions. 3. Cold, poverty, and a life of danger and fatigue fortify the strength and courage of barbarians. In every age, they have oppressed the polite and peaceful nations of China, India, and Persia, who neglected, and still neglect, to counterbalance these natural powers by the resources of military art. 
the warlike states of antiquity, Greece, Macedonia, and Rome, educated a race of soldiers, exercised their bodies, disciplined their courage, multiplied their forces by regular evolutions, and converted the iron which they possessed into strong and serviceable weapons. But this superiority insensibly declined with their laws and manners, and the feeble policy of Constantine and his successors armed and instructed for the ruin of the empire the rude valor of the barbarian mercenaries. The military art has been changed by the invention of gunpowder, which enables man to command the two most powerful agents of nature, air and fire. Mathematics, chemistry, mechanics, architecture have been applied to the service of war, and the adverse parties oppose to each other the most elaborate modes of attack and of defense. Historians may indignantly observe that the preparations of a siege would found and maintain a flourishing colony. Yet we cannot be displeased that the subversion of a city should be a work of cost and difficulty, or that an industrious people should be protected by those arts which survive and supply the decay of military virtue. Cannon and fortifications now form an impregnable barrier against the Tartar horse, and Europe is secure from any future eruption of barbarians, since, before they can conquer, they must cease to be barbarians. Their gradual advances in the science of war would always be accompanied, as we may learn from the example of Russia, with proportionable improvement in the arts of peace and civil policy, and they themselves must deserve a place among the polished nations whom they subdue. Should these speculations be found doubtful or fallacious, there still remains a more humble source of comfort and hope. The discovery of ancient and modern navigators, and the domestic history or tradition of the most enlightened nations, represent the human savage naked both in mind and body and destitute of laws of arts of ideas and almost of language from this abject condition perhaps the primitive and universal state of man he has gradually arisen to command the animals to fertilize the earth to traverse the ocean and to measure the heavens his progress in the improvement and exercise of his mental and corporal faculties have been irregular and various infinitely slow in the beginning and increasing by degrees with redoubled velocity. Ages of laborious ascent have been followed by a moment of rapid downfall, and the several climates of the globe have felt the vicissitudes of light and darkness. Yet the experience of four thousand years should enlarge our hopes and diminish our apprehensions. We cannot determine to what height the human species may aspire in their advances towards perfection, but it may safely be presumed that no people unless the face of nature is changed, will relapse into their original barbarism. The improvements of society may be viewed under a threefold aspect. 1. The poet, or philosopher, illustrates his age and country by the efforts of a single mind. But these superior powers of reason or fancy are rare and spontaneous productions, and the genius of Homer, or Cicero, or Newton, would excite less admiration if they could be created by the will of a prince or the lessons of a preceptor. 2. The benefits of law and policy, of trade and manufactures, of arts and sciences, are more solid and permanent, and many individuals may be qualified by education and discipline to promote, in their respective stations, the interests of the community. But this general order is the effect of skill and labor, and the complex machinery may be decayed by time or injured by violence. 3. Fortunately for mankind, the more useful, or at least more necessary arts, can be performed without superior talents or national subordination. Without the powers of one, or the union of many, each village, each family, each individual, must always possess both ability and inclination to perpetuate the use of fire and of metals, the propagation and service of domestic animals, the methods of hunting and fishing, the rudiments of navigation, the imperfect cultivation of corn or other nutritive grain, and the simple practice of the mechanic trades. Private genius and public industry may be extirpated, but these hardy plants survive the tempest and strike an everlasting root into the most unfavorable soil. The splendid days of Augustus and Trajan were eclipsed by a cloud of ignorance, and the barbarians subverted the laws and palaces of Rome. But the scythe, the invention or emblem of Saturn, still continued annually to mow the harvest of Italy, and the human feasts of the Lystragons 
have never been renewed on the coast of Campania. Since the first discovery of the arts, war, commerce, and religious zeal have diffused among the savages of the old and new world these inestimable gifts, they have been successfully propagated, and they can never be lost. We may therefore acquiesce in the pleasing conclusion that every age of the world has increased and still increases the real wealth, the happiness, the knowledge, and perhaps the virtue of the human race. And the end of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.